Chapter 15. The Mabbot Street entrance of Night Town, before which stretches an uncobbled tram siding set with skeleton tracks, red and green will-o'-the-wisps and danger signals. Rows of grimy houses with gaping doors. Rare lamps with faint rainbow fans. Round Rabayati's halted ice gondola stunted men and women squabble. They grab wafers between which are wedged lumps of coral and copper snow. Sucking, they scatter slowly. Children. The swankum of the gondola, high-reared, forges on through the murk, white and blue under a lighthouse. Whistles call and answer, the calls, wait, my love, and I'll be with you. The answers, round behind the stable. A deaf-mute idiot with goggle eyes, his shapeless mouth dribbling, jerks past, shaken in St. Vitus dance. A chain of children's hands imprisons him, the children, Kithog. Salute. The idiot, lifts a palsied left arm and gurgles, Gahoot. The children, where's the great light? The idiot, gobbling, gah hissed. They release him. He jerks on. A pygmy woman swings on a rope slung between two railings, counting. A form sprawled against a dustbin and muffled by its arm and hat snores, groans, grinding growling teeth, and snores again. On a step a gnome totting among a rubbish dip crouches to shoulder a sack of rags and bones. A crone standing by with a smoky oil lamp rams her last bottle in the maw of his sack. He heaves his booty, tugs askew his peaked cap and hobbles off mutely. The crone makes back for her lair, swaying her lamp. A bandy child, asquat on the doorstep with a paper shuttlecock, crawls sidling after her in spurts, clutches her skirt, scrambles up. A drunken navvy grips with both hands the railings of an area, lurching heavily. At a corner two night watch in shoulder capes, their hands upon their staff holsters, loom tall. A plate crashes, a woman screams, a child wails. Oaths of a man roar, mutter, cease. Figures wander, lurk, peer from warrens. In a room lit by a candle stuck in a bottleneck a slut combs out the tats from the hair of a scrofulous child. Sissy Caffrey's voice, still young, sings shrill from a lane, Sissy Caffrey, I gave it to Molly because she was jolly, the leg of the duck, the leg of the duck. Private car and private Compton, swagger sticks tight in their oxters, as they march unsteadily right about face and burst together from their mouths a volleyed fart. Laughter of men from the lane. A horse virago retorts, the virago, signs on you, Harry R's. More power the cavern girl. Sissy Caffrey, more luck to me. Cavan, Coot Hill, and Bell Turbot. She sings, I gave it to Nelly to stick in her belly, the leg of the duck, the leg of the duck. Private car and private Compton turn and counter retort, their tunics blood bright in a lamp glow, black sockets of caps on their blonde cropped poles. Stephen Dedalus and Lynch pass through the crowd close to the redcoats, private Compton jerks his finger, way for the parson. Private car, turns and calls, what ho, parson. Sissy Caffrey, her voice soaring higher, she has it, she got it, wherever she put it, the leg of the duck. Stephen, flourishing the ash plant in his left hand, chants with joy the intro it for Pascal time. Lynch, his jockey cap low on his brow, attends him, a sneer of discontent wrinkling his face, Stephen, vidi aquam ingredientum de templo a later dextro. Alleluia. The famished snaggly tusks of an elderly bod protrude from a doorway, the bod, her voice whispering huskily, SST. Come here till I tell you. Maidenhead inside. SST. Stephen, Altius aliquantulum, et omnes ad quos prevenit aqua ista. The bod, spits in their trail her jet of venom, Trinity Medicals. Fallopian tube. All prick and no pence. Eddie Boardman, sniffling, crouched with Bertha Supple, draws her shawl across her nostrils. Eddie Boardman, bickering, and says the one, I seen you up faithful place with your square pusher, the greaser off the railway, in his cometobed hat. Did you, says I that's not for you to say, says I. You never seen me in the man trap with a married Highlander, says I. The likes of her. Stag that one is. Stubborn as a mule. And her walking with two fellows the one time, Kilbride, the engine driver, and Lance a corporal oliphant. Stephen, triumphaliter, salvi facti sunt. He flourishes his ash plant, shivering the lamp image, shattering light over the world. A liver and white spaniel on the prowl slinks after him, growling. Lynch scares it with a kick, Lynch, so that? Stephen, looks behind, so that gesture, not music not odor, would be a universal language, the gift of tongues rendering visible not the lay sense but the first entelechy, the structural rhythm. Lynch, pornosophical philotheology. Metaphysics in Mecklenburg Street. Stephen, we have shrew-ridden Shakespeare and henpecked Socrates. Even the Elwise's stagerite was bitted, 
bridled and mounted by a light of love. Lynch, bah. Stephen, anyway, who wants two gestures to illustrate a loaf and a jug. This movement illustrates the loaf and jug of bread or wine in Omar. Hold my stick. Lynch, damn your yellow stick. Where are we going? Stephen, lecherous lynx, to la belle dame sans merci, Georgina Johnson, ad dean keely tificat i uventu to mayam. Stephen thrusts the ash plant on him and slowly holds out his hands, his head going back till both hands are a span from his breast, downturned, in planes intersecting, the fingers about to part, the left being higher, Lynch, which is the jug of bread. It skills not. That or the custom house. Illustrate thou. Here take your crutch and walk. They pass. Tommy Caffrey scrambles to a gas lamp and, clasping, climbs in spasms. From the top spur he slides down. Jackie Caffrey clasps to climb. The navvy lurches against the lamp. The twins scuttle off in the dark. The navvy, swaying, presses a forefinger against a wing of his nose and ejects from the farther nostril a long liquid jet of snot. Shouldering the lamp he staggers away through the crowd with his flaring cresset. Snakes of river fog creep slowly. From drains, clefts, cesspools, middens arise on all sides stagnant fumes. A glow leaps in the south beyond the seaward reaches of the river. The navvy, staggering forward, cleaves the crowd and lurches towards the tramsiding. On the farther side under the railway bridge Bloom appears, flushed, panting, cramming bread and chocolate into a side pocket. From Gillen's hairdresser's window a composite portrait shows him gallant Nelson's image. A concave mirror at the side presents to him lovelorn long-lost lugubru bulu womb. Grave Gladstone sees him level, bloom for bloom. He passes, struck by the stare of truculent Wellington but in the convex mirror grin unstruck the bottom eyes and fatchuck cheek shops of Jolly Poldy the Rickstick Stoldy. At Antonio Rabbiati's door Bloom halts, sweated under the bright arc lamp. He disappears. In a moment he reappears and hurries on, Bloom, fish and taters. N. G. Ah. He disappears into Olhausen's, the pork butchers, under the downcoming roll shutter. A few moments later he emerges from under the shutter, puffing Poldy, blowing Bloom. In each hand he holds a parcel, one containing a lukewarm pig's crew bean, the other a cold sheep's trotter, sprinkled with whole pepper. He gasps, standing upright. Then bending to one side he presses a parcel against his ribs and groans, Bloom, stitch in my side. Why did I run? He takes breath with care and goes forward slowly towards the lampset siding. The glow leaps again, Bloom, what is that? A flasher? Searchlight. He stands at Cormac's corner, watching, Bloom, Aurora Borealis or a steel foundry? Ah, the brigade, of course. South side anyhow. Big blaze. Might be his house. Beggar's bush. We're safe. He hums cheerfully, London's burning, London's burning. On fire, on fire. He catches sight of the navvy lurching through the crowd at the farther side of Talbot Street, I'll miss him. Run. Quick. Better cross here. He darts to cross the road. Urchins shout, the urchins, mind out, mister. Two cyclists, with lighted paper lanterns as wing, swim by him, grazing him, their bells rattling, the bells, halt yal til ti all. Bloom, halts erect, stung by a spasm, ow. He looks round, darts forward suddenly. Through rising fog a dragon sandstrewer, traveling at caution, slews heavily down upon him, its huge red headlight winking, its trolley hissing on the wire. The motorman bangs his foot gong, the gong, bang bang blah bock blued bug blue. The brake cracks violently. Bloom, raising a policeman's white gloved hand, blunders stiff legged out of the track. The motorman, thrown forward, pug nosed, on the guide wheel, yells as he slides past over chains and keys. The motorman, hey, shit breeches, are you doing the hat trick? Bloom trick leaps to the curbstone and halts again. He brushes a mud flake from his cheek with a parceled hand, Bloom, no thoroughfare. Close shave that but cured the stitch. Must take up Sandow's exercises again. On the hands down. Ensure against street accident too. The providential. He feels his trouser pocket, poor mama's panacea. He'll easily catch in track or bootlace in a cog. Day the wheel of the Black Maria peeled off my shoe at Leonard's corner. Third time is the charm. Shoe trick. Insolent driver. I ought to report him. Tension makes them nervous. Might be the fellow balked me this morning with that horsey woman. Same style of beauty. Quick of him all the same. The stiff walk. True word spoken in jest. That awful cramp in Lad Lane. 
Something poisonous I ate. Emblem of luck. Why? Probably lost cattle. Mark of the beast. He closes his eyes an instant, bit light in the head. Monthly or effect of the other. Brain fog fag. That tired feeling. Too much for me now. Ow. A sinister figure leans on plated legs against O'Burn's wall, a visage unknown, injected with dark mercury. From under a wide leaf sombrero the figure regards him with evil eye, bloom, buenas noches, senorita blanca, que calle es esta? The figure, impassive, raises a signal arm, password. Shroyd Mabbitt. Bloom, ha ha. Merci. Esperanto. Slan Leith. He mutters, Gaelic League spy, sent by that fire reader. He steps forward. A sack shouldered ragman bars his path. He steps left, rag sackman left, bloom, I beg. He leaps right, sack ragman right, bloom, I beg. He swerves, sidles, step aside, slips past and on, bloom, keep to the right, right, right. If there is a signpost planted by the touring club at step aside who procured that public boon? I who lost my way and contributed to the columns of the Irish cyclist the letter headed in darkest step aside. Keep, keep, keep to the right. Rags and bones at midnight. Offense more likely. First place murderer makes four. Wash off his sins of the world. Jackie Caffrey, hunted by Tommy Caffrey, runs full tilt against Bloom, Bloom, oh, shocked, on weak hams, he halts. Tommy and Jackie vanish there, there. Bloom pats with parceled hands watch. Fob pocket, book pocket, purse poke, sweets of sin, potato soap, bloom, beware of pickpockets. Old thieves dodge. Collide. Then snatch your purse. The retriever approaches sniffing, nose to the ground. A sprawled form sneezes. A stooped bearded figure appears garbed in the long caftan of an elder in Zion and a smoking cap with magenta tassels. Horned spectacles hang down at the wings of the nose. Yellow poison streaks are on the drawn face, Rudolph. Second half crown waste money today. I told you not go with drunken goy ever. So you catch no money. Bloom, hides the crew bean and trotter behind his back and, crestfallen, feels warm and cold feet meat, jaw, ick weiss, papachi. Rudolph, what you making down this place? Have you no soul? With feeble vulture talons he feels the silent face of Bloom, are you not my son Leopold, the grandson of Leopold? Are you not my dear son Leopold who left the house of his father and left the god of his fathers Abraham and Jacob? Bloom, with precaution, I suppose so, father. Mosenthal. All that's left of him. Rudolph, severely, one night they bring you home drunk as dog after spend your good money. What you call them running chaps. Bloom, in youth's smart blue Oxford suit with white vest slips, narrow-shouldered, in brown alpine hat wearing gent sterling silver Waterbury keyless watch and double curb Albert with seal attached, one side of him coated with stiffening mud, harriers, father. Only that once. Rudolph, once. Mud head to foot. Cut your hand open. Lock jaw. They make you kaput, Leopoldle Ben. You watch them chaps. Bloom, weakly, they challenged me to a sprint. It was muddy. I slipped. Rudolph, with contempt, go him notches. Nice spectacles for your poor mother. Bloom, Mama. Ellen Bloom, in pantomime dame stringed mobcap, widow twankies crinoline and bustle, blouse with mutton leg sleeves buttoned behind, grey mittens and cameo brooch, her plaited hair in a crispy net, appears over the staircase banisters, a slanted candlestick in her hand, and cries out in shrill alarm, Oh blessed Redeemer, what have they done to him? My smelling salts. She hauls up a reef of skirt and ransacks the pouch of her striped blay petticoat. A file, an onus day, a shriveled potato and a celluloid doll fall out, sacred heart of Mary, where were you at all at all? Bloom, mumbling, his eyes downcast, begins to bestow his parcels in his filled pockets but desists, muttering, a voice, sharply, Paldi. Bloom, who? He ducks and wards off a blow clumsily, at your service. He looks up. Beside her mirage of date palms a handsome woman in Turkish costume stands before him. Opulent curves fill out her scarlet trousers and jacket, slashed with gold. A wide yellow cummerbund girdles her. A white yashmak, violet in the night, covers her face, leaving free only her large dark eyes and raven hair, Bloom, Molly. Marion, Welly? Mrs. Marion from this out, my dear man, when you speak to me. Satirically, has poor little hubby cold feet waiting so long? Bloom, shifts from foot to foot, no, no. Not the least little bit. 
He breathes in deep agitation, swallowing gulps of air, questions, hopes, crew beans for her supper, things to tell her, excuse, desire, spellbound. A coin gleams on her forehead. On her feet are jeweled two earrings. Her ankles are linked by a slender fetter chain. Beside her a camel, hooded with a turding turban, waits. A silk ladder of innumerable rungs climbs to his bobbing howdah. He ambles near with disgruntled hindquarters. Fiercely she slaps his haunch, her gold curb wrist bangles angrily, scolding him in Moorish, Marian, Nebricata. Femininum. The camel, lifting a foreleg, plucks from a tree a large mango fruit, offers it to his mistress, blinking, in his cloven hoof, then droops his head and, grunting, with uplifted neck, fumbles to kneel. Bloom stoops his back for leapfrog, Bloom, I can give you. I mean as your business menagerer. Mrs. Marion. If you. Marion, so you notice some change? Her hands passing slowly over her trinketed stomacher, a slow friendly mockery in her eyes, Oh Paldi, Paldi, you are a poor old stick in the mud. Go and see life. See the wide world. Bloom, I was just going back for that lotion white wax, orange flower water. Shop closes early on Thursday. But the first thing in the morning. He pats Diver's pockets, this moving kidney. Ah. He points to the south, then to the east. A cake of new clean lemon soap arises, diffusing light and perfume, the soap, where a capital couple are bloom and I. He brightens the earth. I polish the sky. The freckled face of Sweeney, the druggist, appears in the disc of the soap sun, Sweeney, three and a penny, please. Bloom, yes. For my wife. Mrs. Marion. Special recipe. Marion, softly, Paldi. Bloom, yes, ma'am. Marion, tea trima un poco il cuore? In disdain she saunters away, plump as a pampered powder pigeon, humming the duet from Don Giovanni, Bloom, are you sure about that volio? I mean the pronunciati. He follows, followed by the sniffing terrier. The elderly bod seizes his sleeve, the bristles of her chinmole glittering, the bod, ten shillings a maidenhead. Fresh thing was never touched. 15. There's no one in it only her old father that's dead drunk. She points. In the gap of her dark den furtive, rain bedraggled, Bridie Kelly stands, Bridie, Hatch Street. Any good in your mind? With a squeak she flaps her bat shawl and runs. A burly rough pursues with booted strides. He stumbles on the steps, recovers, plunges into gloom. Weak squeaks of laughter are heard, weaker, the bod, her wolf eyes shining, he's getting his pleasure. You won't get a virgin in the flash houses. Ten shillings. Don't be all night before the polis in plain clothes sees us. Sixty-seven is a bitch. Leering, Jerdy McDowell limps forward. She draws from behind, ogling, and shows coyly her bloodied clout, Jerdy, with all my worldly goods I thee and thou. She murmurs, you did that. I hate you. Bloom, I? When? You're dreaming. I never saw you. The bod, leave the gentleman alone, you cheat. Writing the gentleman false letters. Street walking and soliciting. Better for your mother take the strap to you at the bedpost, hussy like you. Dirty, to bloom, when you saw all the secrets of my bottom drawer. She paws his sleeve, slobbering, dirty married man. I love you for doing that to me. She glides away crookedly. Mrs. Breen in man's freeze overcoat with loose bellows pockets, stands in the causeway, her roguish eyes witty open, smiling in all her herbivorous buck teeth. Mrs. Breen, Mr. Bloom, coughs gravely, Madam, when we last had this pleasure by letter dated the 16th instant. Mrs. Breen, Mr. Bloom. You down here in the haunts of sin. I caught you nicely. Scamp. Bloom, hurriedly, not so loud my name. Whatever do you think of me? Don't give me away. Walls have ears. How do you do? It's ages since I. You're looking splendid. Absolutely it. Seasonable weather we are having this time of year. Black refracts heat. Short cut home here. Interesting quarter. Rescue of fallen women. Magdalene Asylum. I am the secretary. Mrs. Breen, holds up a finger, now, don't tell a big fib. I know somebody won't like that. Oh just wait till I see Molly. Slyly, account for yourself this very smy nude or woe betide you. Bloom, looks behind, she often said she'd like to visit. Slumming. The exotic, you see. Negro servants in livery too if she had money. A fellow black brute. Eugene Stratton. Even the bones and cornermen at the Livermore Christie's. Baui brothers. 
sweep for that matter. Tom and Sam Bawi, colored coons in white duck suits, scarlet socks, upstarched samba chokers and large scarlet asters in their buttonholes, leap out. Each has his banjo slung. Their paler smaller negroid hands jingle the twing-twang wires. Flashing white kaffir eyes and tusks they rattle through a breakdown in clumsy clogs, twinging, singing, back to back, toe heel, heel toe, with smack fat clacking nigger lips, Tom and Sam, there's someone in the house with Dina there's someone in the house, I know, there's someone in the house with Dina playing on the old banjo. They whisk black masks from raw babby faces, then, chuckling, chortling, trumming, twanging, they diddle diddle cakewalk dance away, bloom, with a sour tenderish smile, a little frivol, shall we, if you are so inclined? Would you like me perhaps to embrace you just for a fraction of a second? Mrs. Breen, screams gaily, oh, you ruck. You ought to see yourself. Bloom, for old sake's sake. I only meant a square party, a mixed marriage mingling of our different little conjugials. You know I had a soft corner for you. Gloomily, twas I sent you that valentine of the dear gazelle. Mrs. Breen, glory Alice, you do look a holy show. Killing simply. She puts out her hand inquisitively, what are you hiding behind your back? Tell us, there's a deer. Bloom, seizes her wrist with his free hand, Josie Powell that was, prettiest Deb in Dublin. How time flies by. Do you remember, harking back in a retrospective arrangement, old Christmas night, Georgina Simpson's housewarming while they were playing the Irving Bishop game, finding the pin blindfold and thought treading? Subject, what is in this snuffbox? Mrs. Breen, you were the lion of the night with your serio-comic recitation and you looked the part. You were always a favorite with the ladies. Bloom, squire of dames, in dinner jacket with water-red silk facings, blue masonic badge in his buttonhole, black bow and mother of pearl studs, a prismatic champagne glass tilted in his hand, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Ireland, home and beauty. Mrs. Breen, the dear dead days beyond recall. Love's old sweet song. Bloom, meaningfully dropping his voice, I confess I'm teapot with curiosity to find out whether some person's something is a little teapot at present. Mrs. Breen, gushingly, tremendously teapot. London's teapot and I'm simply teapot all over me. She rubs sides with him, after the parlor mystery games and the crackers from the tree we sat on the staircase ottoman. Under the mistletoe. To his company. Bloom, wearing a purple Napoleon hat with an amber half-moon, his fingers and thumb passing slowly down to her soft moist meaty palm which she surrenders gently, the witching hour of night. I took the splinter out of his hand, carefully, slowly. Tenderly, as he slips on her finger a ruby ring, la si darem la mano. Mrs. Breen, in a one-piece evening frock executed in moonlight blue, a tinsel sylph's diadem on her brow with her dance guard fallen beside her moon-blue satin slipper, curves her palm softly, breathing quickly, volio e non. You're hot. You're scalding. The left hand nearest the heart. Bloom, when you made your present choice they said it was beauty and the beast. I can never forgive you for that. His clenched fist at his brow, think what it means. All you meant to me then. Hoarsely, woman, it's breaking me. Dennis Breen, white tall hatted, with Wisdom Healy's sandwich boards, shuffles past them in carpet slippers, his dull beard thrust out, muttering to right and left. Little Alf Bergen, cloaked in the pall of the ace of spades, dogs him to left and right, doubled in laughter, ALF Bergen, points jeering at the sandwich boards, U, P, up. Mrs. Breen, to Bloom, high jinx below stairs. She gives him the glad eye, why didn't you kiss the spot to make it well? You wanted to. Bloom, shocked, Molly's best friend. Could you? Mrs. Breen, her pulpy tongue between her lips, offers a pigeon kiss, HNHN. The answer is a lemon. Have you a little present for me there? Bloom, offhandedly, kosher. A snack for supper. The home without potted meat is incomplete. I was at Leah, Mrs. Banman Palmer. Trench an exponent of Shakespeare. Unfortunately threw away the program. Rattling good place round there for pig's feet. Feel. Richie Goulding, three ladies' hats pinned on his head, appears weighted to one side by the black legal bag of collis and ward on which a skull and crossbones are painted in white limewash. He opens it and shows it full of polonies, kippered herrings, finned in hatties and tight-packed pills, Richie, best value in dub. Bald Pat, bothered beetle, stands on the curbstone, folding his napkin, waiting to wait, Pat, advances with a tilted dish of spill-spilling gravy, steak and kidney. Bottle of lager. He he he. Wait till I wait. Richie, good God. Inevitate and all. With hanging head he marches doggedly forward. 
The navvy, lurching by, gores him with his flaming pronghorn, Richie, with a cry of pain, his hand to his back, ah! Brights! Lights! Bloom, points to the navvy, a spy. Don't attract attention. I hate stupid crowds. I am not on pleasure bent. I am in a grave predicament. Mrs. Breen, humbugging and deluthering as per usual with your cock and bull story. Bloom, I want to tell you a little secret about how I came to be here. But you must never tell. Not even Molly. I have a most particular reason. Mrs. Breen, all agog, oh, not for worlds. Bloom, let's walk on. Shall us? Mrs. Breen, let's. The bod makes an unheeded sign. Bloom walks on with Mrs. Breen. The terrier follows, whining piteously, wagging his tail, the bod, Juman's melt. Bloom, in an oatmeal sporting suit, a sprig of woodbine in the lapel, Tony Buff shirt, Shepherd's plaid St. Andrew's cross scarfty, white spats, fawn dust coat on his arm, tawny red brogues, field glasses in bandolier and a grey billycock hat, do you remember a long long time, years and years ago, just after Millie, marionette we called her, was weaned when we all went together to fairy house races, was it? Mrs. Breen, in smart sacks tailor-made, white velours hat and spider veil, Leopardstown. Bloom, I mean, Leopardstown. And Molly won seven shillings on a three-year-old name never tell and coming home along by Fox Rock in that old five-seater chanderot and of a wagonette you were in your heyday then and you had on that new hat of white velours with a surround of molfer that Mrs. Hayes advised you to buy because it was marked down to 19 and 11, a bit of wire and an old rag of velveteen, and I'll lay you what you like she did it on purpose. Mrs. Breen, she did, of course, the cat. Don't tell me. Nice advisor. Bloom, because it didn't suit you one quarter as well as the other ducky little tammy toke with the bird of paradise wing in it that I admired on you and you honestly looked just too fetching in it though it was a pity to kill it, you cruel naughty creature, little mite of a thing with a heart the size of a full stop. Mrs. Breen, squeezes his arm, simpers, naughty cruel I was. Bloom, lo, secretly, ever more rapidly, and Molly was eating a sandwich of spiced beef out of Mrs. Joe Gallagher's lunch basket. Frankly, though she had her advisors or admirers, I never cared much for her style. She was. Mrs. Breen, too. Bloom, yes. And Molly was laughing because Rogers and Maggot O'Reilly were mimicking a cock as we passed a farmhouse and Marcus Tertius Moses, the tea merchant, drove past us in a gig with his daughter, Dancer Moses was her name, and the poodle in her lap bridled up and you asked me if I ever heard or read or knew or came across. Mrs. Breen, eagerly, yes, 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 yes. She fades from his side. Followed by the whining dog he walks on towards Hell's Gates. In an archway a standing woman, bent forward, her feet apart, pisses coley. Outside a shuttered pub a bunch of loiterers listen to a tale which their broken-snouted gaffer rasps out with raucous humor. An armless pair of them flop wrestling, growling, in maimed sodden playfight, the gaffer, crouches, his voice twisted in his snout, and when Cairns came down from the scaffolding in Beaver Street what was he after doing it into only into the bucket of porter that was there waiting on the shavings for Derwin's plasterers. The loiterers, guffaw with cleft palates, OJs. Their paint-speckled hats wag. Spattered with size and lime of their lodges they frisk limblessly about him, bloom, coincidence too. They think it funny. Anything but that. Broad daylight. Trying to walk. Lucky no woman. The loiterers, Jays, that's a good one. Glauber salts. Oh Jays, into the men's porter. Bloom passes. Sheep whores, singly, coupled, shawled, disheveled, call from lanes, doors, corners, the whores, are you going far, queer fellow? How's your middle leg? Got a match on you? Eh, come here till I stiffen it for you. He plodges through their sump towards the lighted street beyond. From a bulge of window curtains a gramophone rears a battered brazen trunk. In the shadow a shabine keeper haggles with the navvy and the two redcoats, the navvy, belching, where's the bloody house? The shabine keeper, Purden Street. Shilling a bottle of stout. Respectable woman. The navvy, gripping the two redcoats, staggers forward with them, come on, you British army. Private car, behind his back, he ain't half bomby. Private Compton, laughs, what ho? Private car, to the navvy, Portobello Barracks Canteen. You ask for car. Just car. The navvy, shouts, we are the boys. Of Wexford. Private Compton, say. What price the sergeant major? Private car, Bennett? He's my pal. I love old Bennett. The navvy, shouts, the galling chain. 
and free our native land. He staggers forward, dragging them with him. Bloom stops, at fault. The dog approaches, his tongue outlawing, panting, Bloom, wild goose chase this. Disorderly houses. Lord knows where they are gone. Drunks cover distance double quick. Nice mix up. Seen at Westland Row. Then jump in first class with third ticket. Then too far. Train with engine behind. Might have taken me to Malahide or a siding for the night or collision. Second drink does it. Once is a dose. What am I following him for? Still, he's the best of that lot. If I hadn't heard about Mrs. Beaufoy Purefoy I wouldn't have gone and wouldn't have met. Kismet. He'll lose that cash. Relieving office here. Good biz for cheapjacks, organs. What do ye lack? Soon got, soon gone. Might have lost my life too with that mangong wheel track trolley glare juggernaut only for presence of mind. Can't always save you, though. If I had passed Trulock's window that day two minutes later would have been shot. Absence of body. Still if bullet only went through my coat get damages for shock, 500 pounds. What was he? Kildare Street Club Toff. God help his gamekeeper. He gazes ahead, reading on the wall a scrawled chalk legend wet dream and a phallic design, odd. Molly drawing on the frosted carriage pane at Kingstown. What's that like? Gaudy doll women loll in the lighted doorways, in window embrasures, smoking bird's eye cigarettes. The odor of the six wheat weed floats towards him in slow round ovaling wreaths, the wreaths, sweet are the sweets. Sweets of sin. Bloom, my spine's a bit limp. Go or turn? And this food? Eat it and get all pig sticky. Absurd I am. Waste of money. One and eightpence too much. The retriever drives a cold sniveling muzzle against his hand, wagging his tail, strange how they take to me. Even that brute today. Better speak to him first. Like women they like Roncount. Stinks like a polecat. Shakun Sun Gu. He might be mad. Dog days. Uncertain in his movements. Good fellow. Fido. Good fellow. Gary Owen. The wolf dog sprawls on his back, wriggling obscenely with begging paws, his long black tongue lolling out, influence of his surroundings. Give and have done with it. Provided nobody. Calling encouraging words he shambles back with a furtive poacher's tread, dogged by the setter into a dark stale stunt corner. He unrolls one parcel and goes to dump the crew bean softly but holds back and feels the trotter, sizable for threepence. But then I have it in my left hand. Calls for more effort. Why? Smaller from one of use. Oh, let it slide. Two and six. With regret he lets the unrolled crew bean and trotter slide. The mastiff mauls the bundle clumsily and gluts himself with growling greed, crunching the bones. Two rain-caped watch approach, silent, vigilant. They murmur together, the watch, bloom. Of bloom. For bloom. Bloom. Each lays hand on bloom's shoulder, first watch, caught in the act. Commit no nuisance. Bloom, stammers, I am doing good to others. A covey of gulls, storm petrels, rises hungrily from liffy slime with banbury cakes in their beaks, the gulls, caw cave cankery cock a. Bloom, the friend of man. Trained by kindness. He points. Bob Duran, toppling from a high barstool, sways over the munching spaniel, Bob Duran, Towser. Give us the paw. Give the paw. The bulldog growls, his scruff standing a gobbet of pig's knuckle between his molars through which rabid scum's biddle dribbles. Bob Duran falls silently into an area, second watch, prevention of cruelty to animals. Bloom, enthusiastically, a noble work. I scolded that tram driver on Harold's Cross Bridge for illicing the poor horse with his harness scab. Bad French I got for my pains. Of course it was frosty in the last tram. All tales of circus life are highly demoralizing. Senior Maffei, passion pale, in lion tamer's costume with diamond studs in his shirt front, steps forward, holding a circus paper hoop, a curling carriage whip and a revolver with which he covers the gorging boarhound, Senior Maffei, with a sinister smile, ladies and gentlemen, my educated greyhound. It was I broke in the bucking broncho Ajax with my patent spike saddle for carnivores. Lash under the belly with a knotted thong. Block tackle and a strangling pulley will bring your lion to heel, no matter how fractious, even Leo Ferox there, the Libyan man-eater. A red-hot crowbar and some liniment rubbing on the burning part produced Fritz of Amsterdam, the thinking hyena. He glares, I possess the Indian sign. The glint of my eye does it with these breast sparklers. With a bewitching smile, I now introduce Mademoiselle Ruby, the pride of the ring. First watch, come. Name and address. 
Bloom, I have forgotten for the moment. Ah, yes. He takes off his high-grade hat, saluting, Dr. Bloom, Leopold, dental surgeon. You have heard of Von Bloom Pasha. Umpteen millions. Donnerwetter. Owns half Austria. Egypt. Cousin. First watch, proof. A card falls from inside the leather headband of Bloom's hat, Bloom, in red fez, caddy's dress coat with broad green sash, wearing a false badge of the Legion of Honor, picks up the card hastily and offers it, allow me. My club is the Junior Army and Navy. Solicitors, Messrs. John Henry Mentone, 27 Bachelors Walk. First watch, reads, Henry Flower. No fixed abode. Unlawfully watching and besetting. Second watch, an alibi. You are cautioned. Bloom, produces from his heart pocket a crumpled yellow flower, this is the flower in question. It was given me by a man I don't know his name. Plausibly, you know that old joke, Rose of Castile. Bloom. The change of name. Virig. He murmurs privately and confidentially, we are engaged you see, sergeant. Lady in the case. Love entanglement. He shoulders the second watch gently, dash it all. It's a way we glance have in the navy. Uniform that does it. He turns gravely to the first watch, still, of course, you do get your Waterloo sometimes. Drop in some evening and have a glass of old Burgundy. To the second watch gaily, I'll introduce you, inspector. She's game. Do it in the shake of a lamb's tail. A dark mercurialized face appears, leading a veiled figure, the dark mercury, the castle is looking for him. He was drummed out of the army. Martha, thick veiled, a crimson halter round her neck, a copy of the Irish Times in her hand, in tone of reproach, pointing, Henry. Leopold. Lionel, thou lost one. Clear my name. First watch, sternly, come to the station. Bloom, scared, hats himself, steps back, then, plucking at his heart and lifting his right forearm on the square, he gives the sign and dugard of fellowcraft, no, no, worshipful master, light of love. Mistaken identity. The lion's mail. Le Cirques and Dubosc. You remember the child's fratricide case. We medical men. By striking him dead with a hatchet. I am wrongfully accused. Better one guilty escape than ninety-nine wrongfully condemned. Martha, sobbing behind her veil, breach of promise. My real name is Peggy Griffin. He wrote to me that he was miserable. I'll tell my brother, the Bechtiv Rugger fullback, on you, heartless flirt. Bloom, behind his hand, she's drunk. The woman is inebriated. He murmurs vaguely the passive Ephraim, ship relief. Second watch, tears in his eyes, to Bloom, you ought to be thoroughly well ashamed of yourself. Bloom, gentlemen of the jury, let me explain. A pure mare's nest. I am a man misunderstood. I am being made a scapegoat of. I am a respectable married man, without a stain on my character. I live in Eccles Street. My wife, I am the daughter of a most distinguished commander, a gallant upstanding gentleman, what do you call him, Major General Brian Tweedy, one of Britain's fighting men who helped to win our battles. Got his majority for the heroic defense of Rourke's Drift. First Watch, Regiment. Bloom, turns to the gallery, the Royal Dublins, boys, the salt of the earth, known the world over. I think I see some old comrades in arms up there among you. The R. D. F. With our own Metropolitan Police, guardians of our homes, the pluckiest lads and the finest body of men, as physique, in the service of our sovereign. A voice, turncoat. Up the boars. Who booed Joe Chamberlain? Bloom, his hand on the shoulder of the first watch, my old dad too was a J. P. I'm as staunch a Britisher as you are, sir. I fought with the colors for king and country in the absent-minded war under General Goff in the park and was disabled at Spee and Cop and Bloemfontein, was mentioned in dispatches. I did all a white man could. With quiet feeling, Jim Bloodsoe. Hold her nozzle again the bank. First watch, profession or trade. Bloom, well, I follow a literary occupation, author-journalist. In fact we are just bringing out a collection of prize stories of which I am the inventor, something that is an entirely new departure. I am connected with the British and Irish press. If you ring up. Miles Crawford strides out jerkily, a quill between his teeth. His scarlet beak blazes within the aureole of his straw hat. He dangles a hank of Spanish onions in one hand and holds with the other hand a telephone receiver nozzle to his ear, Miles Crawford, his cox waddles wagging, hello, 7784. Hello. Freeman's urinal and weekly asswipe here. Paralyze Europe. You which? Blue bags? 
who writes. Is it Bloom? Mr. Philip Beaufoy, pale-faced, stands in the witness box, inaccurate morning dress, outbreast pocket with peak of handkerchief showing, creased lavender trousers and patent boots. He carries a large portfolio labeled Matcham's Masterstrokes, Beaufoy, Drawls, no, you aren't. Not by a long shot if I know it. I don't see it, that's all. No born gentleman, no one with the most rudimentary promptings of a gentleman would stoop to such particularly loathsome conduct. One of those, my lord. A plagiarist. A soapy sneak masquerading as a literator. It's perfectly obvious that with the most inherent baseness he has cribbed some of my best-selling copy, really gorgeous stuff, a perfect gem, the love passages in which are beneath suspicion. The Beaufoy books of love and great possessions, with which your lordship is doubtless familiar, are a household word throughout the kingdom. Bloom, murmurs with hangdog meekness glum, that bit about the laughing which hand in hand I take exception to, if I may. Beaufoy, his lip up curled, smiles superciliously on the court, you funny ass, you. You're too beastly awfully weird for words. I don't think you need over excessively disincommodate yourself in that regard. My literary agent Mr. J. B. Pinker is in attendance. I presume, my lord, we shall receive the usual witnesses' fees, shan't we? We are considerably out of pocket over this bally pressman Johnny, this jackdaw of Reims, who has not even been to a university. Bloom, indistinctly, University of Life. Bad art. Beaufoy, shouts, it's a damnably foul lie, showing the moral rottenness of the man. He extends his portfolio, we have here damning evidence, the corpus delicti, my lord, a specimen of my maturer work disfigured by the hallmark of the beast. A voice from the gallery, Moses, Moses, King of the Jews, wiped his arse in the daily news. Bloom, bravely, overdrawn. Beaufoy, you low cad. You ought to be ducked in the horse pond, you rotter. To the court, why, look at the man's private life. Leading a quadruple existence. Street angel and house devil. Not fit to be mentioned in mixed society. The arch-conspirator of the age. Bloom, to the court, and he, a bachelor, how? First watch, the king versus Bloom. Call the woman Driscoll. The crier, Mary Driscoll, scullery maid. Mary Driscoll, a slipshod servant girl, approaches. She has a bucket on the crook of her arm and a scouring brush in her hand, second watch, another. Are you of the unfortunate class? Mary Driscoll, indignantly, I'm not a bad one. I bear a respectable character and was four months in my last place. I was in a situation, six pounds a year and my chances with Fridays out and I had to leave owing to his carryings on. First watch, what do you tax him with? Mary Driscoll, he made a certain suggestion but I thought more of myself as poor as I am. Bloom, in house jacket of ripple cloth, flannel trousers, heelless slippers, unshaven, his hair rumpled, softly, I treated you white. I gave you mementos, smart emerald garters far above your station. Incautiously I took your part when you were accused of pilfering. There's a medium in all things. Play cricket. Mary Driscoll, excitedly, as God is looking down on me this night if ever I laid a hand to the Moylsters. First watch, the offense complained of? Did something happen? Mary Driscoll, he surprised me in the rear of the premises, your honor, when the missus was out shopping one morning with a request for a safety pin. He held me and I was discolored in four places as a result. And he interfered twick with my clothing. Bloom, she counter-assaulted. Mary Driscoll, scornfully, I had more respect for the scouring brush, so I had. I remonstrated with him, your lord, and he remarked, keep it quiet. General laughter, George Fottrell, clerk of the crown and peace, resonantly, order in court. The accused will now make a bogus statement. Bloom, pleading not guilty and holding a full-blown water lily, begins a long unintelligible speech. They would hear what counsel had to say in his stirring address to the grand jury. He was down and out but, though branded as a black sheep, if he might say so, he meant to reform, to retrieve the memory of the past in a purely sisterly way and return to nature as a purely domestic animal. A seven-months child, he had been carefully brought up and nurtured by an aged bedridden parent. There might have been lapses of an erring father but he wanted to turn over a new leaf and now, when at long last in sight of the whipping post, to lead a homely life in the evening of his days, permeated by the affectionate surroundings of the heaving bosom of the family. An acclimatized Britisher, he had seen that summer eve from the footplate of an engine cab of the Loop Line Railway Company while the rain refrained from falling glimpses, as it were, through the windows of loveful households in Dublin City and urban district of scenes truly rural of happiness of the better land with Dockrell's wallpaper at one and ninepence a dozen, 
innocent British-born bairns lisping prayers to the sacred infant, youthful scholars grappling with their pensums or model young ladies playing on the pianoforte or anon all with fervor reciting the family rosary round the crackling yule log while in the boreens and green lanes the colleens with their swains strolled what times the strains of the organ tone melody and Britannia metal bound with four acting stops and twelvefold bellows, a sacrifice, greatest bargain ever. Renewed laughter. He mumbles incoherently. Reporters complain that they cannot hear, long hand and short hand, without looking up from their notebooks, loosen his boots. Professor McHugh, from the Prestable, coughs and calls, cough it up, man. Get it out in bits. The cross-examination proceeds re-bloom and the bucket. A large bucket. Bloom himself. Bowel trouble. In Beaver Street. Gripe, yes. Quite bad. A plasterer's bucket. By walking stiff-legged. Suffered untold misery. Deadly agony. About noon. Love or burgundy. Yes, some spinach. Crucial moment. He did not look in the bucket. Nobody. Rather a mess. Not completely. A titbits back number, uproar and catcalls. Bloom in a torn frock coat stained with whitewash, dinged silk hat sideways on his head, a strip of sticking plaster across his nose, talks inaudibly, J. J. O'Malloy, in barrister's grey wig and stuff gown, speaking with a voice of pain protest, this is no place for indecent levity at the expense of an erring mortal disguised in liquor. We are not in a bear garden nor at an Oxford rag nor is this a travesty of justice. My client is an infant, a poor foreign immigrant who started scratch as a stowaway and is now trying to turn an honest penny. The trumped-up misdemeanor was due to a momentary aberration of heredity, brought on by hallucination, such familiarities as the alleged guilty occurrence being quite permitted in my client's native place, the land of the pharaoh. Prima facie, I put it to you that there was no attempt at carnally knowing. Intimacy did not occur in the offense complained of by Driscoll, that her virtue was solicited, was not repeated. I would deal in a special with atavism. There have been cases of shipwreck and somnambulism in my client's family. If the accused could speak he could a tale unfold one of the strangest that have ever been narrated between the covers of a book. He himself, my lord, is a physical wreck from cobbler's weak chest. His submission is that he is of Mongolian extraction and irresponsible for his actions. Not all there, in fact. Bloom, barefoot, pigeon-breasted, in Lasker's vest and trousers, apologetic toes turned in, opens his tiny mole's eyes and looks about him dazedly, passing a slow hand across his forehead. Then he hitches his belt sailor fashion and with a shrug of oriental obeisance salutes the court, pointing one thumb heavenward, him makey veli muchy fine night. He begins to lilt simply, li li poo lil chili blingy pigfoot every night pay ye too shilly. He is howled down, j, j, omaloy, hotly to the populace, this is a lone hand fight. By Hades, I will not have any client of mine gagged and badgered in this fashion by a pack of curs and laughing hyenas. The Mosaic Code has superseded the law of the jungle. I say it and I say it emphatically, without wishing for one moment to defeat the ends of justice, accused was not accessory before the act and prosecutrix has not been tampered with. The young person was treated by defendant as if she were his very own daughter. Bloom takes J. J. O'Malloy's hand and raises it to his lips, I shall call rebutting evidence to prove up to the hilt that the hidden hand is again at its old game. When in doubt persecute Bloom. My client, an innately bashful man, would be the last man in the world to do anything ungentlemanly which injured modesty could object to or cast a stone at a girl who took the wrong turning when some dastard, responsible for her condition, had worked his own sweet will on her. He wants to go straight. I regard him as the whitest man I know. He is down on his luck at present owing to the mortgaging of his extensive property at a Jendith Netame in faraway Asia Minor, slides of which will now be shown. To Bloom, I suggest that you will do the handsome thing. Bloom, a penny in the pound. The image of the Lake of Kinnereth with blurred cattle cropping in silver haze is projected on the wall. Moses Glugox, ferritide albino, in blue dungarees, stands up in the gallery, holding in each hand an orange citron and a port kidney, Glugox, Horsley, Bleib Trustrasse, Berlin, W. 13. J. J. Omeloy steps onto a lope length and holds the lapel of his coat with solemnity. His face lengthens, grows pale and bearded, with sunken eyes, the blotches of thysis and hectic cheekbones of John F. Taylor. He applies his handkerchief to his mouth and scrutinizes the galloping tide of rose-pink blood. J. J. Omeloy, almost voicelessly, excuse me. I am suffering from a severe chill, have recently come from a sickbed. A few well-chosen words. He assumes the avine head, 
foxy mustache and probosidal eloquence of Seymour Busha, when the angel's book comes to be opened if aught that the pensive bosom has inaugurated of soul transfigured and of soul transfiguring deserves to live I say accord the prisoner at the bar the sacred benefit of the doubt. A paper with something written on it is handed into court, Bloom, in court dress, can give best references. Messrs. Callan, Coleman. Mr. Wisdom Healy J.P. My old chief Joe Cuff. Mr. V.B. Dillon, ex-Lord Mayor of Dublin. I have moved in the charm circle of the highest. Queens of Dublin Society. Carelessly, I was just chatting this afternoon at the Vice Regal Lodge to my old pals, Sir Robert and Lady Ball, Astronomer Royal, at the levee. Sir Bob, I said. Mrs. Yelverton Berry, in low corsaged opal ball dress and elbow length ivory gloves, wearing a sable trimmed brick quilted dolman, a comb of brilliance and panache of osprey in her hair, arrest him, constable. He wrote me an anonymous letter in Prentice backhand when my husband was in the north riding of Tipperary on the Munster circuit, signed James Love Birch. He said that he had seen from the gods my peerless globes as I sat in a box of the Theatre Royal at a command performance of La Segal. I deeply inflamed him, he said. He made improper overtures to me to misconduct myself at half past 4 p.m. on the following Thursday, Dunsink time. He offered to send me through the post a work of fiction by Monsieur Paul de Kock, entitled The Girl with the Three Pairs of Stays. Mrs. Bellingham, in cap and seal coney mantle, wrapped up to the nose, steps out of her broom and scans through tortoiseshell quizzing glasses which she takes from inside her huge opossum muff, also to me. Yes, I believe it is the same objectionable person. Because he closed my carriage door outside Sir Thornley Stoker's one sleety day during the cold snap of February 93 when even the grid of the waste pipe and the ball stop in my bath cistern were frozen. Subsequently he enclosed a bloom of Edelweiss called on the heights, as he said, in my honour. I had it examined by a botanical expert and elicited the information that it was a blossom of the homegrown potato plant purloined from a forcing case of the model farm. Mrs. Yelverton Berry, shame on him. A crowd of sluts and ragamuffins surges forward, the sluts and ragamuffins, screaming, stop thief. Hurrah there, Bluebeard. Three cheers for Icky Mo. Second watch, produces handcuffs, here are the Darbies. Mrs. Bellingham, he addressed me in several handwritings with fulsome compliments as a Venus in furs and alleged profound pity for my frostbound coachman Palmer while in the same breath he expressed himself as envious of his ear flaps and fleecy sheepskins and of his fortunate proximity to my person, when standing behind my chair wearing my livery and the armorial bearings of the Bellingham escutcheon garnished sable, a buck's head coot or. He lauded almost extravagantly my nether extremities, my swelling calves in silk hose drawn up to the limit, and eulogized glowingly my other hidden treasures in priceless lace which, he said, he could conjure up. He urged me, stating that he felt it his mission in life to urge me, to defile the marriage bed, to commit adultery at the earliest possible opportunity. The Honorable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys, in Amazon costume, hard hat, jack boots cocksbird, vermilion waistcoat, fawn musketeer gauntlets with braided drums, long train held up and hunting crop with which she strikes her welt constantly, also me. Because he saw me on the polo ground of the Phoenix Park at the match All Ireland versus the rest of Ireland. My eyes, I know, shone divinely as I watched Captain Slogger Dennehy of the Innie Skillings win the final chuckar on his darling Cobb Centaur. This plebeian Don Juan observed me from behind a hackney car and sent me in double envelopes an obscene photograph, such as are sold after dark on Paris boulevards, insulting to any lady. I have it still. It represents a partially nude senorita, frail and lovely, his wife, as he solemnly assured me, taken by him from nature, practicing illicit intercourse with a muscular torero, evidently a blackguard. He urged me to do likewise, to misbehave, to sin with officers of the garrison. He implored me to soil his letter in an unspeakable manner, to chastise him as he richly deserves, to bestride and ride him, to give him a most vicious horsewhipping. Mrs. Bellingham, me too. Mrs. Yelverton Berry, me too. Several highly respectable Dublin ladies hold up improper letters received from Bloom, the Honorable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys, stamps her jingling spurs in a sudden paroxysm of fury, I will, by the God above me. I'll scourge the pigeon-livered cur as long as I can stand over him. I'll flay him alive. Bloom, his eyes closing, quails expectantly, here? He squirms, again. He pants cringing, I love the danger. The Honorable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys, very much so. I'll make it hot for you. I'll make you dance Jack Ladin for that. Mrs. Bellingham, tan his breech well, the upstart. Write the stars and stripes on it. Mrs. Yelverton Berry, disgraceful. There's no excuse for him. A married man. Bloom, all these people. I meant only the spanking idea. 
a warm tingling glow without effusion. Refined birching to stimulate the circulation. The Honorable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys, laughs derisively, Oh, did you, my fine fellow? Well, by the living God, you'll get the surprise of your life now, believe me, the most unmerciful hiding a man ever bargained for. You have lashed the dormant tigress in my nature into fury. Mrs. Bellingham, shakes her muff and quizzing glasses vindictively, make him smart, Hannah dear. Give him ginger. Thrash the mongrel within an inch of his life. The cat o' nine tails. Geld him. Vivisect him. Bloom, shuddering, shrinking, joins his hands, with hangdog mean, oh cold. Oh shivery. It was your ambrosial beauty. Forget, forgive. Kismet. Let me off this once. He offers the other cheek, Mrs. Yelverton Berry, severely, don't do so on any account, Mrs. Talboys. He should be soundly trounced. The Honorable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys, unbuttoning her gauntlet violently, I'll do no such thing. Pig dog and always was ever since he was pupped. To dare address me. I'll flog him black and blue in the public streets. I'll dig my spurs in him up to the rowel. He is a well-known cuckold. She swishes her hunting crop savagely in the air, take down his trousers without loss of time. Come here, sir. Quick. Ready? Bloom, trembling, beginning to obey, the weather has been so warm. Davy Stevens, ringleted, passes with a bevy of barefoot newsboys, Davy Stevens, messenger of the Sacred Heart and Evening Telegraph with St. Patrick's Day Supplement. Containing the new addresses of all the cuckolds in Dublin. The very Reverend Canon O'Hanlon in cloth of gold cope elevates and exposes a marble timepiece. Before him Father Conroy and the Reverend John Hughes S. J. Bend Low, the timepiece, unportaling, cuckoo. 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 The brass quoits of a bed are heard to jingle, the quoits, jig-jag. Jig-a-higa. Jig-jag. A panel of fog rolls back rapidly, revealing rapidly in the jury box the faces of Martin Cunningham, Foreman, Silk Hatted, Jack Power, Simon Dedalus, Tom Kernan, Ned Lambert, John Henry Mantone, Miles Crawford, Lenahan, Patty Leonard, Nosy Flynn, McCoy and the featureless face of a nameless one, the nameless one, bareback riding. Wait for age. Gob, he organized her. The jurors, all their heads turned to his voice, really? The nameless one, snarls, arse over tip. Hundred shillings to five. The jurors, all their heads lowered in assent, most of us thought as much. First watch, he is a marked man. Another girl's plate cut. Wanted, Jack the Ripper. A thousand pounds reward. Second watch, odd, whispers, and in black. A Mormon. Anarchist. The crier, loudly, whereas Leopold Bloom of no fixed abode is a well-known dynamitart, forger, bigamist, bought and cuckled and a public nuisance to the citizens of Dublin and whereas at this commission of assize is the most honourable. His honour, Sir Frederick Falconer, recorder of Dublin, in judicial garb of grey stone rises from the bench, stonebearded. He bears in his arms an umbrella scepter. From his forehead arise starkly the mosaic ram's horns, the recorder, I will put an end to this white slave traffic and rid Dublin of this odious pest. Scandalous. He dons the black cap, let him be taken, Mr. Subsheriff, from the dock where he now stands and detained in custody in Mountjoy prison during his majesty's pleasure and there be hanged by the neck until he is dead and therein fail not at your peril or may the Lord have mercy on your soul. Remove him. A black skullcap descends upon his head, the subsheriff Long John Fanning appears, smoking a pungent Henry Clay, Long John Fanning, scowls and calls with rich rolling utterance, who'll hang Judas Iscariot. H. Rumbold, Master Barber, in a blood-colored jerkin and tanner's apron, a rope coiled over his shoulder, mounts the block. A life preserver and a nail-studded bludgeon are stuck in his belt. He rubs grimly his grappling hands, knobbed with knuckle dusters, rumbled, to the recorder with sinister familiarity, hanging Harry, your majesty, the Mersey terror. Five guineas a jugular. Neck or nothing. The bells of George's church toll slowly, loud dark iron, the bells, hi-o. hi Bloom, desperately, wait. Stop. Gulls. Good heart. I saw. Innocence. Girl in the monkey house. Zoo. Lewd chimpanzee. Breathlessly, pelvic basin. Her artless blush unmanned me. Overcome with emotion, I left the precincts. He turns to a figure in the crowd, appealing, Heinz, may I speak to you? You know me. That three shillings you can keep. If you want a little more. Heinz, coldly, you are a perfect stranger. Second watch, 
points to the corner, the bomb is here. First watch, infernal machine with a time fuse. Bloom, no, no. Pig's feet. I was at a funeral. First watch, draws his truncheon, liar. The beagle lifts his snout, showing the gray scorbutic face of Patty Dignam. He has not all. He exhales a putrid carcass breath. He grows to human size and shape. His dachshund coat becomes a brown mortuary habit. His green eye flashes bloodshot. Half of one ear, all the nose and both thumbs are ghoul eaten, Patty Dignam. In a hollow voice, it is true. It was my funeral. Dr. Finnegan pronounced life extinct when I succumbed to the disease from natural causes. He lifts his mutilated ashen face moonwards and bays lugubriously, Bloom, in triumph, you hear? Patty Dignam, Bloom, I am Patty Dignam's spirit. List, list, oh list. Bloom, the voice is the voice of Esau. Second watch, blesses himself, how is that possible? First watch, it is not in the penny catechism. Patty Dignam, by metempsychosis. Spooks. A voice, oh rocks. Patty Dignam, earnestly, once I was in the employ of Mr. J. H. Mentone, solicitor, commissioner for oaths and affidavits, of 27 bachelors walk. Now I am defunct, the wall of the heart hypertrophied. Hard lines. The poor wife was awfully cut up. How is she bearing it? Keep her off that bottle of sherry. He looks round him, a lamp. I must satisfy an animal need. That buttermilk didn't agree with me. The portly figure of John O'Connell, caretaker, stands forth, holding a bunch of keys tied with crepe. Beside him stands Father Coffee, chaplain, toad-bellied, rhinect, in a surplice and bandana nightcap, holding sleepily a staff of twisted poppies, Father Coffee, yawns, then chants with a horse croak, Naman. Jacobs. Bo biscuits. Amen. John O'Connell, foghorn stormily through his megaphone, Dignam, Patrick T., deceased. Patty Dignam with pricked up ears, winces, overtones. He wriggles forward and places an ear to the ground, my master's voice. John O'Connell, burial docket letter number U. P85000. Field 17. House of Keys. Plot, 101. Patty Dignam listens with visible effort, thinking, his tail stiff-pointed, his ears cocked, Patty Dignam, pray for the repose of his soul. He worms down through a coal hole, his brown habit trailing its tether over rattling pebbles. After him toddles an obese grandfather rat on fungus turtle paws under a gray carapace. Dignam's voice, muffled, is heard baying underground, Dignam's dead and gone below. Tom Rochford, robin redbreasted, in cap and breeches, jumps from his two-column machine, Tom Rochford, a hand to his breastbone, bows, Reuben J. A floor and I find him. He fixes the manhole with a resolute stare, my turn now on. Follow me up to Carlo. He executes a daredevil salmon leap in the air and is engulfed in the coal hole. Two discs on the columns wobble, eyes of nod. All recedes. Bloom plodges forward again through the sump. Kisses chirp amid the rifts of fog. A piano sounds. He stands before a lighted house, listening. The kisses, winging from their bowers, fly about him, twittering, warbling, cooing, the kisses, warbling, Leo. Twittering, icky licky micky sticky for Leo. Cooing, coo coo coo. Yum I am, wam um. Warbling, big come big. Pirouette. Leopold. Twittering, Leoli. Warbling, O oh Leo. They rustle, flutter upon his garments, a light, bright giddy flex, silvery sequins, bloom, a man's touch. Sad music. Church music. Perhaps here. Zoe Higgins, a young whore in a sapphire slip, closed with three bronze buckles a slim black velvet fillet round her throat, nods, trips down the steps and accosts him, Zoe, are you looking for someone? He's inside with his friend. Bloom, is this Mrs. Max? Zoe, no, 81. Mrs. Cohen's. You might go farther and fare worse. Mother slipper slapper. Familiarly, she's on the job herself tonight with the vetter tipster that gives her all the winners and pays for her son in Oxford. Working overtime but her luck's turned today. Suspiciously, you're not his father, are you? Bloom, not I. Zoe, you both in black. Has little Mousy any tickles tonight? His skin, alert, feels her fingertips approach. A hand glides over his left thigh, Zoe, how's the nuts? Bloom, offside. Curiously they are on the right. Heavier, I suppose. One in a million my tailor, Macias, says. Zoe, 
In sudden alarm, you've a hard shanker. Bloom, not likely. Zoe, I feel it. Her hand slides into his left trouser pocket and brings out a hard black shriveled potato. She regards it in Bloom with dumb moist lips, Bloom, a talisman. Heirloom. Zoe, for Zoe? For keeps? For being so nice, eh? She puts the potato greedily into a pocket then links his arm, cuddling him with supple warmth. He smiles uneasily. Slowly, note by note, oriental music is played. He gazes in the tawny crystal of her eyes, ringed with kahal. His smile softens, Zoe, you'll know me the next time. Bloom, forlornly, I never loved a dear gazelle but it was sure too. Gazelles are leaping, feeding on the mountains. Near our lakes. Round their shores file shadows black of cedar groves. Aroma rises, a strong hair growth of resin. It burns, the Orient, a sky of sapphire, cleft by the bronze flight of eagles. Under it lies the woman city, nude, white, still, cool, in luxury. A fountain murmurs among damask roses. Mammoth roses murmur of scarlet wine grapes. A wine of shame, lust, blood exudes, strangely murmuring, Zoe, murmuring sing-song with the music, her odalisque lips lusciously smeared with sab of swine fat and rosewater, skurichani wenowak, beneth high rush Elohim. Bloom, fascinated, I thought you were of good stock by your accent. Zoe, and you know what thought did? She bites his ear gently with little gold stop teeth, sending on him a cloying breath of stale garlic. The roses draw apart, disclose a sepulchre of the gold of kings and their moldering bones, Bloom, draws back, mechanically caressing her right bub with a flat awkward hand, are you a Dublin girl? Zoe, catches a stray hair deftly and twists it to her coil, no bloody fear. I'm English. Have you a swagger root? Bloom, as before, rarely smoke, dear. Cigar now and then. Childish device. Lewdly, the mouth can be better engaged than with a cylinder of rank weed. Zoe, go on. Make a stump speech out of it. Bloom, in workman's corduroy overalls, black gansey with red floating tie and Apache cap, mankind is incorrigible. Sir Walter Raleigh brought from the new world that potato and that weed, the one a killer of pestilence by absorption, the other a poisoner of the ear, eye, heart, memory, will, understanding, all. That is to say he brought the poison a hundred years before another person whose name I forget brought the food. Suicide. Lies. All our habits. Why, look at our public life. Midnight chimes from distant steeples, the chimes, turn again, Leopold. Lord Mayor of Dublin. Bloom, in alderman's gown and chain, electors of Aaron Key, Inns Key, Rotunda, Mount Joy, and North Dock, better run a tramline, I say, from the cattle market to the river. That's the music of the future. That's my program. Qui bono? But our buccaneering Vanderdeckens and their phantom ship of finance. An elector, three times three for our future chief magistrate. The aurora borealis of the torchlight procession leaps, the torchbearers, hooray. Several well-known burgesses, city magnates and freemen of the city shake hands with Bloom and congratulate him. Timothy Harrington, late thrice Lord Mayor of Dublin, imposing in mayoral scarlet, gold chain and white silk tie, confers with Councillor Lorcan Sherlock, locum tenens. They nod vigorously in agreement, late Lord Mayor Harrington, in scarlet robe with mace, gold mayoral chain and large white silk scarf, that Alderman Sir Leo Bloom's speech be printed at the expense of the ratepayers. That the house in which he was born be ornamented with a commemorative tablet and that the thoroughfare hitherto known as Cow Parlor off Cork Street be henceforth designated Boulevard Bloom. Councillor Lorcan Sherlock, carried unanimously. Bloom, impassionedly, these flying Dutchmen or lying Dutchmen as they recline in their upholstered poop, casting dice, what wreck they? Machines is their cry, their chimera, their panacea. Labor-saving apparatuses, supplanters, bugbears, manufactured monsters for mutual murder, hideous hobgoblins produced by a horde of capitalistic lusts upon our prostituted labor. The poor man starves while they are grassing their royal mountain stags or shooting peasants and fartridges in their purblind pomp of pelf and power. But their reign is rover for reaver and ever and ev. Prolonged applause. Venetian masts, maypoles and festal arches spring up. A streamer bearing the legends Cod Mile Faltia and Mat Tab Melek Israel spans the street. All the windows are thronged with sightseers, chiefly ladies. Along the route the regiments of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers, the King's own Scottish Borderers, the Cameron Highlanders and the Welsh Fusiliers, standing to attention, keep back the crowd. Boys from high school are perched on the lampposts, telegraph poles, windowsills, cornices, 
gutters, chimney pots, railings, rain spouts, whistling and cheering. The pillar of the cloud appears. A fife and drum band is heard in the distance playing the Kol Nadre. The beaters approach with imperial eagles hoisted, trailing banners and waving oriental palms. The chryselephant and papal standard rises high, surrounded by pennons of the civic flag. The van of the procession appears headed by John Howard Parnell, city marshal, in a chessboard tabard, the athlone pursuivant and Ulster King of Arms. They are followed by the Right Honourable Joseph Hutchinson, Lord Mayor of Dublin, His Lordship the Lord Mayor of Cork, their worships the mayors of Limerick, Galway, Sligo, and Waterford, 28 Irish representative peers, Surtur's, grandees and maharajas bearing the cloth of estate, the Dublin Metropolitan Fire Brigade, the Chapter of the Saints of Finance and their plutocratic order of precedence, the Bishop of Down and Connor, His Eminence Michael Cardinal Logue, Archbishop of Armagh, Primate of all Ireland, His Grace, the Most Reverend Dr. William Alexander, Archbishop of Armagh, Primate of all Ireland, the Chief Rabbi, the Presbyterian Moderator, the Heads of the Baptist, Anabaptist, Methodist and Moravian Chapels and the Honorary Secretary of the Society of Friends. After them march the guilds and trades and train bands with flying colours, coopers, bird fanciers, millwrights, newspaper canvassers, law scriveners, masseurs, vintners, trussmakers, chimney sweeps, lard refiners, tabinet and poplin weavers, farriers, Italian warehousemen, church decorators, bootjack manufacturers, undertakers, silk mercers, lapidaries, salesmasters, cork cutters, assessors of fire losses, dyers and cleaners, export bottlers, fellmongers, ticket riders, heraldic seal engravers, horse repository hands, bullion brokers, cricket and archery outfitters, riddle makers, egg and potato factors, hosiers and glovers, plumbing contractors. After them march gentlemen of the bedchamber, black rod, deputy garter, gold stick, the master of horse, the lord great chamberlain, the earl marshal, the high constable carrying the sword of state, St. Stephen's iron crown, the chalice and Bible. Four buglers on foot blow a senate. Beefeaters reply, winding clarions of welcome. Under an arch of triumph bloom appears, bareheaded, in a crimson velvet mantle trimmed with ermine, bearing St. Edward's staff, the orb and scepter with the dove, the kirtana. He is seated on a milk-white horse with long flowing crimson tail, richly caparisoned, with golden headstall. Wild excitement. The ladies from their balconies throw down rose petals. The air is perfumed with essences. The men cheer. Bloom's boys run amid the bystanders with branches of hawthorn and wren bushes. Bloom's boys, the wren, the wren, the king of all birds, St. Stephen's his day was caught in the furs. A blacksmith, murmurs, for the honor of God. And is that Bloom? He scarcely looks thirty-one. A pavior and flagger, that's the famous Bloom now, the world's greatest reformer. Hats off. All uncover their heads. Women whisper eagerly, a millionaires, richly, isn't he simply wonderful? A noblewoman, nobly, all that man has seen. A feminist, masculinely, and done. A bellhanger, a classic face. He has the forehead of a thinker. Bloom's weather. A sunburst appears in the northwest, the Bishop of Down and Connor, I here present your undoubted Emperor President and King Chairman, the most serene and potent and very puissant ruler of this realm. God save Leopold I. All, God save Leopold I. Bloom, in Dalmatic and purple mantle, to the Bishop of Down and Connor, with dignity, thanks, somewhat eminent sir. William, Archbishop of Armagh, in purple stock and shovel hat, will you to your power cause law and mercy to be executed in all your judgments in Ireland and territories thereunto belonging? Bloom, placing his right hand on his testicles, swears, so may the Creator deal with me, all this I promise to do. Michael, Archbishop of Armagh, pours a cruise of hair oil over Bloom's head, Gaudium Magnum Annuncio Vobis. Habemus Carnificum. Leopold, Patrick, Andrew, David, George, be thou anointed. Bloom assumes a mantle of cloth of gold and puts on a ruby ring. He ascends and stands on the stone of destiny. The representative peers put on at the same time their twenty-eight crowns. Joy bells ring in Christ Church, St. Patrick's, George's and Gay Malahide. Miris bizarre fireworks go up from all sides with symbolical phallopyrotechnic designs. The peers do homage, one by one, approaching and genuflecting, the peers, I do become your liege man of life and limb to earthly worship. Bloom holds up his right hand on which sparkles the Koinor diamond. His palfrey neighs. Immediate silence. Wireless intercontinental and interplanetary transmitters are set for reception of message, Bloom, my subjects. 
we hereby nominate our faithful charger copula Felix hereditary grand vizier and announce that we have this day repudiated our former spouse and have bestowed our royal hand upon the princess Celine, the splendor of night. The former morganatic spouse of Bloom is hastily removed in the Black Maria. The princess Celine, in moon blue robes, a silver crescent on her head, descends from a sedan chair, borne by two giants. An outburst of cheering, John Howard Parnell, raises the royal standard, illustrious Bloom. Successor to my famous brother. Bloom, embraces John Howard Parnell, we thank you from our heart, John, for this right royal welcome to Green Erin, the promised land of our common ancestors. The freedom of the city is presented to him embodied in a charter. The keys of Dublin, crossed on a crimson cushion, are given to him. He shows all that he is wearing green socks, Tom Kernan, you deserve it, your honor. Bloom, on this day twenty years ago we overcame the hereditary enemy at Ladysmith. Our howitzers and camel swivel guns played on his lines with telling effect. Half a league onward. They charge. All is lost now. Do we yield? No. We drive them headlong. Lo. We charge. Deploying to the left our light horse swept across the heights of Plevna and, uttering their war cry bona fide Sabaoth, sabred the Saracen gunners to a man. The chapel of Freeman typesetters. Here. Here. John Wise Nolan, there's the man that got away James Stevens. A blue coat schoolboy, bravo. An old resident, you're a credit to your country, sir, that's what you are. An apple woman, he's a man like Ireland wants. Bloom, my beloved subjects, a new era is about to dawn. I, Bloom, tell you verily it is even now at hand. Yea, on the word of a Bloom, ye shall ere long enter into the golden city which is to be, the new blue Muslim in the Nova Hibernia of the future. Thirty two workmen, wearing rosettes, from all the counties of Ireland under the guidance of Derwin the Builder, construct the new blue Muslim. It is a colossal edifice with crystal roof, built in the shape of a huge port kidney, containing 40,000 rooms. In the course of its extension several buildings and monuments are demolished. Government offices are temporarily transferred to railway sheds. Numerous houses are raised to the ground. The inhabitants are lodged in barrels and boxes, all marked in red with the letters, L, B. Several paupers fall from a ladder. A part of the walls of Dublin, crowded with loyal sightseers, collapses, the sightseers, dying, more turi te salutant. They die, a man in a brown Macintosh springs up through a trapdoor. He points an elongated finger at Bloom, the man in the Macintosh, don't you believe a word he says. That man is Leopold Macintosh, the notorious fire raiser. His real name is Higgins. Bloom, shoot him. Dog of a Christian. So much for Macintosh. A cannon shot. The man in the Macintosh disappears. Bloom with his scepter strikes down poppies. The instantaneous deaths of many powerful enemies, graziers, members of parliament, members of standing committees, are reported. Bloom's bodyguard distribute Mondi money, commemoration medals, loaves and fishes, temperance badges, expensive Henry Clay cigars, free cow bones for soup, rubber preservatives in sealed envelopes tied with gold thread, butterscotch, pineapple rock, billets due in the form of cocked hats, ready-made suits, porringers of toad in the hole, bottles of Jay's fluid, purchase stamps, 40 days indulgences, spurious coins, dairyfed pork sausages, theater passes, season tickets available for all tram lines, coupons of the royal and privileged Hungarian lottery, penny dinner counters, cheap reprints of the world's 12 worst books, Froggy and Fritz, Politic, Care of the Baby, Infantilic, 50 meals for seven-sixths, Cullinic, Was Jesus a Sun Myth? Historic, Expel That Pain, Medic, Infant's Compendium of the Universe, Cosmic, Let's All Chortle, Hilaric, Canvassers Vade Mecum, Journalic, Love Letters of Mother Assistant, Erotic, Who's Who in Space, Asterisk, Songs That Reached Our Heart, Melodic, Pennywise's Way to Wealth, Parsimonic. A General Russian Scramble. Women press forward to touch the hem of Bloom's robe. The Lady Gwendolyn Dubedit bursts through the throng, leaps on his horse and kisses him on both cheeks amid great acclamation. A magnesium flashlight photograph is taken. Babes and sucklings are held up, the women, little father. Little father. The babes and sucklings, clap clap hands till Paldi comes home, cakes in his pocket for Leo alone. Bloom, bending down, pokes baby Boardman gently in the stomach, baby Boardman, hiccups, curdled milk flowing from his mouth, hajajaja. Bloom, shaking hands with a blind stripling, my more than brother. Placing his arms round the shoulders of an old couple, dear old friends. He plays pussy four corners with ragged boys and girls, peep. Bo peep. 
He wheels twins in a perambulator, tic tac do Woody Asatashu. He performs juggler's tricks, draws red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet silk handkerchiefs from his mouth, Roy G. Biv. 32 feet per second. He consoles a widow, absence makes the heart grow younger. He dances the highland fling with grotesque antics, leg it, ye devils. He kisses the bed sores of a palsied veteran, honorable wounds. He trips up a fat policeman, you, p, up. You, p, up. He whispers in the ear of a blushing waitress and laughs kindly, ah, naughty, naughty. He eats a raw turnip offered him by Maurice Butterly, farmer, fine. Splendid. He refuses to accept three shillings offered him by Joseph Hines, journalist, my dear fellow, not at all. He gives his coat to a beggar, please accept. He takes part in a stomach race with elderly male and female cripples, come on, boys. Wriggle it, girls. The citizen, choked with emotion, brushes aside a tear in his emerald muffler, may the good God bless him. The ram's horns sound for silence. The standard of Zion is hoisted, Bloom, uncloaks impressively, revealing obesity, unrolls a paper and reads solemnly, Aleph Beth Gimel Daleth Haggadah Tefalim Kosher Yom Kippur Hanukkah Rask Askan Abeni Brith Bar Mitzvah Matzoth Askenazim Meshuga Talith. An official translation is read by Jimmy Henry, Assistant Town Clerk, Jimmy Henry, the Court of Conscience is now open. His Most Catholic Majesty will now administer open-air justice. Free medical and legal advice, solution of doubles and other problems. All cordially invited. Given at this our loyal city of Dublin in the year one of the paradisiacal era. Patty Leonard, what am I to do about my rates and taxes? Bloom, pay them, my friend. Patty Leonard, thank you. Nosy Flynn, can I raise a mortgage on my fire insurance? Bloom, obdurately, sirs, take notice that by the law of torts you are bound over in your own recognizances for six months in the sum of five pounds. J. J. O'Malloy, a Daniel did I say? Nay. A Peter O'Brien. Nosy Flynn, where do I draw the five pounds? Pisser Burke, for bladder trouble? Bloom, acid. Knit. Hydrochlor. Dill, 20 minims tinct. Nux vome, 5 minims exter. Taraxel. Lig, 30 minims act dis terris and die. Chris Callanan, what is the parallax of the subsolar ecliptic of Aldebaran? Bloom, pleased to hear from you, Chris. K, 11. Joe Hines, why aren't you in uniform? Bloom, when my progenitor of sainted memory wore the uniform of the Austrian despot in a dank prison where was yours? Ben Dolar, pansies? Bloom, embellish, beautify, suburban gardens. Ben Dolar, when twins arrive. Bloom, father, pater, dad, starts thinking. Larry O'Rourke, an eight-day license for my new premises. You remember me, Sir Leo, when you were in number seven. I'm sending around a dozen of stout for the missus. Bloom, coldly, you have the advantage of me. Lady Bloom accepts no presents. Crofton, this is indeed a festivity. Bloom, solemnly, you call it a festivity. I call it a sacrament. Alexander Keys, when will we have our own house of keys? Bloom, I stand for the reform of municipal morals and the plain Ten Commandments. New worlds for old. Union of all, Jew, Muslim and Gentile. Three acres and a cow for all children of nature. Saloon motor hearses. Compulsory manual labor for all. All parks open to the public day and night. Electric dish scrubbers. Tuberculosis, lunacy, war and mendicancy must now cease. General amnesty, weekly carnival with mask license, bonuses for all, Esperanto the universal language with universal brotherhood. No more patriotism of bar spongers and dropsical impostors. Free money, free rent, free love and a free lay church and a free lay state. O Madden Burke, free fox and a free hen roost. Davy Byrne, yawning, five eye vowk. Bloom, mixed races and mixed marriage. Lenahan, what about mixed bathing? Bloom explains to those near him his schemes for social regeneration. All agree with him. The keeper of the Kildare Street Museum appears, dragging a lorry on which are the shaking statues of several naked goddesses, Venus Colopege, Venus Pandemos, Venus Metempsychosis, and plaster figures, also naked, representing the new nine muses, commerce, operatic music, amour, publicity, manufacture, liberty of speech, plural voting, gastronomy, private hygiene, seaside concert entertainments, painless obstetrics and astronomy for the people, Father Farley, he is an Episcopalian, an agnostic, an anything Garyan seeking to overthrow our holy faith. 
Mrs. Reardon, tears up her will, I'm disappointed in you. You bad man. Mother Grogan, removes her boot to throw it at Bloom, you beast. You abominable person. Nosy Flynn, give us a tune, Bloom. One of the old sweet songs. Bloom, with rollicking humor, I vowed that I never would leave her, she turned out a cruel deceiver. With my Turaloom 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 Turaloom. Hoppy Hollahan, good old Bloom. There's nobody like him after all. Patty Leonard, stage Irishman. Bloom, what railway opera is like a tramline in Gibraltar? The Rose of Castile. Laughter, Lenahan, plagiarist. Down with Bloom. The Veiled Sybil, enthusiastically, I'm a Bloomite and I glory in it. I believe in him in spite of all. I'd give my life for him, the funniest man on earth. Bloom, winks at the bystanders, I bet she's a bonnie lassie. Theodore Purefoy, in fishing cap and oilskin jacket, he employs a mechanical device to frustrate the sacred ends of nature. The veiled Sybil, stabs herself, my hero god. She dies, many most attractive and enthusiastic women also commit suicide by stabbing, drowning, drinking prussic acid, aconite, arsenic, opening their veins, refusing food, casting themselves under steamrollers, from the top of Nelson's Pillar, into the great vat of Guinness's brewery, asphyxiating themselves by placing their heads in gas ovens, hanging themselves in stylish garters, leaping from windows of different stories, Alexander J. Dowie, violently, fellow Christians and anti-Bloomites, the man called Bloom is from the roots of hell, a disgrace to Christian men. A fiendish libertine from his earliest years this stinking goat of Mendez gave precocious signs of infantile debauchery, recalling the cities of the plain, with a dissolute grandam. This vile hypocrite, bronzed with infamy, is the white bull mentioned in the apocalypse. A worshipper of the scarlet woman, intrigue is the very breath of his nostrils. The steak faggots and the cauldron of boiling oil are for him. Caliban. The mob, lynch him. Roast him. He's as bad as Parnell was. Mr. Fox. Mother Grogan throws her boot at Bloom. Several shopkeepers from Upper and Lower Dorset Street throw objects of little or no commercial value, ham bones, condensed milk tins, unsaleable cabbage, stale bread, sheep's tails, odd pieces of fat, Bloom, excitedly, this is midsummer madness, some ghastly joke again. By heaven, I am guiltless as the unsunned snow. It was my brother Henry. He is my double. He lives in number two Dolphin's barn. Slander, the viper, has wrongfully accused me. Fellow countrymen, Sgenlin Ban Bataquas de Gon Capel. I call on my old friend, Dr. Malachi Mulligan, sex specialist, to give medical testimony on my behalf. Dr. Mulligan, in motor jerkin, green motor goggles on his brow, Dr. Bloom is bisexually abnormal. He has recently escaped from Dr. Eustace's private asylum for demented gentlemen. Born out of bedlock hereditary epilepsy is present, the consequence of unbridled lust. Traces of elephantiasis have been discovered among his ascendants. There are marked symptoms of chronic exhibitionism. Ambidexterity is also latent. He is prematurely bald from self-abuse, perversely idealistic in consequence, a reformed rake, and has metal teeth. In consequence of a family complex he has temporarily lost his memory and I believe him to be more sinned against than sinning. I have made a pervaginal examination and, after application of the acid test to 5,427 anal, axillary, pectoral and pubic hairs, I declare him to be Virgo intacta. Bloom holds his high grade hat over his genital organs, Dr. Madden, hypsospadia is also marked. In the interest of coming generations I suggest that the parts affected should be preserved in spirits of wine in the National Teratological Museum. Dr. Crothers, I have examined the patient's urine. It is albuminoid. Salivation is insufficient, the patellar reflex intermittent. Dr. Punch Costello, the feeder Judaicus is most perceptible. Dr. Dixon, reads a bill of health, Professor Bloom is a finished example of the new womanly man. His moral nature is simple and lovable. Many have found him a dear man, a dear person. He is a rather quaint fellow on the whole, coy though not feeble-minded in the medical sense. He has written a really beautiful letter, a poem in itself, to the court missionary of the Reformed Priests Protection Society which clears up everything. He is practically a total abstainer and I can affirm that he sleeps on a straw litter and eats the most Spartan food, cold dried grocer's peas. He wears a hair shirt of pure Irish manufacture winter and summer and scourges himself every Saturday. He was, I understand, at one time a first-class misdemeanor in Glencree Reformatory. Another report states that he was a very posthumous child. I appeal for clemency in the name of the most sacred word our vocal organs have ever been called upon to speak. He is about to have a baby. 
general commotion and compassion. Women faint. A wealthy American makes a street collection for Bloom. Gold and silver coins, blank checks, banknotes, jewels, treasury bonds, maturing bills of exchange, I, O, use, wedding rings, watch chains, lockets, necklaces and bracelets are rapidly collected, Bloom, O, oh, I so want to be a mother. Mrs. Thornton, in nurse tender's gown, embrace me tight, dear. You'll be soon over it. Tight, dear. Bloom embraces her tightly and bears eight male yellow and white children. They appear on a red carpeted staircase adorned with expensive plants. All the octuplets are handsome, with valuable metallic faces, well made, respectably dressed and well conducted, speaking five modern languages fluently and interested in various arts and sciences. Each has his name printed in legible letters on his shirt front Nasadoro, Goldfinger, Chrysostomos, Maindori, Silver Smile, Silver Selber, Vifargent, Panergyros. They are immediately appointed to positions of high public trust in several different countries as managing directors of banks, traffic managers of railways, chairman of limited liability companies, vice chairman of hotel syndicates, a voice, Bloom, are you the Messiah Ben Joseph or Ben David? Bloom, darkly, you have said it. Brother Buzz, then perform a miracle like Father Charles. Bantam Lions, prophesy who will win the Saint Ledger. Bloom walks on a net, covers his left eye with his left ear passes through several walls, climbs Nelson's pillar, hangs from the top ledge by his eyelids, eats twelve dozen oysters, shells included, heals several sufferers from King's evil, contracts his face so as to resemble many historical personages, Lord Beaconsfield, Lord Byron, what Tyler, Moses of Egypt, Moses Maimonides, Moses Mendelssohn, Henry Irving, Rip Van Winkle, Kossuth, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Baron Leopold Rothschild, Robinson Crusoe, Sherlock Holmes, Pasteur, turns each foot simultaneously in different directions, bids the tide turn back, eclipses the sun by extending his little finger, Brini, papal nuncio, in papal zouave's uniform, steel cuirasses as breastplate, armplates, thigh plates, leg plates, large profane mustaches and brown paper miter, Leopoldi autumn generatio. Moses begat Noah and Noah begat Eunuch and Eunuch begat O'Halloran and O'Halloran begat Guggenheim and Guggenheim begat Agendath and Agendath begat Netaim and Netaim begat Lahirsch and Lahirsch begat Jeshurim and Jeshurim begat Makai and Makai begat Ostrolopsky and Ostrolopsky begat Smirdos and Smirdos begat Weiss and Weiss begat Schwartz and Schwartz begat Adrianopoli and Adrianopoli begat Aranjuez and Aranjuez begat Louis Lawson and Louis Lawson begat Akabu Donasser and Akabu Donasser begat O'Donnell Magnus and O'Donnell Magnus begat Christbaum and Christbaum begat Ben Maimon and Ben Ben Maimon begat Dusty Rhodes and Dusty Rhodes begat Benamore and Benamore begat Jones Smith and Jones Smith begat Savergnanovich and Savergnanovich begat Jasper Stone and Jasper Stone begat Vingtatunium and Vingtatunium begat Sombate and Sombate begat Virig and Virig begat Bloom et vocabiter nomen Aeus Emanuel. A dead hand, writes on the wall, Bloom is a cod. Crab, in Bushranger's kit, what did you do in the cattle creek behind Kilbarrick? A female infant, shakes a rattle, and under Ballybow Bridge? A hollybush, and in the Devil's Glen? Bloom, blushes furiously all over from fronts to nadies, three tears falling from his left eye, spare my past. The Irish evicted tenants, in body coats, knee breeches, with Donnybrook fair shillelaghs, stumbach him. Bloom with ass's ears seats himself in the pillory with crossed arms, his feet protruding. He whistles Don Giovanni, a St. Arteco. Artane orphans, joining hands, caper round him. Girls of the prison gate mission, joining hands, caper round in the opposite direction, the Artane orphans, you hig, you hog, you dirty dog. You think the ladies love you. The prison gate girls, if you see K tell him he may see you in T tell him from me. Hornblower, in effort and hunting cap, announces, and he shall carry the sins of the people to Azazel, the spirit which is in the wilderness, and to Lilith, the night hag. And they shall stone him and defile him, yea, all from Agendath Netaim and from Mizraim, the land of Ham. All the people cast soft pantomime stones at Bloom. Many bona fide travelers and ownerless dogs come near him and defile him. Mastiansky and Citroen approach in gabardines, wearing long urlocks. They wag their beards at Bloom, Mastiansky and Citroen, Belial. Leem Lane of Istria, the false messiah. Abalafia. Recant. George R. May see us, Bloom's tailor, appears, a tailor's goose under his arm, presenting a bill, May see us to alteration one pair trousers eleven shillings. Bloom, rubs his hands cheerfully, just like old times. Poor Bloom. Reuben J. Dodd, black-bearded Iscariot, bad shepherd, bearing on his shoulders the drowned corpse of his son, approaches the pillory, Reuben J., 
whispers hoarsely, the squeak is out. A split is gone for the flatties. Nip the first rattler. The fire brigade, fulp. Brother Buzz, invests Bloom in a yellow habit with embroidery of painted flames and high-pointed hat. He places a bag of gunpowder round his neck and hands him over to the civil power, saying, forgive him his trespasses. Lieutenant Myers of the Dublin Fire Brigade by general request sets fire to Bloom. Lamentations, the citizen, thank heaven. Bloom, in a seamless garment marked I. H. S. stands upright amid Phoenix flames, weep not for me, O daughters of Aaron. He exhibits to Dublin reporters traces of burning. The daughters of Aaron, in black garments, with large prayer books and long lighted candles in their hands, kneel down and pray, the daughters of Aaron, kidney of Bloom, pray for us flower of the bath, pray for us mentor of Mentone, pray for us canvasser for the freeman, pray for us charitable mason, pray for us wandering soap, pray for us sweets of sin, pray for us music without words, pray for us reprover of the citizen, pray for us friend of all frillies, pray for us midwife most merciful, pray for us potato preservative against plague and pestilence, pray for us. A choir of 600 voices, conducted by Vincent O'Brien, sings the chorus from Handel's Messiah Alleluia for the Lord God Omnipotent reigneth, accompanied on the organ by Joseph Glynn. Bloom becomes mute, shrunken, carbonized, Zoe, talk away till you're black in the face. Bloom, in caw being with clay pipe stuck in the band, Dusty Brogues, an emigrant's red handkerchief bundle in his hand, leading a black bog oak pig by a shug on, with a smile in his eye, let me be going now, woman of the house, for by all the goats in Connemara I'm after having the father and mother of abating. With a tear in his eye, all insanity. Patriotism, sorrow for the dead, music, future of the race. To be or not to be. Life's stream is o'er. End it peacefully. They can live on. He gazes far away mournfully, I am ruined. A few pastilles of aconite. The blinds drawn. A letter. Then lie back to rest. He breathes softly, no more. I have lived. Fair. Farewell. Zoe, stiffly, her finger in her neck fillet, honest? Till the next time. She sneers, suppose you got up the wrong side of the bed or came too quick with your best girl. Oh, I can read your thoughts. Bloom, bitterly, man and woman, love, what is it? A cork and bottle. I'm sick of it. Let everything rip. Zoe, in sudden sulks, I hate a rotter that's insincere. Give a bleeding whore a chance. Bloom, repentantly, I am very disagreeable. You are a necessary evil. Where are you from? London? Zoe, glibly, hogs Norton where the pigs plays the organs. I'm Yorkshire born. She holds his hand which is feeling for her nipple, I say, Tommy Tittlemouse. Stop that and begin worse. Have you cash for a short time? Ten shillings? Bloom, smiles, nods slowly, more, hurry, more. Zoe, and Moore's mother? She pats him off-handedly with velvet paws, are you coming into the music room to see our new pianola? Come and I'll peel off. Bloom, feeling his occiput dubiously with the unparalleled embarrassment of a harassed peddler gauging the symmetry of her peeled pears, somebody would be dreadfully jealous if she knew. The green-eyed monster. Earnestly, you know how difficult it is. I needn't tell you. Zoe, flattered, what the I can't see the heart can't grieve for. She pats him, come. Bloom, laughing witch. The hand that rocks the cradle. Zoe, Babby. Bloom, in Babylonian and Pelissa, big-headed, with a call of dark hair, fixes big eyes on her fluid slip and counts its bronze buckles with a chubby finger, his moist tongue lolling and lisping, one two tealy, tealy till voot loan. The buckles, love me. Love me not. Love me. Zoe, silent means consent. With little parted talons she captures his hand, her forefinger giving to his palm the past touch of secret monitor, luring him to doom, hot hands cold gizzard. He hesitates amid sense, music, temptations. She leads him towards the steps, drawing him by the odor of her armpits, the vice of her painted eyes, the rustle of her slip in whose sinuous folds lurks the lion reek of all the male brutes that have possessed her, the male brutes, exhaling sulfur of rut and dung and ramping in their loose box, faintly roaring, their drugged heads swaying to and fro, good. Zoe and Bloom reach the doorway where two sister whores are seated. They examine him curiously from under their penciled brows and smile to his hasty bow. He trips awkwardly, Zoe, her lucky hand instantly saving him, Hoopsa. Don't fall upstairs. Bloom, the just man falls seven times. He stands aside at the threshold, after you is good manners. Zoe, ladies first, gentlemen after. 
She crosses the threshold. He hesitates. She turns and, holding out her hands, draws him over. He hops. On the antlered rack of the hall hang a man's hat and waterproof. Bloom uncovers himself but, seeing them, frowns, then smiles, preoccupied. A door on the return landing is flung open. A man in purple shirt and grey trousers, brown-socked, passes with an ape's gait, his bald head and goatee beard upheld, hugging a full water jug jar, his two-tailed black braces dangling at heels. Averting his face quickly Bloom bends to examine on the hall table the spaniel eyes of a running fox, then, his lifted head sniffing, follows Zoe into the music room. A shade of mauve tissue paper dims the light of the chandelier. Round and round a moth flies, colliding, escaping. The floor is covered with an oilcloth mosaic of jade and azure and cinnabar rhomboids. Footmarks are stamped over it in all senses, heel to heel, heel to hollow, toe to toe, feet locked, a morris of shuffling feet without body phantoms, all in a scrimmage higgledy-piggledy. The walls are tapestried with a paper of yew fronds and clear glades. In the grate is spread a screen of peacock feathers. Lynch squats cross-legged on the hearthrug of matted hair, his cap back to the front. With a wand he beats time slowly. Kitty Ricketts, a bony pallid whore in navy costume, doeskin gloves rolled back from a coral wristlet, a chain purse in her hand, sits perched on the edge of the table swinging her leg and glancing at herself in the gilt mirror over the mantelpiece. A tag of her corset lace hangs slightly below her jacket. Lynch indicates mockingly the couple at the piano, Kitty, coughs behind her hand, she's a bit imbecilic. She signs with a waggling forefinger, blemblem. Lynch lifts up her skirt and white petticoat with the wand. She settles them down quickly, respect yourself. She hiccups, then bends quickly her sailor hat under which her hair glows, red with henna, oh, excuse. Zoe, more limelight, Charlie. She goes to the chandelier and turns the gas full cock, Kitty, peers at the gas jet, what ails it tonight? Lynch, deeply, enter a ghost and hobgoblins. Zoe, clap on the back for Zoe. The wand in Lynch's hand flashes, a brass poker. Stephen stands at the pianola on which sprawl his hat and ashplant. With two fingers he repeats once more the series of empty fifths. Flory Talbot, a blonde feeble goosefat whore in a tatterdemalion gown of mildewed strawberry, lol spread eagle in the sofa corner, her limp forearm pendant over the bolster, listening. A heavy sty droops over her sleepy eyelid, Kitty, hiccups again with a kick of her horsed foot, oh, excuse. Zoe, promptly, your boy's thinking of you. Tie a knot on your shift. Kitty Ricketts bends her head. Her boa uncoils, slides, glides over her shoulder, back, arm, chair to the ground. Lynch lifts the curled caterpillar on his wand. She snakes her neck, nestling. Stephen glances behind at the squatted figure with its cap back to the front, Stephen, as a matter of fact it is of no importance whether Benedetto Marcello found it or made it. The right is the poet's rest. It may be an old hymn to Demeter or also illustrate Cola and Narant Gloriam Domini. It is susceptible of nodes or modes as far apart as hyperphrygian and mixolydian and of texts so divergent as priests hayuping round David's that is Circe's or what am I saying Ceres altar and David's tip from the stable to his chief bassoonist about the all-rightness of his almightiness. May nom de nom, that is another pair of trousers. Jets la gourm. Faux Cajun s se passe. He stops, points at Lynch's cap, smiles, laughs, which side is your knowledge bump? The cap, with saturnine spleen, bah. It is because it is. Woman's reason. Jew Greek is Greek Jew. Extremes meet. Death is the highest form of life. Bah. Stephen, you remember fairly accurately all my errors, boasts, mistakes. How long shall I continue to close my eyes to disloyalty? Whetstone. The cap, bah. Stephen, here's another for you. He frowns, the reason is because the fundamental and the dominant are separated by the greatest possible interval which. The cap, which. Finish. You can't. Stephen, with an effort, interval which. Is the greatest possible ellipse. Consistent with. The ultimate return. The octave. Which. The cap, which. Outside the gramophone begins to blare the holy city, Stephen, abruptly, what went forth to the ends of the world to traverse not itself, God, the sun, Shakespeare, a commercial traveler, having itself traversed in reality itself becomes that self. Wait a moment. Wait a second. Damn that fellow's noise in the street. Self which it itself was ineluctably preconditioned to become. Echo. Lynch, with a mocking whinny of laughter grins at Bloom and Zoe Higgins, what a learned speech, eh? Zoe, briskly, God help your head, he knows more than you have forgotten. 
With obese stupidity Flory Talbot regards Stephen, Flory, they say the last day is coming this summer. Kitty, no. Zoe, explodes in laughter, great unjust God. Flory, offended, well, it was in the papers about Antichrist. Oh, my foot's tickling. Ragged barefoot newsboys, jogging a wagtail kite, patter past, yelling, the newsboys, stop press edition. Result of the rocking horse races. Sea serpent in the Royal Canal. Safe arrival of Antichrist. Stephen turns and sees Bloom, Stephen, a time, times and half a time. Reuben J. Antichrist, wandering Jew, a clutching hand open on his spine, stumps forward. Across his loins is slung a pilgrim's wallet from which protrude promissory notes and dishonored bills. Aloft over his shoulder he bears a long boat pole from the hook of which the sodden huddled mass of his only son, saved from liffy waters, hangs from the slack of its breeches. A hobgoblin in the image of Punch Costello, hipshot, crook-backed, hydrocephalic, prognathic with receding forehead and ally sloper nose, tumbles in somersaults through the gathering darkness, all, what? The hobgoblin, his jaws chattering, capers to and fro, goggling his eyes, squeaking, kangaroo hopping with outstretched clutching arms, then all at once thrusts his lipless face through the fork of his thighs, il vian. Say moi. Lome key writ. Lome primogene. He whirls round and round with dervish howls, sears at dames, fet vos jus. He crouches juggling. Tiny roulette planets fly from his hands, les jus sans fez. The planets rush together, uttering crepitant cracks, re and va plus. The planets, buoyant balloons, sail swollen up and away. He springs off into vacuum, flory, sinking into torpor, crossing herself secretly, the end of the world. A female tepid effluvium leaks out from her. Nebulous obscurity occupies space. Through the drifting fog without the gramophone blares over coughs and feet shuffling, the gramophone, Jerusalem. Open your gates and sing Hosanna. A rocket rushes up the sky and bursts. A white star falls from it, proclaiming the consummation of all things and second coming of Elijah. Along an infinite invisible tightrope taut from zenith to nadir the end of the world, a two-headed octopus in Gilly's kilts, Busby and Tartan Philobegs, whirls through the murk, head over heels, in the form of the three legs of man, the end of the world, with a scotch accent, while dance the keel row, the keel row, the keel row? Over the passing drift and choking breath coughs, Elijah's voice, harsh as a corncrakes, jars on high. Perspiring in a loose lawn surplice with funnel sleeves he is seen, verger-faced, above a rostrum about which the banner of old glory is draped. He thumps the parapet, Elijah, no yapping, if you please, in this booth. Jake Crane, Creole Sue, Dove Campbell, Abe Kirshner, do your coughing with your mouth shut. Say, I am operating all this trunk line. Boys, do it now. God's time is 12.25. Tell mother you'll be there. Rush your order and you play a slick ace. Join on right here. Book through to Eternity Junction, the non-stop run. Just one word more. Are you a god or a doggone clod? If the second advent came to Coney Island are we ready? Flory Christ, Stephen Christ, Zoe Christ, Bloom Christ, Kitty Christ, Lynch Christ, it's up to you to sense that cosmic force. Have we cold feet about the cosmos? No. Be on the side of the angels. Be a prism. You have that something within, the higher self. You can rub shoulders with a Jesus, a Gotama, an Ingersoll. Are you all in this vibration? I say you are. You once nobble that, congregation, and a buck joyride to heaven becomes a back number. You got me? It's a life brightener, sure. The hottest stuff ever was. It's the whole pie with jam in. It's just the cutest snappiest line out. It is immense, super sumptuous. It restores. It vibrates. I know and I am some vibrator. Joking apart and, getting down to bedrock, A, J. Christ Dowie and the Harmonial Philosophy, have you got that? Oh, K77 West 69th Street. Got me? That's it. You call me up by sunphone any old time. Bum boosters, save your stamps. He shouts, now then our glory song. All join heartily in the singing. Encore. He sings, Jeru. The gramophone, drowning his voice, Jerusalem in your hi-ho. The disc rasps gratingly against the needle, the three whores, covering their ears, squawk, ock. Elijah, in rolled up shirt sleeves, black in the face, shouts at the top of his voice, his arms uplifted, big brother up there, Mr. President, you hear what I done just been saying to you. Certainly, I sort of believe strong in you, Mr. President. 
I certainly am thinking now Miss Higgins and Miss Ricketts got religion way inside them. Certainly seems to me I don't never see no wusser scared female than the way you been, Miss Flory, just now as I done seed you. Mr. President, you come long and help me save our sisters dear. He winks at his audience, our Mr. President, he twigged the whole lot and he ain't saying nothing. Kitty Kate, I forgot myself. In a weak moment I erred and did what I did on Constitution Hill. I was confirmed by the bishop and enrolled in the Brown Scapular. My mother's sister married a Montmorency. It was a working plumber was my ruination when I was pure. Zoe Fanny, I let him larrup it into me for the fun of it. Flory Teresa, it was in consequence of a port wine beverage on top of Hennessy's three star. I was guilty with Whelan when he slipped into the bed. Stephen, in the beginning was the word, in the end the world without end. Blessed be the eight Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, Dixon, Madden, Crothers, Costello, Lenahan, Bannon, Mulligan and Lynch in white surgical students' gowns, four abreast, goose stepping, tramp fast past in noisy marching, the Beatitudes, incoherently, beer beef battle dog Bible Bisnum Barnum Buggerum Bishop. Leicester, in Quaker grey knee breeches and broad brimmed hat, says discreetly, he is our friend. I need not mention names. Seek thou the light. He carantos by. Best enters in hairdresser's attire, shinily laundered, his locks in curl papers. He leads John Eglinton who wears a mandarin's kimono of nankeen yellow, lizard lettered, and a high pagoda hat, best, smiling, lifts the hat and displays a shaven pole from the crown of which bristles a pigtail to pay tied with an orange top knot, I was just beautifying him, don't you know? A thing of beauty, don't you know, Yates says, or I mean, Keats says. John Eglinton, produces a green cap dark lantern and flashes it towards a corner, with carping accent, aesthetics and cosmetics are for the boudoir. I am out for truth. Plain truth for a plain man. Tandaragi wants the facts and means to get them. In the cone of the searchlight behind the coal's cuddle, lave, holy-eyed, the bearded figure of Manana on McClear broods, chin on knees. He rises slowly. A cold sea wind blows from his druid mouth. About his head writhe eels and elvers. He is encrusted with weeds and shells. His right hand holds a bicycle pump. His left hand grasps a huge crayfish by its two talons, Manon on McClear, with a voice of waves, Ohm. Heck. Wall. A.K. Lub. More. Ma. White Yogan of the Gods. A cult commander of Hermes Trismegistos. With a voice of whistling sea wind, Punarianum Patsy Punjab. I won't have my leg pulled. It has been said by one. Beware the left, the cult of Shakti. With a cry of stormbirds, Shakti Shiva, dark hidden father. He smites with his bicycle pump the crayfish in his left hand. On its cooperative dial glow the twelve signs of the zodiac. He wails with the vehemence of the ocean, Om. Balm. Pajam. I am the light of the homestead. I am the dreamery creamery butter. A skeleton Judas hand strangles the light. The green light wanes to mauve. The gas jet wails whistling, the gas jet, Pua. Foy 5. Zoe runs to the chandelier and, crooking her leg, adjusts the mantle, Zoe, who has a fag as I'm here. Lynch, tossing a cigarette onto the table, here. Zoe, her head perched aside in mock pride, is that the way to hand the pot to a lady? She stretches up to light the cigarette over the flame, twirling it slowly, showing the brown tufts of her armpits. Lynch with his poker lifts boldly aside of her slip. Bare from her garters up her flesh appears under the sapphire and Nixie's green. She puffs calmly at her cigarette, can you see the beauty spot of my behind? Lynch, I'm not looking Zoe, makes sheep's eyes, no? You wouldn't do a less thing. Would you suck a lemon? Squinting in mock shame she glances with sidelong meaning at Bloom, then twists round towards him, pulling her slip free of the poker. Blue fluid again flows over her flesh. Bloom stands, smiling desirously, twirling his thumbs. Kitty Ricketts licks her middle finger with her spittle and, gazing in the mirror, smooths both eyebrows. Lippity virig, basilicogramate, shoots rapidly down through the chimney flue and struts two steps to the left on gawky pink stilts. He is sausaged into several overcoats and wears a brown Macintosh under which he holds a roll of parchment. In his left eye flashes the monocle of Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell. On his head is perched an Egyptian pshint. Two quills project over his ears, virig, heels together, bows, my name is Vera Glippity, of Sombate. He coughs thoughtfully, dryly, promiscuous nakedness is much in evidence hereabouts, eh? Inadvertently her back view revealed the fact that she is not wearing those rather intimate garments of which you are a particular devotee. 
the injection mark on the thigh I hope you perceived? Good. Bloom, Grandpapachi. But. Virag, number two on the other hand, she of the cherry rouge and coiffes white, whose hair owes not a little to our tribal elixir of gopherwood, is in walking costume and tightly staced by her sit, I should opine. Backbone in front, so to say. Correct me but I always understood that the act so performed by skittish humans with glimpses of lingerie appealed to you in virtue of its exhibitionisticity. In a word. Hippogriff. Am I right? Bloom, she is rather lean. Virag, not unpleasantly, absolutely. Well observed and those pannier pockets of the skirt and slightly pegtop effect are devised to suggest bunchiness of hip. A new purchase at some monster sale for which a gull has been mulcted. Meretricious finery to deceive the eye. Observe the attention to details of dust specks. Never put on you tomorrow what you can wear today. Parallax. With a nervous twitch of his head, did you hear my brain go snap? Polysyllabax. Bloom, an elbow resting in a hand, a forefinger against his cheek, she seems sad. Virag, cynically, his weasel teeth bared yellow, draws down his left eye with a finger and barks hoarsely, hoax. Beware of the flapper and bogus mournful. Lily of the alley. All possess bachelor's button discovered by Raldus Columbus. Tumble her. Columble her. Chameleon. More genially, well then, permit me to draw your attention to item number three. There is plenty of her visible to the naked eye. Observe the mass of oxygenated vegetable matter on her skull. What ho, she bumps. The ugly duckling of the party, long casted and deep in keel. Bloom, regretfully, when you come out without your gun. Virag, we can do you all brands, mild, medium and strong. Pay your money, take your choice. How happy could you be with either? Bloom, with? Virag, his tongue up curling, limb. Look. Her beam is broad. She is coated with quite a considerable layer of fat. Obviously mammal in weight of bosom you remark that she has in front well to the four two protuberances of very respectable dimensions, inclined to fall in the noonday supilate, while on her rear lower down are two additional protuberances, suggestive of potent rectum and tumescent for palpation, which leave nothing to be desired save compactness. Such fleshy parts are the product of careful nurture. When coop fatten their livers reach an elephantine size. Pellets of new bread with fenugreek and gum benjamin swamp down by potions of green tea endow them during their brief existence with natural pincushions of quite colossal blubber. That suits your book, eh? Flesh hot pots of Egypt to hanker after. Wallow in it. Like a podium. His throat twitches, slap bang. There he goes again. Bloom, the sty I dislike. Virag, arches his eyebrows, contact with a gold ring, they say. Argumentum ad feminam as we said in old Rome and ancient Greece in the consulship of Diplodocus and Ichthyosaurus. For the rest Eve's sovereign remedy. Not for sale. Hire only. Huguenot. He twitches, it is a funny sound. He coughs encouragingly, but possibly it is only a wart. I presume you shall have remembered what I will have taught you on that head? Wheaten meal with honey and nutmeg. Bloom, reflecting, wheaten meal with lycopodium and syllabax. This searching ordeal. It has been an unusually fatiguing day, a chapter of accidents. Wait. I mean, warts blood spreads warts, you said. Virag, severely, his nose hard humped, his side eye winking, stop twirling your thumbs and have a good old thunk. See, you have forgotten. Exercise your mnemotechnic. La causa e santa. Terra. Terra. Aside, he will surely remember. Bloom. Rosemary also did I understand you to say or willpower over parasitic tissues. Then nay no I have an inkling. The touch of a dead hand cures. Nemo? Virag, excitedly, I say so. I say so. E'en so. Technic. He taps his parchment roll energetically, this book tells you how to act with all descriptive particulars. Consult index for agitated fear of aconite, melancholy of muriatic, priapic pulsatilla. Virag is going to talk about amputation our old friend caustic. They must be starved. Snip off with horsehair under the den neck. But, to change the venue to the bulgar and the basque, have you made up your mind whether you like or dislike women and male habiliments? With a dry snigger, you intended to devote an entire year to the study of the religious problem and the summer months of 1886 to square the circle and win that million. Pomegranate. From the sublime to the ridiculous is but a step. Pajamas, let us say? Or stocking gusseted knickers, closed? Or, put we the case, those complicated combinations, kami knickers? He crows derisively, kikiriki. 
Bloom surveys uncertainly the three whores then gazes at the veiled mauve light, hearing the ever-flying moth, Bloom, I wanted then to have now concluded. Nightdress was never. Hence this. But tomorrow is a new day will be. Past was is today. What now is will then morrow as now was be past yester. Virag, prompts in a pig's whisper, insects of the day spend their brief existence in reiterated coition, lured by the smell of the inferiorly pulchritudinous female possessing extentified pudendal nerve in dorsal region. Pretty pole. His yellow parrot beak gabbles nasally, they had a proverb in the Carpathians in or about the year 5550 of our era. One tablespoonful of honey will attract friend Bruin more than half a dozen barrels of first choice malt vinegar. Bears buzz bothers bees. But of this apart. At another time we may resume. We were very pleased, we others. He coughs and, bending his brow, rubs his nose thoughtfully with a scooping hand, you shall find that these night insects follow the light. An illusion for remember their complex unadjustable eye. For all these naughty points see the seventeenth book of my fundamentals of sexology or the love passion which Dr. L. B. says is the book sensation of the year. Some, to example, there are again whose movements are automatic. Perceive. That is his appropriate son. Nightbird nights in night town. Chase me, Charlie. He blows into Bloom's ear, buzz. Bloom, B or Bluebottle two other day budding shadow on wall days self then me wandered days down shirt good job I. Virag, his face impassive, laughs in a rich feminine key, splendid. Spanish fly in his fly or mustard plaster on his dibble. He gobbles gluttonously with turkey waddles, bubbly jock. Bubbly jock. Where are we? Open sesame. Cometh forth. He unrolls his parchment rapidly and reads, his glowworm's nose running backwards over the letters which he claws, stay, good friend. I bring thee thy answer. Red bank oysters will shortly be upon us. I'm the besto cook. Those succulent bivalves may help us and the truffles of Perigord, tubers dislodged through Mr. Omnivorous Porker, were unsurpassed in cases of nervous debility or viragitis. Though they stink yet they sting. He wags his head with cackling raillery, jocular. With my eyeglass and my ocular. He sneezes, amen. Bloom, absently, ocularly woman's bivalve case is worse. Always open sesame. The cloven sex. Why they fear vermin, creeping things. Yet Eve and the serpent contradicts. Not a historical fact. Obvious analogy to my idea. Serpents too are gluttons for woman's milk. Wind their way through miles of omnivorous forest to suck succulent her breast dry. Like those bubbly jocular Roman matrons one reads of an elephantuliasis. Virag, his mouth projected in hard wrinkles, eyes stonily forlornly closed, psalms in outlandish monotone, that the cows with their those distended udders that they have been to the known. Bloom, I'm going to scream. I beg your pardon. Ah? So. He repeats, spontaneously to seek out the Saurian's lair in order to entrust their teats to his avid suction. At milk safus. Profoundly, instinct rules the world. In life. In death. Virag, head askew, arches his back and hunched wing shoulders, peers at the moth out of blear bulged eyes, points a horning claw and cries, Who's moth moth? Who's dear Gerald? Dear Gare, that you? Oh dear, he is Gerald. Oh, I much fear he shall be most badly burned. Will some pleash Persian not now impediment so catastrophic's mid agitation of first class tablinumpkin? He mews, puss 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 puss. He sighs, draws back and stares sideways down with dropping under jaw, well, well. He doth rest anon. He snaps his jaws suddenly on the air, the moth, I'm a tiny tiny thing ever flying in the spring round and round a ringering. Long ago I was a king now the first do this kind of thing on the wing, on the wing. Bing. He rushes against the mauve shade, flapping noisily, pretty 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 petticoats. From left upper entrance with two gliding steps Henry Flower comes forward to left front center. He wears a dark mantle and drooping plume sombrero. He carries a silver stringed inlaid dulcimer and a long-stemmed bamboo Jacob's pipe, its clay bowl fashioned as a female head. He wears dark velvet hose and silver buckled pumps. He has the romantic savior's face with flowing locks, thin beard and mustache. His spindle legs and sparrow feet are those of the tenor Mario, Prince of Candia. He settles down his goffered ruffs and moistens his lips with a passage of his amorous tongue, Henry, in a low dulcet voice, touching the strings of his guitar, there is a flower that bloometh. Virig truculent, his jowl set, stares at the lamp. Grave bloom regards Zoe's neck. Henry Gallant turns with pendant dewlap to the piano, Stephen, to himself, play with your eyes shut. Imitate Pa. 
filling my belly with husks of swine. Too much of this. I will arise and go to my. Expect this is the. Steve, thou art in a parlous way. Must visit old DC or telegraph. Our interview of this morning has left on me a deep impression. Though our ages. We'll write fully tomorrow. I'm partially drunk, by the way. He touches the keys again, minor chord comes now. Yes. Not much however. All might know Artie Phony holds out a baton roll of music with vigorous mustache work, Artie Phony, C. Rifaletta. Le Ruvina Tuto. Flory, sing us something. Love's old sweet song. Stephen, no voice. I am a most finished artist. Lynch, did I show you the letter about the lute? Flory, smirking, the bird that can sing and won't sing. The Siamese twins, Philip drunk and Philip sober, two Oxford dons with lawnmowers, appear in the window embrasure. Both are masked with Matthew Arnold's face, Philip sober, take a fool's advice. All is not well. Work it out with the butt end of a pencil, like a good young idiot. Three pounds twelve you got, two notes, one sovereign, two crowns, if youth but new. Mooney's Enville, Mooney's Sur Mare, the Moira, Larchets, Hall Street Hospital, Berks. Eh? I am watching you. Philip drunk, impatiently, ah, bosh, man. Go to hell. I paid my way. If I could only find out about octaves. Reduplication of personality. Who was it told me his name? His lawnmower begins to purr, aha, yes. Zoe Mo Sasa Gapo. Have a notion I was here before. When was it not Atkins in his car to have somewhere? Mac somebody. Unmac I have it. He told me about, hold on, Swinburne, was it, no? Flory, and the song? Stephen, spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Flory, are you out of Maynooth? You're like someone I knew once. Stephen, out of it now. To himself, clever. Philip drunk and Philip sober, their lawnmowers purring with a rigadoon of grass homes, clever ever. Out of it out of it. By the by have you the book, the thing, the ash plant? Yes, there it, yes. Clever ever out tough it no. Keep in condition. Do like us. Zoe, there was a priest down here two nights ago to do his bit of business with his coat buttoned up. You needn't try to hide, I says to him. I know you've a Roman collar. Virig, perfectly logical from his standpoint. Fall of man. Harshly, his pupils waxing, to hell with the Pope. Nothing new under the sun. I am the Virig who disclosed the sex secrets of monks and maidens. Why I left the Church of Rome. Read the priest, the woman and the confessional. Penrose. Flipperty jippert. He wriggles, woman, undoing with sweet pudor her belt of rush rope, offers her all moist yoni to man's lingam. Short time after man presents woman with pieces of jungle meat. Woman shows joy and covers herself with feather skins. Man loves her yoni fiercely with big lingam, the stiff one. He cries, coactus valu. Then giddy woman will run about. Strong man grabs his woman's wrist. Woman squeals, bites, spucks. Man, now fierce angry, strikes woman's fat yadgana. He chases his tail, piff paff. Popo. He stops, sneezes, pchp. He worries his butt, prrrrrrht. Lynch, I hope you gave the good father a penance. Nine glorias for shooting a bishop. Zoe, spouts walrus smoke through her nostrils, he couldn't get a connection. Only, you know, sensation. A dry rush. Bloom, poor man. Zoe, lightly, only for what happened him. Bloom, how? Virig, a diabolic rictus of black luminosity contracting his visage, cranes his scraggy neck forward. He lifts a mooncalf nozzle and howls, for fluke to go him. He had a father, forty fathers. He never existed. Pig God. He had two left feet. He was Judas Iachia, a Libyan eunuch, the Pope's bastard. He leans out on tortured forepaws, elbows bent rigid, his eye agonizing in his flat skull neck and yelps over the mute world, a son of a whore. Apocalypse. Kitty, and Mary Shortle that was in the lock with the pox she got from Jimmy Pigeon in the blue caps had a child off him that couldn't swallow and was smothered with the convulsions in the mattress and we all subscribed for the funeral. Philip drunk, gravely, qui vous a mis dans cette fichue position, Philippe? Philip sober, gaily, c'était le sacré pigeon, Philippe. Kitty unpins her hat and sets it down calmly, patting her henna hair. And a prettier, a daintier head of winsome curls was never seen on a whore's shoulders. Lynch puts on her hat. She whips it off, 
Lynch, laughs, and to such delights as Mechnikov inoculated anthropoid apes. Flory, nods, locomotor a taxi. Zoe, gaily, oh, my dictionary. Lynch, three wise virgins. Virig, ague shaken, profuse yellow spawn foaming over his bony epileptic lips, she sold love filters, white wax, orange flower. Panther, the Roman centurion, polluted her with his genitories. He sticks out a flickering phosphorescent scorpion tongue, his hand on his fork, Messiah. He burst her tympanum. With gibbering baboon's cries he jerks his hips in the cynical spasm, hick. Heck. Hawk. Hawk. Hook. Coke. Kook. Ben Jumbo Dolar, rubicund, muscle-bound, heronostrilled, huge-bearded, cabbage-eared, shaggy-chested, shockmaned, fat-papped, stands forth, his loins and genitals tightened into a pair of black bathing bag slops, Ben Dolar, knackering castanet bones in his huge padded paws, yodels jovially in bass barrel tone, when love absorbs my ardent soul. The virgins nurse Callan and nurse quickly burst through the ringkeepers and the ropes and mob him with open arms, the virgins, gushingly, Big Ben. Ben my Cree. A voice, hold that fellow with the bad breeches. Ben Dolar, smites his thigh in abundant laughter, hold him now. Henry, caressing on his breast a severed female head, murmurs, thine heart, mine love. He plucks his lute strings, when first I saw. Virig, sloughing his skins, his multitudinous plumage molting, rats. He yawns, showing a coal-black throat, and closes his jaws by an upward push of his parchment troll, after having said which I took my departure. Farewell. Fare thee well. Drek. Henry Flower combs his mustache and beard rapidly with a pocket comb and gives a cow's lick to his hair. Steered by his rapier, he glides to the door, his wild harp slung behind him. Virag reaches the door in two ungainly stilt hops, his tail cocked, and deftly claps sideways on the wall a puce yellow flybill, butting it with his head, the flybill, K, 11. Post no bills. Strictly confidential. Dr. Henry Franks. Henry, all is lost now. Virag unscrews his head in a trice and holds it under his arm, Virag's head, quack. Exient severally, Stephen, over his shoulder to Zoe, you would have preferred the fighting parson who founded the Protestant error. But beware Antisthenes, the dog sage, and the last end of Arius Heresiarchus. The agony in the closet. Lynch, all one and the same god to her. Stephen, devoutly, and sovereign lord of all things. Flory, to Stephen, I'm sure you're a spoiled priest. Or a monk. Lynch, he is. A cardinal's son. Stephen, cardinal sin. Monks of the screw. His eminence Simon Stephen Cardinal Daedalus, primate of all Ireland, appears in the doorway, dressed in red soutane, sandals and socks. Seven dwarf simian acolytes, also in red, cardinal sins, uphold his train, peeping under it. He wears a battered silk hat sideways on his head. His thumbs are stuck in his armpits and his palms outspread. Round his neck hangs a rosary of corks ending on his breast in a corkscrew cross. Releasing his thumbs, he invokes grace from on high with large wave gestures and proclaims with bloated pomp, the cardinal, conservio lies captured he lies in the lowest dungeon with manacles and chains around his limbs weighing upwards of three tons. He looks at all for a moment, his right eye closed tight, his left cheek puffed out. Then, unable to repress his merriment, he rocks to and fro, arms akimbo, and sings with broad rollicking humor, oh, the poor little fellow Hiahias legs they were yellow he was plump, fat and heavy and brisk as a snake but some bloody savage to graze his white cabbage he murdered Nell Flaherty's duck-loving drake. A multitude of midges swarms white over his robe. He scratches himself with crossed arms at his ribs, grimacing, and exclaims, I'm suffering the agony of the damned. By the hokey fiddle, thanks be to Jesus those funny little chaps are not unanimous. If they were they'd walk me off the face of the bloody globe. His head aslant he blesses curtly with four and middle fingers, imparts the Easter kiss and double shuffles off comically, swaying his hat from side to side, shrinking quickly to the size of his trainbearers. The dwarf acolytes, giggling, peeping, nudging, ogling, Easter kissing, zigzag behind him. His voice is heard mellow from afar, merciful male, melodious, shall carry my heart to thee, shall carry my heart to thee, and the breath of the balmy night shall carry my heart to thee. The trick door handle turns, the door handle, they e. Zoe, the devil is in that door. A male form passes down the creaking staircase and is heard taking the waterproof and hat from the rack. Bloom starts forward involuntarily and, half closing the door as he passes, takes the chocolate from his pocket and offers it nervously to Zoe. Zoe, sniffs his hair briskly, hmm. 
Thank your mother for the rabbits. I'm very fond of what I like. Bloom, hearing a male voice in talk with the whores on the doorstep, pricks his ears, if it were he? After? Or because not? Or the double event? Zoe, tears open the silver foil, fingers was made before forks. She breaks off and nibbles a piece, gives a piece to Kitty Ricketts and then turns kittenishly to Lynch, no objection to French lozenges? He nods. She taunts him, have it now or wait till you get it? He opens his mouth, his head cocked. She whirls the prize in left circle. His head follows. She whirls it back in right circle. He eyes her, catch. She tosses a piece. With an adroit snap he catches it and bites it through with a crack, kitty, chewing, the engineer I was with at the bazaar does have lovely ones. Full of the best liqueurs. And the viceroy was there with his lady. The gas we had on the toffs hobby horses. I'm giddy still. Bloom, in Svengali's fur overcoat, with folded arms and Napoleonic forelock, frowns in ventriloquial exorcism with piercing eagle glance towards the door. Then rigid with left foot advanced he makes a swift pass with impelling fingers and gives the sign of pass master, drawing his right arm downwards from his left shoulder, go, 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 I conjure you, whoever you are. A male cough and tread are heard passing through the mist outside. Bloom's features relax. He places a hand in his waistcoat, posing calmly. Zoe offers him chocolate, Bloom, solemnly, thanks. Zoe, do as you're bid. Here. A firm heel-clacking tread is heard on the stairs, Bloom, takes the chocolate, aphrodisiac? Tansy and Penna Royal. But I bought it. Vanilla comms or? Nemo. Confused light confuses memory. Red influences lupus. Colors affect women's characters, any they have. This black makes me sad. Eat and be merry for tomorrow. He eats, influence taste too, mauve. But it is so long since I seems new. Afro. That priest. Must come. Better late than never. Try truffles at Andrews. The door opens. Bella Cohen, a massive whoremistress, enters. She is dressed in a three-quarter ivory gown, fringed round the hem with tasseled selvage, and cools herself flirting a black horn fan like Minnie Hauk and Carmen. On her left hand are wedding and keeper rings. Her eyes are deeply carboned. She has a sprouting mustache. Her olive face is heavy, slightly sweated and full-nosed with orange-tainted nostrils. She has large pendant barrel eardrops, Bella, my word. I'm all of a muck sweat. She glances round her at the couples. Then her eyes rest on Bloom with hard insistence. Her large fan winnows wind towards her heated face neck and embone point. Her falcon eyes glitter, the fan, flirting quickly, then slowly, married, I see. Bloom, yes. Partly, I have mislaid. The fan, half opening, then closing, and the missus is master. Petticoat government. Bloom, looks down with a sheepish grin, that is so. The fan, folding together, rests against her left eardrop, have you forgotten me? Bloom, Ness. Yo. The fan, folded akimbo against her waist, is me her was you dreamed before? Was then she him you us since new? Am all them and the same now we? Bella approaches, gently tapping with the fan, Bloom, wincing, powerful being. In my eyes read that slumber which women love. The fan, tapping, we have met. You are mine. It is fate. Bloom, cowed, exuberant female. Enormously I desiderate your domination. I am exhausted, abandoned, no more young. I stand, so to speak, with an unposted letter bearing the extra regulation fee before the too late box of the General Post Office of Human Life. The door and window open at a right angle cause a draft of 32 feet per second according to the law of falling bodies. I have felt this instant a twinge of sciatica in my left gluteal muscle. It runs in our family. Poor dear papa, a widower, was a regular barometer from it. He believed in animal heat. A skin of tabby lined his winter waistcoat. Near the end, remembering King David and the Sunamite, he shared his bed with Athos, faithful after death. A dog spittle as you probably. He winces, ah. Richie Goulding, bag-weighted, passes the door, mocking his catch. Best value in dub. Fit for a prince's. Liver and kidney. The fan, tapping, all things end. Be mine. Now. Bloom, undecided, all now? I should not have parted with my talisman. Rain, exposure at dewfall on the Xerox, a peccadillo at my time of life. Every phenomenon has a natural cause. The fan, points downward slowly, you may. Bloom, 
looks downwards and perceives her unfastened bootlace, we are observed. The fan, points downwards quickly, you must. Bloom, with desire, with reluctance, I can make a true black knot. Learned when I served my time and worked the mail order line for Kellett's. Experienced hand. Every knot says a lot. Let me. In courtesy. I knelt once before today. Ah. Bella raises her gown slightly and, steadying her pose, lifts to the edge of a chair a plump buskined hoof and a full pastern, silk socked. Bloom, stiff legged, aging, bends over her hoof and with gentle fingers draws out and in her laces. Bloom, murmurs lovingly, to be a shoe fitter in Manfields was my love's young dream, the darling joys of sweet button hooking, to lace up crisscross to knee length the dressy kid footwear satin lined, so incredibly impossibly small, of Clyde Road ladies. Even their wax model Raymond I visited daily to admire her cobweb hose and stick of rhubarb toe, as worn in Paris. The hoof, smell my hot goat hide. Feel my royal weight. Bloom, cross lacing, too tight? The hoof, if you bungle, handy Andy, I'll kick your football for you. Bloom, not to lace the wrong eyelet as I did the night of the bazaar dance. Bad luck. Hook in wrong tash of her. Person you mentioned. That night she met. Now. He knots the lace. Bella places her foot on the floor. Bloom raises his head. Her heavy face, her eyes strike him in midbrow. His eyes grow dull, darker and pouched, his nose thickens, Bloom, mumbles, awaiting your further orders we remain, gentlemen. Bello, with a hard basilisk stare, in a baritone voice, hound of dishonor. Bloom, infatuated, empress. Bello, his heavy cheek shops sagging, adorer of the adulterous rump. Bloom, plaintively, hugeness. Bello, dung devourer. Bloom, with sinuous semi-flexed, mag magnificence. Bello, down. He taps her on the shoulder with his fan, inclined feet forward. Slide left foot one pace back. You will fall. You are falling. On the hands down. Bloom, her eyes upturned in the sign of admiration, closing, yaps, truffles. With a piercing epileptic cry she sinks on all fours, grunting, snuffling, rooting at his feet, then lies, shamming dead, with eyes shut tight, trembling eyelids, bowed upon the ground in the attitude of most excellent master, bellow, with bobbed hair, purple gills, fat mustache rings round a shaven mouth, in mountaineer's putties, green silver button coat, sport skirt and alpine hat with moorcock's feather, his hand stuck deep in his breeches pockets, places his heel on her neck and grinds it in, footstool. Feel my entire weight. Bow, bond slave, before the throne of your despot's glorious heels so glistening in their proud erectness. Bloom, enthralled, bleats, I promise never to disobey. Bellow, laughs loudly, holy smoke. You little know what's in store for you. I'm the tartar to settle your little lot and break you in. I'll bet Kentucky cocktails all round I shame it out of you, old son. Cheek me, I dare you. If you do tremble in anticipation of heel discipline to be inflicted in gym costume. Bloom creeps under the sofa and peers out through the fringe, Zoe, widening her slip to screen her, she's not here. Bloom, closing her eyes, she's not here. Flory, hiding her with her gown, she didn't mean it, Mr. Bellow. She'll be good, sir. Kitty, don't be too hard on her, Mr. Bellow. Sure you won't, Momser. Bellow, coaxingly, come, ducky dear, I want a word with you, darling, just to administer correction. Just a little heart-to-heart -heart talk, sweetie. Bloom puts out her timid head, there's a good girly now. Bello grabs her hair violently and drags her forward, I only want to correct you for your own good on a soft safe spot. How's that tender behind? Oh, ever so gently, pet. Begin to get ready. Bloom, fainting, don't tear my. Bello, savagely, the nosering, the pliers, the bostinato, the hanging hook, the knout I'll make you kiss while the flutes play like the Nubian slave of old. You're in for it this time. I'll make you remember me for the balance of your natural life. His forehead vein swollen, his face congested, I shall sit on your ottoman saddleback every morning after my thumping good breakfast of Madison's fat ham rashers and a bottle of Guinness's porter. He belches, and suck my thumping good stock exchange cigar while I read the licensed Vittler's Gazette. Very possibly I shall have you slaughtered and skewered in my stables and enjoy a slice of you with crisp crackling from the baking tin basted and baked like sucking pig with rice and lemon or currant sauce. It will hurt you. He twists her arm. Bloom squeals, turning turtle, Bloom, don't be cruel, nurse. Don't. Bellow, twisting, another. Bloom, screams, oh, it's hell itself. 
every nerve in my body aches like mad. Bello, shouts, good, by the rumping jumping general. That's the best bit of news I heard these six weeks. Here, don't keep me waiting, damn you. He slaps her face, bloom, whimpers, you're after hitting me. I'll tell. Bello, hold him down, girls, till I squat on him. Zoe, yes. Walk on him. I will. Flory, I will. Don't be greedy. Kitty, no, me. Lend him to me. The brothel cook, Mrs. Kyo, wrinkled, grey-bearded, in a greasy bib, men's grey and green socks and brogues, flour-smeared, a rolling pin stuck with raw pastry in her bare red arm and hand, appears at the door, Mrs. Kyo, ferociously, can I help? They hold and pinion Bloom, bellow, squats with a grunt on Bloom's upturned face, puffing cigar smoke, nursing a fat leg, I see Keating Clay is elected vice chairman of the Richmond Asylum and by the by Guinness's preference shares are at 16 three quarters. Curse me for a fool that didn't buy that lot Craig and Gardner told me about. Just my infernal luck, curse it. And that goddamned outsider throwaway at 20 to 1. He quenches his cigar angrily on Bloom's ear, where's that goddamned cursed ashtray? Bloom, goaded, buttock smothered, oh. Oh. Monsters. Cruel one. Bellow, ask for that every ten minutes. Beg. Pray for it as you never prayed before. He thrusts out a figged fist and foul cigar, here, kiss that. Both. Kiss. He throws a leg astride and, pressing with horseman's knees, calls in a hard voice, gee up. A cock horse to Banbury Cross. I'll ride him for the eclipse stakes. He bends sideways and squeezes his mount's testicles roughly, shouting, ho. Off we pop. I'll nurse you in proper fashion. He horse rides cock horse, leaping in the, in the saddle, the lady goes a pace a pace and the coachman goes a trot a trot and the gentleman goes a gallop a gallop a gallop a gallop. Flory, pulls at Bello, let me on him now. You had enough. I asked before you. Zoe, pulling at Flory, me. Me. Are you not finished with him yet, succorous? Bloom, stifling, can't. Bello, well, I'm not. Wait. He holds in his breath, curse it. Here. This bung's about burst. He uncorks himself behind, then, contorting his features, farts loudly, take that. He recorks himself, yes, by jingo, sixteen three quarters. Bloom, a sweat breaking out over him, not man. He sniffs, woman. Bello, stands up, no more blow hot and cold. What you long for has come to pass. Henceforth you are unmanned and mine in earnest, a thing under the yoke. Now for your punishment frock. You will shed your male garments, you understand, Ruby Cohen? And don the shot silk luxuriously rustling over head and shoulders. And quickly too. Bloom, shrinks, silk, mistress said. Oh crinkly. Scrappy. Must I tip-touch it with my nails? Bellow, points to his whores, as they are now so will you be, wigged, singed, perfume sprayed, rice powdered, with smooth-shaven armpits. Tape measurements will be taken next your skin. You will be laced with cruel force into vice-like corsets of soft dove coutil with whalebone busk to the diamond-trimmed pelvis, the absolute outside edge, while your figure, plumper than when at large, will be restrained in net-tight frocks, pretty two-ounce petticoats and fringes and things stamped, of course, with my house flog, creations of lovely lingerie for Alice and nice scent for Alice. Alice will feel the pull pole. Martha and Mary will be a little chilly at first in such delicate thigh casing but the frilly flimsiness of lace round your bare knees will remind you. Bloom, a charming soubrette with dobby cheeks, mustard hair and large male hands and nose, leering mouth, I tried her things on only twice, a small prank, in Hall Street. When we were hard up I washed them to save the laundry bill. My own shirts I turned. It was the purest thrift. Bellow, jeers, little jobs that make mother pleased, eh? and showed off coquettishly in your domino at the mirror behind close drawn blinds your unskirted thighs and goats utters in various poses of surrender, eh? Ho! Ho! I have to laugh. That second-hand black opera top shift and short trunk-leg naughties all split up the stitches at her last rape that Mrs. Miriam Dondrade sold you from the Shelbourne Hotel, eh? Bloom, Miriam. Black. Demimondane. Bello, guffaws, Christ Almighty it's too tickling, this. You were a nice-looking Miriam when you clipped off your backgate hairs and lay swooning in the thing across the bed as Mrs. Dondrade about to be violated by Lt. Smythe Smythe, Mr. Philip Augustus Blockwell M. P., Sr. Lacey Darimo, the robust tenor, blue-eyed Bert, the lift boy, Henri Fleury of Gordon Bennett fame, 
Sheridan, the Quadroon Croesus, the Varsity Wet Bob 8 from Old Trinity, Ponto, her splendid Newfoundland and Bobs, Dowager Duchess of Manor Hamilton. He guffaws again, Christ, wouldn't it make a Siamese cat laugh? Bloom, her hands and features working, it was Gerald converted me to be a true corset lover when I was female impersonator in the high school play vice versa. It was dear Gerald. He got that kink, fascinated by sister's stays. Now dearest Gerald uses pinky grease paint and gilds his eyelids. Cult of the beautiful. Bellow, with wicked glee, beautiful. Give us a breather. When you took your seat with womanish care, lifting your billowy flounces, on the smooth-worn throne. Bloom, science. To compare the various joys we each enjoy. Earnestly, and really it's better the position. Because often I used to wet. Bellow, sternly, no insubordination. The sawdust is there in the corner for you. I gave you strict instructions, didn't I? Do it standing, sir. I'll teach you to behave like a jingle man. If I catch a trace on your swaddles. Aha! By the ass of the Dorans you'll find I'm a martinet. The sins of your past are rising against you. Many. Hundreds. The sins of the past, in a medley of voices, he went through a form of clandestine marriage with at least one woman in the shadow of the black church. Unspeakable messages he telephoned mentally to Miss Dunn at an address in Dolier Street while he presented himself indecently to the instrument in the call box. By word and deed he frankly encouraged a nocturnal strumpet to deposit fecal and other matter in an unsanitary outhouse attached to empty premises. In five public conveniences he wrote penciled messages offering his nuptial partner to all strong-membered males. And by the offensively smelling vitriol works did he not pass night after night by loving courting couples to see if and what and how much he could see? Did he not lie in bed, the gross bore, gloating over a nauseous fragment of Wellis toilet paper presented to him by a nasty harlot, stimulated by gingerbread and a postal order? Bello, whistles loudly, say. What was the most revolting piece of obscenity in all your career of crime? Go the whole hog. Puke it out. Be candid for once. Mute and human faces throng forward, leering, vanishing, gibbering, bulu-womb. Paldy cock, bootlaces a penny, Cassidy's hag, blind stripling, Larry Rhinoceros, the girl, the woman, the whore, the other, the, bloom, don't ask me. Our mutual faith. Pleasant Street. I only thought the half of the. I swear on my sacred oath. Bellow, peremptorily, answer. Repugnant wretch. I insist on knowing. Tell me something to amuse me, smut or a bloody good ghost story or a line of poetry, quick, quick, quick. Where? How? What time? With how many? I give you just three seconds. One. Two. THR. Bloom, docile, gurgles, I re rare repugnosed and re rare repugnant. Bellow, imperiously, oh, get out, you skunk. Hold your tongue. Speak when you're spoken to. Bloom, bows, master. Mistress. Mantimer. He lifts his arms. His bangle bracelets fall, bellow, satirically, by day you will souse and bat our smelling underclothes also when we ladies are unwell, and swab out our latrines with dress pinned up and a dishclout tied to your tail. Won't that be nice? He places a ruby ring on her finger, and there now. With this ring I the own. Say, thank you, mistress. Bloom, thank you, mistress. Bello, you will make the beds, get my tub ready, empty the pisspots in the different rooms, including old Mrs. Keo's the cooks, a sandy one. A and rinse the seven of them well, mind, or lap it up like champagne. Drink me piping hot. Hop. You will dance attendance or I'll lecture you on your misdeeds, Miss Ruby, and spank your bare bot right well, Miss, with the hairbrush. You'll be taught the error of your ways. At night your well-creamed braceleted hands will wear 43-button gloves new powdered with talc and having delicately scented fingertips. For such favors knights of old laid down their lives. He chuckles, my boys will be no end charmed to see you so ladylike the colonel, above all, when they come here the night before the wedding to fondle my new attraction in gilded heels. First I'll have a go at you myself. A man I know on the turf named Charles Alberta Marsh, I was in bed with him just now and another gentleman out of the Honoper and Petty Bag office, is on the lookout for a maid of all work at a short knock. Swell the bust. Smile. Droop shoulders. What offers? He points, for that lot. Trained by owner to fetch and carry, basket in mouth. He bears his arm and plunges it elbow deep in Bloom's vulva, there's fine depth for you. What, boys? That give you a harden? He shoves his arm in a bitter's face, here wet the deck and wipe it round. A bitter, 
A florin. Dylan's lackey rings his handbell, the lackey, barong. A voice, one and eightpence too much. Charles Alberta Marsh, must be virgin. Good breath. Clean. Bellow, gives a rap with his gavel, two bar. Rock bottom figure and cheap at the price. Fourteen hands high. Touch and examine shiss points. Handle ream. This downy skin, these soft muscles, this tender flesh. If I had only my gold piercer here. And quite easy to milk. Three new laid gallons a day. A pure stock getter, due to lay within the hour. His sire's milk record was a thousand gallons of whole milk in forty weeks. Whoa, my jewel. Beg up. Whoa. He brands his initial C on Bloom's croup, so. Warranted Cohen. What advance on two Bob, gentlemen? A dark visaged man, in disguised accent, Hundert Punsterlink. Voices, subdued, for the Caliph. Harun al Rashid. Bellow, gaily, right. Let them all come. The scanty, daringly short skirt, riding up at the knee to show a peep of white pantalette, is a potent weapon and transparent stockings, emerald gartered, with the long straight seam trailing up beyond the knee, appeal to the better instincts of the blase man about town. Learn the smooth mincing walk on four inch Louis Cannes heels, the Grecian bend with provoking croup, the thighs fluescent, knees modestly kissing. Bring all your powers of fascination to bear on them. Pander to their Gamorahan vices. Bloom. Bends his blushing face into his armpit and simpers with forefinger and mouth. Oh, I know what you're hinting at now. Bello, what else are you good for, an impotent thing like you? He stoops and, peering, pokes with his fan rudely under the fat suet folds of Bloom's haunches. Up. Up. Manx cat. What have we here? Where's your curly teapot gone to or who docked it on you, cockily? Sing, birdie, sing. It's as limp as a boy of sixes doing his pulley behind a cart. Buy a bucket or sell your pump. Loudly, can you do a man's job? Bloom, Eccles Street. Bellow, sarcastically, I wouldn't hurt your feelings for the world but there's a man of brawn in possession there. The tables are turned, my gay young fellow. He is something like a full-grown outdoor man. Well for you, you muff, if you had that weapon with knobs and lumps and warts all over it. He shot his bolt, I can tell you. Foot to foot, knee to knee, belly to belly, bubs to breast. He's no eunuch. A shock of red hair he is sticking out of him behind like a furze bush. Wait for nine months, my lad. Holy ginger, it's kicking and coughing up and down in her guts already. That makes you wild, don't it? Touches the spot? He spits in contempt, spittoon. Bloom, I was indecently treated, I. Inform the police. Hundred pounds. Unmentionable. I. Bellow, what if you could, lame duck. A downpour we want not your drizzle. Bloom, to drive me mad. Maul. I forgot. Forgive. Maul. We. Still. Bellow, ruthlessly, no, Leopold Bloom, all is changed by woman's will since you slept horizontal in Sleepy Hollow your night of twenty years. Return and see. Old Sleepy Hollow calls over the wold, Sleepy Hollow, Rip Van Wink. Rip Van Winkle. Bloom, in tattered moccasins with a rusty fouling piece, Tiptoeing, finger tipping, his haggard bony bearded face peering through the diamond panes, cries out, I see her. It's she. The first night at Matt Dillon's. But that dress, the green. And her hair is dyed gold and he. Bello, laughs mockingly, that's your daughter, you owl, with a Mullingar student. Millie Bloom, fair haired, green vested, slim zandled, her blue scarf in the sea wind simply swirling, breaks from the arms of her lover and calls, her young eyes wander wide. Millie, my. It's Paply. But, oh Paply, how old you've grown. Bello, changed, eh? Our whatnot, our writing table where we never wrote, and Hegarty's armchair, our classic reprints of old masters. A man and his men friends are living there in clover. The cuckoos rest. Why not? How many women had you, eh, following them up dark streets, flatfoot, exciting them by your smothered grunts, what, you male prostitute? Blameless dames with parcels of groceries. Turnabout. Sauce for the goose, my gander o bloom, they. I. Bellow, cuttingly, their heel marks will stamp the brusselette carpet you bought at Wren's auction. In their horseplay with Maul the Romp to find the buck flea in her breeches they will deface the little statue you carried home in the rain for art for art's sake. They will violate the secrets of your bottom drawer. Pages will be torn from your handbook of astronomy to make them pipes pills and they will spit in your ten-shilling brass fender from Hampton Leedham's. 
Bloom, 10 and 6. The act of low scoundrels. Let me go. I will return. I will prove. A voice, swear. Bloom clenches his fists and crawls forward, a bowie knife between his teeth, bellow, as a paying guest or a kept man? Too late. You have made your second best bed and others must lie in it. Your epitaph is written. You are down and out and don't you forget it, old bean. Bloom, justice. All Ireland versus one. Has nobody? He bites his thumb, bellow, die and be damned to you if you have any sense of decency or grace about you. I can give you a rare old wine that'll send you skipping to hell and back. Sign a will and leave us any coin you have. If you have none see you damn well get it, steal it, rob it. We'll bury you in our shrubbery jakes where you'll be dead and dirty with old Cuck Cohen, my stepnephew I married, the bloody old gouty procurator and sodomite with a crick in his neck, and my other ten or eleven husbands, whatever the buggers' names were, suffocated in the one cesspool. He explodes in a loud phlegmy laugh, we'll manure you, Mr. Flower. He pipes scoffingly, bye-bye, Paldi. Bye-bye, Paply. Bloom, clasps his head, my willpower. Memory. I have sinned. I have suff. He weeps tearlessly, bellow, sneers, crybaby. Crocodile tears. Bloom, broken, closely veiled for the sacrifice, sobs, his face to the earth. The passing bell is heard. Dark shawled figures of the circumcised, in sackcloth and ashes, stand by the wailing wall. M. Shulamowitz, Joseph Goldwater, Moses Herzog, Harris Rosenberg, M. Wazell, J. Citron, Minnie Watchman, P. Mastiansky, the Reverend Leopold Abramovitz, Chazen. With swaying arms they wail in Numa over the recreant bloom, the circumcised, in dark guttural chant as they cast dead sea fruit upon him, no flowers, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Ehad. Voices, sighing, so he's gone. Ah yes. Yes, indeed. Bloom? Never heard of him. No? Queer kind of chap. There's the widow. That's so? Ah, yes. From the suddy pyre the flame of gum campfire ascends. The pall of incense smoke screens and disperses. Out of her oak frame a nymph with hair unbound, lightly clad in tea-brown art colors, descends from her grotto and passing under interlacing yews stands over bloom, the yews, their leaves whispering, Sister. Our sister. SSH. The nymph, softly, mortal. Kindly, nay, dost not weepest. Bloom, crawls jellily forward under the boughs, streaked by sunlight, with dignity, this position. I felt it was expected of me. Force of habit. The nymph, mortal. You found me in evil company, high kickers, coster picnic makers, pugilists, popular generals, immoral panto boys in flesh tights and the nifty shimmy dancers, La Aurora and Carini, musical act, the hit of the century. I was hidden in cheap pink paper that smelt of rock oil. I was surrounded by the stale smut of clubmen, stories to disturb callow youth, ads for transparencies, trued up dice and bus pads, proprietary articles and why wear a truss with testimonial from ruptured gentlemen. Useful hints to the married. Bloom, lifts a turtle head towards her lap, we have met before. On another star. The nymph, sadly, rubber goods. Never rip brand is supplied to the aristocracy. Corsets for men. I cure fits or money refunded. Unsolicited testimonials for Professor Waldman's wonderful chest exuber. My bust developed four inches in three weeks, reports Mrs. Gus Rublin with photo. Bloom, you mean photo bits? The nymph, I do. You bore me away, framed me in oak and tinsel, set me above your marriage couch. Unseen, one summer eve, you kissed me in four places. And with loving pencil you shaded my eyes, my bosom and my shame. Bloom, humbly kisses her long hair, your classic curves, beautiful immortal, I was glad to look on you, to praise you, a thing of beauty, almost to pray. The nymph, during dark nights I heard your praise. Bloom, quickly, yes, yes. You mean that I. Sleep reveals the worst side of everyone, children perhaps accepted. I know I fell out of bed or rather was pushed. Steel wine is said to cure snoring. For the rest there is that English invention, pamphlet of which I received some days ago, incorrectly addressed. It claims to afford a noiseless, inoffensive vent. He sighs, twas ever thus. Frailty, thy name is marriage. The nymph, her fingers in her ears, and words. They are not in my dictionary. Bloom, you understood them? The use, ssh. The nymph, covers her face with her hands, what have I not seen in that chamber? What must my eyes look down on? Bloom, apologetically, I know. 
soiled personal linen, wrong side up with care. The quoits are loose. From Gibraltar by long sea long ago. The nymph, bends her head, worse, worse. Bloom, reflects precautiously, that antiquated commode. It wasn't her weight. She scaled just eleven stone nine. She put on nine pounds after weaning. It was a crack and one of glue. Eh? And that absurd orangey keyed utensil which has only one handle. The sound of a waterfall is heard in bright cascade, the waterfall, polapuka 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 polapuka. The ewes, mingling their boughs, listen. Whisper. She is right, our sister. We grew by polapuka waterfall. We gave shade on languorous summer days. John Wise Nolan, in the background, in Irish National Forester's uniform, doffs his plumed hat, prosper. Give shade on languorous days, trees of Ireland. The ewes, murmuring, who came to Polapuka with a high school excursion. Who left his nut-questing classmates to seek our shade. Bloom, scared, high school of Pula? Nemo? Not in full possession of faculties. Concussion. Run over by tram. The echo, sham. Bloom, pigeon-breasted, bottle-shouldered, padded, in nondescript juvenile grey and black striped suit, too small for him, white tennis shoes, bordered stockings with turnover tops and a red school cap with badge. I was in my teens, a growing boy. A little then sufficed, a jolting car, the mingling odors of the ladies' cloakroom and lavatory, the throng pen tight on the old royal stairs, for they love crushes, instinct of the herd, and the dark sex-smelling theater on bridal's vice, even a price list of their hosiery. And then the heat. There were sunspots that summer. End of school. And tips I cake. Halcyon days. Halcyon days, high school boys in blue and white football jerseys and shorts, Master Donald Turnbull, Master Abraham Chatterton, Master Owen Goldberg, Master Jack Meredith, Master Percy Apjohn, stand in a clearing of the trees and shout to Master Leopold Bloom, the halcyon days, mackerel. Live us again. Hooray. They cheer, Bloom, hobbledehoy, warm-gloved, mama mufflered, starred with spent snowballs, struggles to rise, again. I feel sixteen. What a lark. Let's ring all the bells in Montague Street. He cheers feebly, hooray for the high school. The echo, fool. The ewes, rustling, she is right, our sister. Whisper. Whispered kisses are heard in all the wood. Faces of homodryads peep out from the bowls and among the leaves and break, blossoming into bloom, who profaned our silent shade. The nymph, coyly, through parting fingers, there? In the open air? The ewes, sweeping downward, sister, yes. And on our virgin sward. The waterfall, polapuka polapuka fuka 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 fuka. The nymph, with wide fingers, oh, infamy. Bloom, I was precocious. Youth. The fauna. I sacrifice to the god of the forest. The flowers that bloom in the spring. It was pairing time. Capillary attraction is a natural phenomenon. Lottie Clark, flaxen haired, I saw at her night toilette through a closed curtains with poor papa's opera eyeglasses, the one and ate grass wildly. She rolled downhill at Rialto Bridge to tempt me with her flow of animal spirits. She climbed their crooked tree and I. A saint couldn't resist it. The demon possessed me. Besides, who saw? Staggering Bob, a white-polled calf, thrusts a ruminating head with humid nostrils through the foliage, staggering Bob, large teardrops rolling from his prominent eyes, snivels, me. Me see. Bloom, simply satisfying a neat eye. With pathos, no girl would when I went girling too ugly. They wouldn't play. High on Ben Hoth through rhododendrons and nanny goat passes, plume puttered, buddy tailed, dropping currants, the nanny goat, bleats, meg egagag. Nan nan nanny. Bloom, hatless, flushed, covered with burrs of thistledown and gorse pine, regularly engaged. Circumstances alter cases. He gazes intently downwards on the water, 32 head over heels per second. Press nightmare. Giddy Elijah. Fall from cliff. Sad end of government printer's clerk. Through silver silent summer air the dummy of bloom, rolled in a mummy, rolls rotatingly from the lion's head cliff into the purple waiting waters, the dummy mummy, bull 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 Far out in the bay between Bailey and Kish lights the Aaron's king sails, sending a broadening plume of coal smoke from her funnel towards the land, Councillor Nanetti, alone on deck, in dark alpaca, yellow kite faced, his hand in his waistcoat opening, declaims, when my country takes her place among the nations of the earth, then, and not till then, let my epitaph be written. I have. Bloom. Done. 
PRFF. The nymph, loftily, we immortals, as you saw today, have not such a place and no hair there either. We are stone cold and pure. We eat electric light. She arches her body in lascivious crispation, placing her forefinger in her mouth, spoke to me. Heard from behind. How then could you? Bloom, pawing the heather abjectly, oh, I have been a perfect pig. Enemas too I have administered. One third of a pint of quassia to which add a tablespoonful of rock salt. Up the fundament. With Hamilton Long's syringe, the lady's friend. The nymph, in my presence. The powder puff. She blushes and makes a knee, and the rest. Bloom, dejected, yes. Pekavi. I have paid homage on that living altar where the back changes name. With sudden fervor, for why should the dainty scented jeweled hand, the hand that rules? Figures wind serpenting in slow woodland pattern around the tree stems, cooeying, the voice of Kitty, in the thicket, show us one of them cushions. The voice of Flory, here. A grouse wings clumsily through the underwood, the voice of Lynch, in the thicket, phew. Piping hot. The voice of Zoe, from the thicket, came from a hot place. The voice of Virig, a birdchiff, blue streaked and feathered in war panoply with his assegai, striding through a crackling cane break over beech mast and acorns, hot. Hot. We're sitting bull. Bloom, it overpowers me. The warm impress of her warm form. Even to sit where a woman has sat, especially with devaricated thighs, as though to grant the last favors, most especially with previously well uplifted white sateen coat pants. So womanly, full. It fills me full. The waterfall, filafala polapuka polapuka polapuka. The use, ssh. Sister, speak. The nymph, eyeless, in nun's white habit, quaff and huge winged wimple, softly, with remote eyes, tranquila convent. Sister Agatha. Mount Carmel. The apparitions of knock and lured. No more desire. She reclines her head, sighing, only the ethereal. Where dreamy creamy gull waves or the water's dull. Bloom half rises. His back trouser button snaps, the button, bip. Two sluts of the coombe dance rainily by, shawled, yelling flatly, the sluts, oh, Leopold lost the pin of his drawers he didn't know what to do, to keep it up, to keep it up. Bloom, coldly, you have broken the spell. The last straw. If there were only ethereal where would you all be, postulants and novices? Shy but willing like an ass pissing. The ewes, their silver foil of leaves precipitating, their skinny arms aging and swaying, deciduously. The nymph, her features hardening, gropes in the folds of her habit, sacrilege. To attempt my virtue. A large moist stain appears on her robe, sully my innocence. You are not fit to touch the garment of a pure woman. She clutches again in her robe, wait. Satan, you'll sing no more love songs. Amen. 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 She draws a poniard and, clad in the sheath mail of an elected knight of nine, strikes at his loins, neck him. Bloom, starts up, seizes her hand, hoy. Nebricata. Cat of nine lives. Fair play, madam. No pruning knife. The fox and the grapes, is it? What do you lack with your barbed wire? Crucifix not thick enough? He clutches her veil, a holy abbot you want or brophy, the lame gardener, or the spoutless statue of the water carrier, or good mother Alphonsus, eh Renard? The nymph, with a cry flees from him unveiled, her plaster cast cracking, a cloud of stench escaping from the cracks, poly. Bloom, calls after her, as if you didn't get it on the double yourselves. No jerks and multiple mucosities all over you. I tried it. Your strength our weakness. What's our stud fee? What will you pay on the nail? You femen dancers on the Riviera, I read. The fleeing nymph raises a keen, eh? I have sixteen years of black slave labor behind me. And would a jury give me five shillings alimony tomorrow, eh? Fool someone else, not me. He sniffs, rut. Onions. Stale. Sulfur. Greece. The figure of Bella Cohen stands before him, Bella, you'll know me the next time. Bloom, composed, regards her, passe. Mutton dressed as lamb. Long in the tooth and superfluous hair. A raw onion the last thing at night would benefit your complexion. And take some double chin drill. Your eyes are as vapid as the glass eyes of your stuffed fox. They have the dimensions of your other features, that's all. I'm not a triple screw propeller. Bella, contemptuously, you're not game, in fact. Her so-cunt barks, fricked. Bloom, contemptuously, 
Clean your nailless middle finger first, your bully's cold spunk is dripping from your coxcomb. Take a handful of hay and wipe yourself. Bella, I know you, canvasser. Dead cod. Bloom, I saw him, kipkeeper. Pox and gleet vendor. Bella, turns to the piano, which of you is playing the dead march from Saul? Zoe, me. Mind your cornflowers. She darts to the piano and bangs chords on it with crossed arms, the cats ramble through the slag. She glances back, eh? Who's making love to my sweeties? She darts back to the table, what's yours is mine and what's mine is my own. Kitty, disconcerted, coats her teeth with the silver paper. Bloom approaches Zoe, Bloom, gently, give me back that potato, will you? Zoe, forfeits, a fine thing and a superfine thing. Bloom, with feeling, it is nothing, but still, a relic of poor mama. Zoe, give a thing and take it back God'll ask you where is that you'll say you don't know God'll send you down below. Bloom, there is a memory attached to it. I should like to have it. Stephen, to have or not to have that is the question. Zoe, here. She hauls up a reef of her slip, revealing her bare thigh, and unrolls the potato from the top of her stocking, those that hides knows where to find. Bella, frowns, here. This isn't a musical peep show. And don't you smash that piano. Who's paying here? She goes to the pianola. Stephen fumbles in his pocket and, taking out a banknote by its corner, hands it to her, Stephen, with exaggerated politeness, this silken purse I made out of the sow's ear of the public. Madam, excuse me. If you allow me. He indicates vaguely Lynch and Bloom, we are all in the same sweepstake, Kinch and Lynch. Don se bordel u tenens nostre eta. Lynch, calls from the hearth, Daedalus. Give her your blessing for me. Stephen, hands Bella a coin, gold. She has it. Bella, looks at the money, then at Stephen, then at Zoe, Flory, and Kitty, do you want three girls? It's ten shillings here. Stephen, delightedly, a hundred thousand apologies. He fumbles again and takes out and hands her two crowns, permit, brevi manu, my sight is somewhat troubled. Bella goes to the table to count the money while Stephen talks to himself in monosyllables. Zoe bends over the table. Kitty leans over Zoe's neck. Lynch gets up, writes his cap and, clasping Kitty's waist, adds his head to the group, Flory, strives heavily to rise, ow! My foot's asleep. She limps over to the table. Bloom approaches, Bella, Zoe, Kitty, Lynch, Bloom, chattering and squabbling, the gentleman. Ten shillings. Paying for the three. Allow me a moment. This gentleman pays separate. Who's touching it? Ow! Mind who you're pinching. Are you staying the night or a short time? Who did? You're a liar, excuse me. The gentleman paid down like a gentleman. Drink. It's long after eleven. Stephen, at the pianola, making a gesture of abhorrence, no bottles. What, eleven? A riddle. Zoe, lifting up her petty gown and folding a half sovereign into the top of her stocking, hard earned on the flat of my back. Lynch, lifting Kitty from the table, come. Kitty, wait. She clutches the two crowns. Flory, and me? Lynch, hoopla. He lifts her, carries her and bumps her down on the sofa, Stephen, the fox crew, the cocks flew, the bells in heaven were striking eleven. Tis time for her poor soul to get out of heaven. Bloom, quietly lays a half-sovereign on the table between Bella and Flory, so. Allow me. He takes up the pound note, three times ten. We're square. Bella, admiringly, you're such a slyboots, old cocky. I could kiss you. Zoe, points, him? Deep as a drawwell. Lynch bends Kitty back over the sofa and kisses her. Bloom goes with the pound note to Stephen, Bloom, this is yours. Stephen, how is that? Le distray or absent-minded beggar. He fumbles again in his pocket and draws out a handful of coins. An object falls, that fell. Bloom, stooping, picks up and hands a box of matches, this. Stephen, Lucifer. Thanks. Bloom, quietly, you had better hand over that cash to me to take care of. Why pay more? Stephen, hands him all his coins, be just before you are generous. Bloom, I will but is it wise? He counts, one, seven, eleven, and five. Six. Eleven. I don't answer for what you may have lost. Stephen, why striking eleven? Proparoxitin. Moment before the next lesson says. Thirsty fox. He laughs loudly, burying his grandmother. Probably he killed her. Bloom, 
That is one pound six and eleven. One pound seven, say. Stephen, doesn't matter a rambling damn. Bloom, no, but. Stephen, comes to the table, cigarette, please. Lynch tosses a cigarette from the sofa to the table, and so Georgina Johnson is dead and married. A cigarette appears on the table. Stephen looks at it, wonder. Parlor magic. Married. Hmm. He strikes a match and proceeds to light the cigarette with enigmatic melancholy. Lynch, watching him, you would have a better chance of lighting it if you held the match nearer. Stephen, brings the match near his eye, Link's eye. Must get glasses. Broke them yesterday. Sixteen years ago. Distance. The eye sees all flat. He draws the match away. It goes out, brain thinks. Near, far. Ineluctable modality of the visible. He frowns mysteriously, hmm. Sphinx. The beast that has two backs at midnight. Married. Zoe, it was a commercial traveler married her and took her away with him. Flory, nods, Mr. Lamb from London. Stephen, Lamb of London, who takest away the sins of our world. Lynch, embracing Kitty on the sofa, chants deeply, Donya Nobis Pachem. The cigarette slips from Stephen's fingers. Bloom picks it up and throws it in the grate, Bloom, don't smoke. You ought to eat. Cursed dog I met. To Zoe, you have nothing? Zoe, is he hungry? Stephen, extends his hand to her smiling and chants to the air of the blood oath in the dusk of the gods, hang and hunger, frag and frau, mocked in sala kaput. Zoe, tragically, Hamlet, I am thy father's gimlet. She takes his hand, blue eyes beauty I'll read your hand. She points to his forehead, no wit, no wrinkles. She counts, two, three, Mars, that's courage. Stephen shakes his head, no kid. Lynch, sheet lightning courage. The youth who could not shiver and shake. To Zoe, who taught you palmistry. Zoe, turns, ask my bollocks that I haven't got. To Stephen, I see it in your face. The eye, like that. She frowns with lowered head, Lynch, laughing, slaps Kitty behind twice, like that. Pandybat. Twice loudly a pandybat cracks, the coffin of the pianola flies open, the bald little round jack-in-the-box head of Father Dolan springs up, Father Dolan, any boy want flogging? Broke his glasses? Lazy idle little schemer. See it in your eye. Mild, benign, rectorial, reproving, the head of Don John Conmey rises from the pianola coffin, Don John Conmey, now, Father Dolan. Now. I'm sure that Stephen is a very good little boy. Zoe, examining Stephen's palm, woman's hand. Stephen, murmurs, continue. Lie. Hold me. Caress. I never could read his handwriting except his criminal thumbprint on the haddock. Zoe, what day were you born? Stephen, Thursday. Today. Zoe, Thursday's child has far to go. She traces lines on his hand, line of fate. Influential friends. Flory, pointing, imagination. Zoe, mount of the moon. You'll meet with A. She peers at his hands abruptly, I won't tell you what's not good for you. Or do you want to know? Bloom, detaches her fingers and offers his palm, more harm than good. Here. Read mine. Bella, show. She turns up Bloom's hand, I thought so. Knobby knuckles for the women. Zoe, peering at Bloom's palm, gridiron. Travels beyond the sea and marry money. Bloom, wrong. Zoe, quickly, oh, I see. Short little finger. Henpecked husband. That wrong? Black Liz, a huge rooster hatching in a chalk circle, rises, stretches her wings and clucks, Black Liz, Gara. Kluke. 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 She sidles from her new laid egg and waddles off, Bloom, points to his hand, that will there is an accident. Fell and cut it twenty-two years ago. I was sixteen. Zoe, I see, says the blind man. Tell us news. Stephen, see? Moves to one great goal. I am twenty-two. Sixteen years ago he was twenty-two too. Sixteen years ago I twenty-two tumbled. Twenty-two years ago he sixteen fell off his hobby horse. He winces, hurt my hand somewhere. Must see a dentist. Money? Zoe whispers to Flory. They giggle. Bloom releases his hand and writes idly on the table in backhand, penciling slow curves, Flory, what? A hackney car, number 324, with a gallant buttock mare, driven by James Barton, Harmony Avenue, Donny Brook, trots past. Blazes Boylan and Lenahan sprawl swaying on the side seats. 
The Orman boots crouches behind on the axle. Sadly over the cross-blind Lydia Deuce and Mina Kennedy gaze, the boots, jogging, mocks them with thumb and wriggling worm fingers, ha ha have you the horn? Bronze by gold they whisper, Zoe, to Flory, whisper. They whisper again, over the well of the car blazes boil and leans, his boater straw set sideways, a red flower in his mouth. Linehan in yachtsman's cap and white shoes officiously detaches a long hair from Blazes Boylan's coat shoulder, Linehan, ho! What do I hear behold? Were you brushing the cobwebs off a few keems? Boylan, sated, smiles, plucking a turkey. Linehan, a good night's work. Boylan, holding up four thick bluntungulated fingers, winks, Blazes Kate. Up to sample or your money back. He holds out a forefinger, smell that. Linehan, smells gleefully, Ah. Lobster and mayonnaise. Ah. Zoe and Flory, laugh together, ha 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 ha. Boylan, jumps surely from the car and calls loudly for all to hear, hello, Bloom. Mrs. Bloom dressed yet? Bloom, in flunky's prune plush coat and knee breeches, buff stockings and powdered wig, I'm afraid not, sir. The last articles. Boylan, tosses him sixpence, here, to buy yourself a gin and splash. He hangs his hat smartly on a peg of Bloom's antlered head, show me in. I have a little private business with your wife, you understand? Bloom, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Madam Tweedy is in her bath, sir. Marion, he ought to feel himself highly honored. She plops splashing out of the water, Raoul darling, come and dry me. I'm in my pelt. Only my new hat and a carriage sponge. Boylan, a merry twinkle in his eye, topping. Bella, what? What is it? Zoe whispers to her, Marion, let him look, the pish oak. Pimp. And scourge himself. I'll write to a powerful prostitute or Bartholomona, the bearded woman, to raise wheels out on him an inch thick and make him bring me back a signed and stamp receipt. Boylan, clasps himself, here, I can't hold this little lot much longer. He strides off on stiff cavalry legs, Bella, laughing, ho 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 ho. Boylan, to Bloom, over his shoulder, you can apply your eye to the keyhole and play with yourself while I just go through her a few times. Bloom, thank you, sir. I will, sir. May I bring two men chums to witness the deed and take a snapshot? He holds out an ointment jar, Vaseline, sir? Orange flower? Lukewarm water? Kitty, from the sofa, tell us, Flory. Tell us. What? Flory whispers to her. Whispering love words murmur, lip-lapping loudly, Poppy's McPlopslop. Mina Kennedy, her eyes upturned, oh, it must be like the scent of geraniums and lovely peaches. Oh, he simply idolizes every bit of her. Stuck together. Covered with kisses. Lydia Deuce, her mouth opening, yum yum. Oh, he's carrying her round the room doing it. Ride a cock horse. You could hear them in Paris and New York. Like mouthfuls of strawberries and cream. Kitty, laughing, he he he. Boylan's voice, sweetly, hoarsely, in the pit of his stomach, ah. God blaze a crook brew carch crashed. Marion's voice, hoarsely, sweetly, rising to her throat, oh. We swashed kiss an apuist napuak? Bloom, his eyes wildly dilated, clasps himself, show. Hide. Show. Plow her. More. Shoot. Bella, Zoe, Flory, Kitty, ho ho. Ha ha. He he. Lynch, points, the mirror up to nature. He laughs, hoo 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 hoo. Stephen and Bloom gaze in the mirror. The face of William Shakespeare, beardless, appears there, rigid in facial paralysis, crowned by the reflection of the reindeer antlered hatrack in the hall. Shakespeare, in dignified ventriloquy, tis the loud laugh bespeaks the vacant mind. To Bloom, thou thoughtest as how thou wastest invisible. Gaze. He crows with a black capon's laugh, Iagogo. How my old fellow choke it is Thursday morning. Iago go go. Bloom, smiles yellowly at the three whores, when will I hear the joke? Zoe, before you're twice married and once a widower. Bloom, lapses are condoned. Even the great Napoleon when measurements were taken next the skin after his death. Mrs. Dignam, widow woman, her snub nose and cheeks flushed with death talk, tears and tunny's tawny sherry, hurries by in her weeds, her bonnet awry, rouging and powdering her cheeks, lips and nose, a pen chivying her brood of cygnets. Beneath her skirt appear her late husband's everyday trousers and turned-up boots, large eights. She holds a Scottish widow's insurance policy and a large marquee umbrella under which her brood run with her, 
Patsy hopping on one shod foot, his collar loose, a hank of pork steaks dangling, Freddie whimpering, Susie with a crying cod's mouth, Alice struggling with the baby. She cuffs them on, her streamers flaunting aloft, Freddie, ah, ma, you're dragging me along. Susie, mama, the beefdio is fizzing over. Shakespeare, with paralytic rage, wet a seca who kill a farst. The face of Martin Cunningham, bearded, refeatures Shakespeare's beardless face. The marquee umbrella sways drunkenly, the children run aside. Under the umbrella appears Mrs. Cunningham in merry widow hat and kimono gown. She glides sidling and bowing, twirling Japanesely, Mrs. Cunningham, sings, and they call me the jewel of Asia. Martin Cunningham, gazes on her, impassive, immense. Most bloody awful demirep. Stephen, et exaltabuncher cornua justi. Queens lay with prize bowls. Remember Pacifi for whose lust my grand old grossfather made the first confession box. Forget not Madame Gristle Stevens nor the sween scions of the house of Lambert. And Noah was drunk with wine. And his ark was open. Bella, none of that here. Come to the wrong shop. Lynch, let him alone. He's back from Paris. Zoe, runs to Stephen and links him, oh go on. Give us some parlez-vous. Stephen claps hat on head and leaps over to the fireplace where he stands with shrugged shoulders, finny hands outspread, a painted smile on his face, Lynch, pommeling on the sofa, RMM 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 RRRRRRRMMMMMM. Stephen, gabbles with marionette jerks, thousand places of entertainment to expense your evenings with lovely ladies zolling gloves and other things perhaps hers heart beer chops perfect fashionable house very eccentric where lots cocotes beautiful dressed much about princesses like our dancing can-can and walking their Parisian clowneries extra foolish for bachelors foreigns the same if talking a poor English how much smart they are on things love and sensations voluptuous. Mr.'s very selects for his pleasure must to visit heaven and hell show with mortuary candles and they tear silver which occur every night. Perfectly shocking terrific of religions things mockery seen in universal world. All chic womans which arrive full of modesty then disrobe and squeal loud to see vampire man debauch none very fresh young with desu troublance. He clacks his tongue loudly, ho, la la. Say peef keel a. Lynch, vive la vampire. The whores, bravo. Parlez-vous. Stephen, grimacing with head back, laughs loudly, clapping himself, great success of laughing. Angels much prostitutes like and holy apostles big damn ruffians. Demimondane's nicely handsome sparkling of diamonds very amiable costumed. Or do you are fond better what belongs they modern's pleasure turpitude of old man's? He points about him with grotesque gestures which Lynch and the whores reply to, Quachuk statue woman reversible or life-size Tom Peeptum of virgins nudities very lesbic the kiss five ten times. Enter, gentlemen, to see and mirror every position's trapezes all that machine there besides also if desire act awfully bestial butcher's boy pollutes in warm veal liver or omelette on the belly p.s. to Shakespeare. Bella, clapping her belly sinks back on the sofa, with a shout of laughter, an omelette on the ho, 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 omelette on the Stephen, mincingly, I love you, sir darling. Speak you Englishman tongue for double entente cordial. Oh yes, moan loop. How much cost? Waterloo. Water closet. He ceases suddenly and holds up a forefinger, Bella, laughing, omelette. The whores, laughing, encore. Encore. Stephen, mark me. I dreamt of a watermelon. Zoe, go abroad and love a foreign lady. Lynch, across the world for a wife. Flory, dreams goes by contraries. Stephen, extends his arms, it was here. Street of Harlots. In Serpentine Avenue Beelzebub showed me her, a foobsy widow. Where's the red carpet spread? Bloom, approaching Stephen, look. Stephen, no, I flew. My foes beneath me. And ever shall be. World without end. He cries, pater. Free. Bloom, I say, look. Stephen, break my spirit, will he? O oh, merit all or. He cries, his vulture talons sharpened, ola. Hilly ho. Simon Dedalus voice hillows in answer, somewhat sleepy but ready, Simon, that's all right. He swoops uncertainly through the air, wheeling, uttering cries of heartening, on strong ponderous buzzard wings, ho, boy. Are you going to win? Hoop. Schat. Stable with those half castes. Wouldn't let them within the ball of an ass. Head up. Keep our flag flying. An eagle gules volant in a field argent displayed. Ulster king at arms. Hi hoop. He makes the beagles call, giving tongue, 
bol bol. Burble bol burble bol. Hi, boy. The fronds and spaces of the wallpaper file rapidly across country. A stout fox, drawn from covert, brush pointed, having buried his grandmother, runs swift for the open, bright eyed, seeking badger earth, under the leaves. The pack of staghounds follows, nose to the ground, sniffing their quarry, beagle baying, burble burbling to be blooded. Ward Union huntsmen and huntswomen live with them, hot for a kill. From Six Mile Point, Flat House, Nine Mile Stone follow the foot people with knotty sticks, hay forks, salmon gaffs, lassos, flockmasters with stock whips, bear baiters with tom toms, tariadors with bull swords, grey negroes waving torches. The crowd balls of dicers, crown and anchor players, thimble riggers, broadsmen. Crows and touts, horse bookies and high wizard hats clamor deafeningly, the crowd, card of the races. Racing card. Ten to one the field. Tommy on the clay here. Tommy on the clay. Ten to one bar one. Ten to one bar one. Try your luck on spinning Jenny. Ten to one bar one. Sell the monkey, boys. Sell the monkey. I'll give ten to one. Ten to one bar one. A dark horse, riderless, bolts like a phantom past the winning post, his mane moon foaming, his eyeballs stars. The field follows, a bunch of bucking mounts. Skeleton horses, scepter, Maximum the second, Zinfandel, the Duke of Westminster shot over, repulse, the Duke of Beaufort's salon, pre de Paris. Dwarfs ride them, rusty armored, leaping, leaping in there, in their saddles. Last in a drizzle of rain on a broken winded Isabel Nag, cock of the north, the favorite, honey cap, green jacket, orange sleeves, Garrett DC up, gripping the reins, a hockey stick at the ready. His nag on spav and whitegatered feet jogs along the rocky road, the orange lodges, jeering, get down and push, mister. Last lap. You'll be home the night. Garrett DC, bolt upright, his nail-scraped face plastered with postage stamps, brandishes his hockey stick, his blue eyes flashing in the prism of the chandelier as his mount lopes by its schooling gallop, per vias rectus. A yoke of buckets leopards all over him and his rearing nag a torrent of mutton broth with dancing coins of carrots, barley, onions, turnips, potatoes, the green lodges, soft day, Sir John. Soft day, your honor. Private car, private Compton and Sissy Caffrey pass beneath the windows, singing in discord, Stephen, hark. Our friend noise in the street. Zoe, holds up her hand, stop. Private car, private Compton and Sissy Caffrey, yet I've a sort of a Yorkshire relish for. Zoe, that's me. She claps her hands, dance. Dance. She runs to the pianola, who is tuppence. Bloom, hool. Lynch, handing her coins, here. Stephen, cracking his fingers impatiently, quick. Quick. Where's my auger's rod? He runs to the piano and takes his ash plant, beating his foot in tripudium, Zoe, turns the drum handle, there. She drops two pennies in the slot. Gold, pink and violet lights start forth. The drum turns purring in low hesitation waltz. Professor Goodwin, in a bonotted periwig, in court dress, wearing a stained Inverness cape, bent in two from incredible age, totters across the room, his hands fluttering. He sits tinnily on the piano stool and lifts and beats handless sticks of arms on the keyboard, nodding with damsel's grace, his bonot bobbing, Zoe, twirls round herself, heel-tapping, dance. Anybody here for there? Who'll dance? Clear the table. The pianola with changing lights plays in waltz time the prelude of my girl's a Yorkshire girl. Stephen throws his ash plant on the table and seizes Zoe round the waist. Flory and Bella push the table towards the fireplace. Stephen, arming Zoe with exaggerated grace, begins to waltz her round the room. Bloom stands aside. Her sleeve falling from gracing arms, reveals a white flesh flower of vaccination. Between the curtains Professor Maginny inserts a leg on the toe point of which spins a silk hat. With a deft kick he sends it spinning to his crown and jaunty hatted skates in. He wears a slate frock coat with claret silk lapels, a gorget of cream tulle, a green low-cut waistcoat, stock collar with white kerchief, tight lavender trousers, patent pumps and canary gloves. In his buttonhole is an immense dahlia. He twirls in reverse directions a clouded cane, then wedges it tight in his oxter. He places a hand lightly on his breastbone, bows, and fondles his flower and buttons, Maginny, the poetry of motion, art of calisthenics. No connection with Madame Leggett Burns or Levinston's. Fancy dress balls arranged. Deportment. The caddy lantern step. So. Watch me. My terpsichorean abilities. He minuets forward three paces on tripping B's feet, 
Tout le monde en avant. Raverance. Tout le monde en place. The prelude ceases. Professor Goodwin, beating vague arms shrivels, sinks, his live cape falling about the stool. The air in firmer waltz time sounds. Stephen and Zoe circle freely. The lights change, glow, fade gold rosy violet, the pianola, two young fellows were talking about their girls, 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 sweethearts they'd left behind. From a corner the morning hours run out, gold-haired, slim-sandaled, in girlish blue, wasp-waisted, with innocent hands. Nimbly they dance, twirling their skipping ropes. The hours of noon follow in amber gold. Laughing, linked, high hair combs flashing, they catch the sun in mocking mirrors, lifting their arms, Maginny, clip-claps glove sill in hands, carré. Avant du. Breathe evenly. Balance. The morning and noon hours waltz in their places, turning, advancing to each other, shaping their curves, bowing visibus. Cavaliers behind them arch and suspend their arms, with hands descending too, touching, rising from their shoulders, ours, you may touch my. Cavaliers, may I touch your? Ours, oh, but lightly. Cavaliers, oh, so lightly. The pianola, my little shy little lass has a waist. Zoe and Stephen turn boldly with looser swing. The twilight hours advance from long land shadows, dispersed, lagging, languid-eyed, their cheeks delicate with cypria and false faint bloom. They are in grey gauze with dark bat sleeves that flutter in the land breeze, Maginny, Avon wheat. Traverse. Salut. Cor de Mains. Croise. The night hours, one by one, steal to the last place. Morning, noon and twilight hours retreat before them. They are masked, with daggered hair and bracelets of dull bells. Weary they kerchi kerchi under veils, the bracelets, Hio. Hio. Zoe, twirling, her hand to her brow, oh. Maginny, later wars. Shenda dames. La Corbet. Das a das. Arabesquing wearily they weave a pattern on the floor, weaving, unweaving, curtsying, twirling, simply swirling, Zoe, I'm giddy. She frees herself, droops on a chair. Stephen seizes Flory and turns with her, Maginny, Boulanger. Lay Ron. Lay Pone. Chevaux de Bois. Escar goes. Twining, receding, with interchanging hands the night hours link each each with arching arms in a mosaic of movements. Stephen and Flory turn cumbersly, Maginny, danse avec vos dames. Changes de dames. Donnez le petit bouquet à votre dame. Remercier. The pianola, best, best of all, barapum. Kitty, jumps up, oh, they played that on the hobby horses at the Miras Bazaar. She runs to Stephen. He leaves Flory brusquely and seizes Kitty. A screaming bittern's harsh high whistle shrieks. Grown grouse a gurgling toffs cumbersome whirligig turns slowly the room right round about the room, the pianola, my girl's a Yorkshire girl. Zoe, Yorkshire through and through. Come on all. She seizes Flory and waltzes her, Stephen, pa soul. He wheels Kitty into Lynch's arms, snatches up his ash plant from the table and takes the floor. All will will waltz twirl. Bloom Bella Kitty Lynch Flory Zoe Jujubi Women. Stephen with hat ash plant frog splits in middle high kicks with sky kicking mouth shut hand clasp part under thigh. With clang tinkle boom hammer tally ho horn blower blue green yellow flashes toffs cumbersome turns with hobby horse riders from gilded snakes dangled, bowels fandango leaping spurn soil foot and fall again, the pianola, though she's a factory lass and wears no fancy clothes. Close a clutch swift swifter with glare blare flare scudding they scoot loot shoot lumbering by. Barapum, tutti. Encore. Bis. Bravo. Encore. Simon, think of your mother's people. Stephen, dance of death. Bang fresh barong bang of lackey's bell, horse, nag, steer, piglings, con me on Christ ass, lame crutch and leg sailor and cockboat arm folded rope pulling hitching stamp hornpipe through and through. Barapum. On nags hogs bell horses gadarene swine corny and coffin steel shark stone one-handled nelson two trickies frown simmer plum stain from pram falling bawling. Gum he's a champion. Fuse blue pier from barrel rev. Even song love on hackney jaunt blazes blind ca doubled bicyclers dilly with snowcake no fancy clothes. Then in last switchback lumbering up and down bump mosh tub sort of viceroy and rain relish for two blumber bumpshire rows. Barapum, the couples fall aside. Stephen whirls giddily. Room whirls back. Eyes closed he totters. Red rails fly spacewards. Stars all around suns turn roundabout. Bright midges dance on walls. He stops dead, Stephen, ho. 
Stephen's mother, emaciated, rises stark through the floor, in leper grey with a wreath of faded orange blossoms and a torn bridal veil, her face worn and noseless, green with grave mold. Her hair is scant and lank. She fixes her blue-circled hollow eye sockets on Stephen and opens her toothless mouth uttering a silent word. A choir of virgins and confessors sing voicelessly, the choir, Liliata Rutilantium te confessorum. Iubilantium te virginum. From the top of a tower Buck Mulligan, in particular jester's dress of puce and yellow and clown's cap with curling bell, stands gaping at her, a smoking buttered split scone in his hand, Buck Mulligan, she's beastly dead. The pity of it. Mulligan meets the afflicted mother. He upturns his eyes, mercurial Malachi. The mother, with the subtle smile of death's madness, I was once the beautiful May Goulding. I am dead. Stephen, horror-struck, lemur, who are you? No. What bogeyman's trick is this? Buck Mulligan, shakes his curling cap bell, the mockery of it. Kinch dog's body killed her bitch body. She kicked the bucket. Tears of molten butter fall from his eyes onto the scone, our great sweet mother. Epi oinopa pantone. The mother, comes nearer, breathing upon him softly her breath of wetted ashes, all must go through it, Stephen. More women than men in the world. You too. Time will come. Stephen, choking with fright, remorse and horror, they say I killed you, mother. He offended your memory. Cancer did it, not I destiny. The mother, a green rill of bile trickling from a side of her mouth, you sang that song to me. Love's bitter mystery. Stephen, eagerly, tell me the word, mother, if you know now. The word known to all men. The mother, who saved you the night you jumped into the train at Dalkey with Patty Lee. Who had pity for you when you were sat among the strangers. Prayer is all-powerful. Prayer for the suffering souls in the Ursuline Manual and Forty Days Indulgence. Repent, Stephen. Stephen, the ghoul. Hyena. The mother, I pray for you in my other world. Get Dilly to make you that boiled rice every night after your brain work. Years and years I loved you, oh, my son, my firstborn, when you lay in my womb. Zoe, fanning herself with the great fan, I'm melting. Flory, points to Stephen, look. He's white. Bloom, goes to the window to open it more, giddy. The mother, with smoldering eyes, repent. Oh, the fire of hell. Stephen, panting, his non-corrosive sublimate. The corpse chewer. Raw head and bloody bones. The mother, her face drawing near and nearer, sending out an ashen breath, beware. She raises her black and withered right arm slowly toward Stephen's breast with outstretched finger, beware God's hand. A green crab with malignant red eyes sticks deep its grinning claws in Stephen's heart, Stephen, strangled with rage, shite. His features grow drawn and gray and old, bloom, at the window, what? Stephen, ah non, par exemple. The intellectual imagination. With me all or not at all. Non servium. Flory, give him some cold water. Wait. She rushes out, the mother, wrings her hand slowly, moaning desperately, O oh sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on him. Save him from hell, O oh divine sacred heart. Stephen, no. 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 Break my spirit, all of you, if you can. I'll bring you all to heal. The mother, in the agony of her death rattle, have mercy on Stephen, Lord, for my sake. Inexpressible was my anguish when expiring with love, grief and agony on Mount Calvary. Stephen, nothung. He lifts his ash plant high with both hands and smashes the chandelier. Time's livid final flame leaps and, in the following darkness, ruin of all space, shattered glass and toppling masonry, the gas jet, pofung. Bloom, stop. Lynch, rushes forward and seizes Stephen's hand, here. Hold on. Don't run amok. Bella, police. Stephen, abandoning his ash plant, his head and arms thrown back stark, beats the ground and flies from the room, past the whores at the door, Bella, screams, after him. The two whores rush to the hall door. Lynch and Kitty and Zoe stampede from the room. They talk excitedly. Bloom follows, returns, the whores, jammed in the doorway, pointing, down there. Zoe, pointing, there. There's something up. Bella, who pays for the lamp. She seizes Bloom's coattail, here, you were with him. The lamp's broken. Bloom, rushes to the hall, rushes back, what lamp, woman? A whore, he tore his coat. Bella, her eyes hard with anger and cupidity, points, who's to pay for that? Ten shillings. You're a witness. Bloom, snatches up Stephen's ash plant, 
Me? Ten shillings? Haven't you lifted enough off him? Didn't he? Bella, loudly, here, none of your tall talk. This isn't a brothel. A ten shilling house. Bloom, his head under the lamp, pulls the chain. Pulling, the gas jet lights up a crushed mauve purple shade. He raises the ash plant, only the chimney's broken. Here is all he. Bella, shrinks back and screams, Jesus. Don't. Bloom, warding off a blow, to show you how he hit the paper. There's not sixpence worth of damage done. Ten shillings. Flory, with a glass of water, enters, where is he? Bella, do you want me to call the police? Bloom, oh, I know. Bulldog on the premises. But he's a Trinity student. Patrons of your establishment. Gentlemen that pay the rent. He makes a Masonic sign, know what I mean? Nephew of the Vice-Chancellor. You don't want a scandal. Bella, angrily, Trinity. Coming down here ragging after the boat races and paying nothing. Are you my commander here or? Where is he? I'll charge him. Disgrace him, I will. She shouts, Zoe. Zoe. Bloom, urgently, and if it were your own son in Oxford? Warningly, I know. Bella, almost speechless, who are? Incog. Zoe, in the doorway, there's a row on. Bloom, what? Where? He throws a shilling on the table and starts, that's for the chimney. Where? I need mountain air. He hurries out through the hall. The whore's point. Flory follows, spilling water from her tilted tumbler. On the doorstep all the whores clustered talk volubly, pointing to the right where the fog has cleared off. From the left arrives a jingling hackney car. It slows to in front of the house. Bloom at the hall door perceives Corny Kelleher who is about to dismount from the car with two silent lechers. He averts his face. Bella from within the hall urges on her whores. They blow icky licky sticky yum yum kisses. Corny Kelleher replies with a ghastly lewd smile. The silent lechers turn to pay the Jarvie. Zoe and Kitty still point right. Bloom, parting them swiftly, draws his caliph's hood and poncho and hurries down the steps with sideways face. In Cog Harun al Rashid, he flits behind the silent lechers and hastens on by the railings with fleet step of a pard strewing the drag behind him, torn envelopes drenched in aniseed. The ash plant marks his stride. A pack of bloodhounds, led by Hornblower of Trinity brandishing a dog whip in tally ho cap and an old pair of grey trousers, follows from far, picking up the scent, nearer, baying, panting, at fault, breaking away, throwing their tongues, biting his heels, leaping at his tail. He walks, runs, zigzags, gallops, lugs laid back. He is pelted with gravel, cabbage stumps, biscuit boxes, eggs, potatoes, dead codfish, woman slipper slappers. After him fresh found the hue and cry zigzag gallops in hot pursuit of follow my leader, 65C, 66C, Night Watch, John Henry Mentone, Wisdom Healy, V. B. Dillon, Counselor Nanetti, Alexander Keys, Larry O'Rourke, Joe Cuff, Mrs. O'Dowd, Pisser Burke, The Nameless One, Mrs. Reardon, The Citizen, Gary Owen, Who do I call him, Strange Face, Feller Topso Like, Sawheim For, Chap With Owen, Chris Callanan, Sir Charles Cameron, Benjamin Olar, Lenahan, Bartel Darcy, Joe Hines, Red Murray, Editor Braden, T. M. Healy, Mr. Justice Fitzgibbon, John Howard Parnell, The Reverend Tin Salmon, Professor Jolie, Mrs. Breen, Dennis Breen, Theodore Purifoy, Mina Purifoy, The Westland Ropos Mistress, C. P. McCoy, Friend of Lions, Hoppy Hollohan, Manant Street, Other Manant Street, Football Boots, Prognose Driver, Rich Protestant Lady, Davy Byrne, Mrs. Ellen McGuinness, Mrs. Joe Gallagher, George Lidwell, Jimmy Henry on Corns, Superintendent Laracy, Father Cowley, Crofton out of the Collector Generals, Dan Dawson, Dental Surgeon Bloom with Tweezers, Mrs. Bob Duran, Mrs. Kennefick, Mrs. Wise Nolan, John Wise Nolan, Handsome Mary Ed Woman rubbed against wide behind in Klonsky a tram, the bookseller of Sweets of Sin, Miss Dub at a tan shedded bed ad, Madame Gerald and Stanislaus Moran of Roebuck, the managing clerk of Drimmies, Wet Hirup, Colonel Hayes, Mastiansky, Citroen, Penrose, Aaron Figetner, Moses Herzog, Michael E. Garrity, Inspector Troy, Mrs. Galbraith, the constable off Eccles Street Corner, Old Dr. Brady with stethoscope, the mystery man on the beach, a retriever, Mrs. Miriam Dondrade and all her lovers, the hue and cry, Helter Skelter Pelter Welter, he's Bloom. Stop Bloom. Stop a Bloom. Stop a robber. Hi. Hi. 
Stotham on the corner. At the corner of Beaver Street beneath the scaffolding bloom panting stops on the fringe of the noisy quarreling knot, a lot not knowing a jot what high. Hi. Row and wrangle round the hohat brawl altogether, Stephen, with elaborate gestures, breathing deeply and slowly, you are my guests. Uninvited. By virtue of the 5th of George and 7th of Edward. History to blame. Fabled by mothers of memory. Private car, to Sissy Caffrey, was he insulting you? Stephen, addressed her invocative feminine. Probably neuter. Ungenitive. Voices, no, he didn't. I seen him. The girl there. He was in Mrs. Cohen's. What's up? Soldier and civilian. Sissy Caffrey, I was in company with the soldiers and they left me to do you know, and the young man run up behind me. But I'm faithful to the man that's treating me though I'm only a shilling whore. Stephen, catches sight of Lynch's and Kitty's heads, hail, Sisyphus. He points to himself and the others, poetic. You're a poetic. Voices, she's faithful to man. Sissy Caffrey, yes, to go with him. And me with a soldier friend. Private Compton, he doesn't have one a thick ear, the blighter. Biff him one, Harry. Private car, to Sissy, was he insulting you while me and him was having a piss? Lord Tennyson, gentleman poet in Union Jack Blazer and cricket flannels, bareheaded, flowing bearded, there's not to reason why. Private Compton, Biff him, Harry. Stephen, to Private Compton, I don't know your name but you are quite right. Dr. Swift says one man in armor will beat ten men in their shirts. Shirt is cinched doche. Part for the whole. Sissy Caffrey, to the crowd, no, I was with the privates. Stephen, amiably, why not? The bold soldier boy. In my opinion every lady for example. Private car, his cap awry, advances to Stephen, say, how would it be, governor, if I was to bash in your jaw? Stephen, looks up to the sky, how? Very unpleasant. Noble art of self-pretense. Personally, I detest action. He waves his hand, hand hurts me slightly. On fond say son vo on yon. To Sissy Caffrey, some trouble is on here. What is it precisely? Dolly Gray, from her balcony waves her handkerchief, giving the sign of the heroine of Jericho, Rahab. Cook's son, goodbye. Safe home to Dolly. Dream of the girl you left behind and she will dream of you. The soldiers turn their swimming eyes, Bloom, elbowing through the crowd, plucks Stephen's sleeve vigorously, Come now, Professor, that Carmen is waiting. Stephen, turns, eh? He disengages himself, why should I not speak to him or to any human being who walks upright upon this oblate orange? He points his finger, I'm not afraid of what I can talk to if I see his eye. Retaining the perpendicular. He staggers a pace back, Bloom, propping him, retain your own. Stephen, laughs emptily, my center of gravity is displaced. I have forgotten the trick. Let us sit down somewhere and discuss. Struggle for life is the law of existence but but human philirinists, notably the Tsar and the King of England, have invented arbitration. He taps his brow, but in here it is I must kill the priest and the king. Biddy the clap, did you hear what the professor said? He's a professor out of the college. Cunny Kate, I did. I heard that. Biddy the clap, he expresses himself with such marked refinement of phraseology. Cunny Kate, indeed, yes. And at the same time with such apposite trenchancy. Private Carr, pulls himself free and comes forward, what's that you're saying about my king? Edward VII appears in an archway. He wears a white jersey on which an image of the Sacred Heart is stitched with the insignia of garter and thistle, golden fleece, elephant of Denmark, Skinner's and Proben's horse, Lincoln's indenture and ancient and honorable artillery company of Massachusetts. He sucks a red jujube. He is robed as a grand elect perfect and sublime mason with trowel and apron, marked made in Germany. In his left hand he holds a plasterer's bucket on which is printed Defonce Durner. A roar of welcome greets him, Edward VII, slowly, solemnly but indistinctly, peace, perfect peace. For identification, bucket in my hand. Cheerio, boys. He turns to his subjects, we have come here to witness a clean straight fight and we heartily wish both men the best of good luck. Mahak Macker Abak. He shakes hands with Private Carr, Private Compton, Stephen, Bloom, and Lynch. General applause. Edward VII lifts his bucket graciously in acknowledgement, Private Carr, to Stephen, say it again. Stephen, nervous, friendly, pulls himself up, I understand your point of view though I have no king myself for the moment. This is the age of patent medicines. A discussion is difficult down here. But this is the point. You die for your country. Suppose. 
He places his arm on private car's sleeve, not that I wish it for you. But I say, let my country die for me. Up to the present it has done so. I didn't want it to die. Damn death. Long live life. Edward the Seventh levitates over heaps of slain, in the garb and with the halo of joking Jesus, a white jujube in his phosphorescent face, my methods are new and are causing surprise. To make the blind see I throw dust in their eyes. Stephen, kings and unicorns. He falls back a pace, come somewhere and wheel. What was that girl saying? Private Compton, A, Harry, give him a kick in the knackers. Stick one into Jerry. Bloom, to the privates, softly, he doesn't know what he's saying. Taken a little more than is good for him. Absinthe. Green-eyed monster. I know him. He's a gentleman, a poet. It's all right. Stephen, nods, smiling and laughing, gentleman, patriot, scholar and judge of impostors. Private Carr, I don't give a bugger who he is. Private Compton, we don't give a bugger who he is. Stephen, I seem to annoy them. Green rag to a bowl. Kevin Egan of Paris in black Spanish tasseled shirt and Pipa Day boys had signs to Stephen, Kevin Egan, Lo. Bonjour. The Vieux Ogres with the dense jean. Patrice Egan peeps from behind, his rabbit face nibbling a quince leaf, Patrice, Socialist Day. Don Emile Patrizio Franz Rupert Pope Hennessy, in medieval hauberk, two wild geese volant on his helm, with noble indignation points a mailed hand against the privates, verf those ikes to footboden, big grand porcos of John Yellow's totos covered of gravy. Bloom, to Stephen, come home. You'll get into trouble. Stephen, swaying, I don't avoid it. He provokes my intelligence. Biddy the clap, one immediately observes that he is of patrician lineage. The virago, green above the red, says he. Wolf tone. The bod, the red's as good as the green. And better. Up the soldiers. Up King Edward. A rough, laughs, a. Eh? Hands up to de wet. The citizen, with a huge emerald muffler and shillelagh, calls, may the god above send down a dove with teeth as sharp as razors to slit the throats of the English dogs that hanged our Irish leaders. The croppy boy, the rope noose round his neck, gripes in his issuing bowels with both hands, I bear no hate to a living thing, but I love my country beyond the king. Rumbold, demon barber, accompanied by two blackmasked assistants, advances with Gladstone bag which he opens, ladies and gents, cleaver purchased by Mrs. Piercy to slay Mog. Knife with which Voisin dismembered the wife of a compatriot and hid remains in a sheet in the cellar, the unfortunate female's throat being cut from ear to ear. File containing arsenic retrieved from body of Miss Baron which sent set into the gallows. He jerks the rope. The assistants leap at the victim's legs and drag him downward, grunting, the croppy boy's tongue protrudes violently, the croppy boy, harat ho ray hor hothers hest. He gives up the ghost. A violent erection of the hang sends gouts of sperm spouting through his death clothes onto the cobblestones. Mrs. Bellingham, Mrs. Yelverton Barry and the Honorable Mrs. Mervyn Talboys rush forward with their handkerchiefs to sop it up, rumbled, I'm near it myself. He undoes the noose, rope which hanged the awful rebel. Ten shillings a time. As applied to Her Royal Highness. He plunges his head into the gaping belly of the hanged and draws out his head again clotted with coiled and smoking entrails, my painful duty has now been done. God save the King. Edward the Seventh dances slowly, solemnly, rattling his bucket, and sings with soft contentment, on Coronation Day, on Coronation Day, oh, won't we have a merry time, drinking whiskey, beer and wine. Private car, here. What are you saying about my king? Stephen, throws up his hands, oh, this is too monotonous. Nothing. He wants my money and my life, though what must be his master, for some brutish empire of his. Money I haven't. He searches his pockets vaguely, gave it to someone. Private car, who wants your bleeding money? Stephen, tries to move off, will someone tell me where I'm least likely to meet these necessary evils? So say void Aussie Paris. Not that I. But, by St. Patrick. The women's heads coalesce. Old gummy granny and sugarloaf had appears seated on a toadstool, the death flower of the potato blight on her breast, Stephen, aha. I know you, Gammer. Hamlet, revenge. The old so that eats her pharaoh. Old gummy granny, rocking to and fro, Ireland's sweetheart, the king of Spain's daughter, Alana. Strangers in my house, bad manners to them. She keens with banshee woe, Akona. Akona. Silk of the kind. She wails, you met with poor old Ireland and how does she stand? Stephen, how do I stand you? The hat trick. 
Where's the third person of the Blessed Trinity? Saw Garth Arun? The Reverend Carrion Crow. Sissy Caffrey, shrill, stop them from fighting. A rough, our men retreated. Private car, tugging at his belt, I'll wring the neck of any fucker says a word against my fucking king. Bloom, terrified, he said nothing. Not a word. A pure misunderstanding. The citizen, Aaron Go Bra. Major Tweedy and the citizen exhibit to each other medals, decorations, trophies of war, wounds. Both salute with fierce hostility, Private Compton, go it, Harry. Do him one in the eye. He's a proboer. Stephen, did I? When? Bloom, to the Redcoats, we fought for you in South Africa, Irish missile troops. Isn't that history? Royal Dublin Fusiliers. Honored by our monarch. The Navy, staggering past, oh, yes. Oh God, yes. Oh, make the quirra crower. Oh. Bo. Cast halberdiers and armor thrust forward appendix of gutted spear points. Major Tweedy, mustache like Turco the Terrible, in bearskin cap with hackle plume and accoutrements, with epaulettes, gilt chevrons and saber takes, his breast bright with medals, toes the line. He gives the pilgrim warriors sign of the Knights Templars, Major Tweedy, growls gruffly, rorks drift. Up, guards, and at them. Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. Private car, I'll do him in. Private Compton, waves the crowd back, fair play, here. Make a bleeding butcher's shop of the bugger. Mast bands blare Gary Owen and God save the king, Sissy Caffrey, they're going to fight. For me. Cunny Kate, the brave and the fair. Biddy the clap, methinks yon sable knight will joust it with the best. Cunny Kate, blushing deeply, nay, madam. The gules doublet and Mary St. George for me. Stephen, the harlots cry from street to street shall we've old Ireland's winding sheet. Private car, loosening his belt, shouts, I'll wring the neck of any fucking bastard says a word against my bleeding fucking king. Bloom, shakes Sissy Caffrey's shoulders, speak, you. Are you struck dumb? You are the link between nations and generations. Speak, woman, sacred life giver. Sissy Caffrey, alarmed, seizes private car's sleeve, am and I with you? Am and I your girl? Sissy's your girl. She cries, police. Stephen, ecstatically, to Sissy Caffrey, white thy fambles, red thy gone and thy quarren's dainty is. Voices, police. Distant voices, Dublin's burning. Dublin's burning. On fire, on fire. Brimstone fires spring up. Dense clouds roll past. Heavy gatling guns boom. Pandemonium. Troops deploy. Gallop of hoofs. Artillery. Horse commands. Bells clang. Backers shout. Drunkards ball. Horse screech. Foghorns hoot. Cries of valor. Shrieks of dying. Pikes clash on cuirasses. Thieves rob the slain. Birds of prey, winging from the sea, rising from marshlands, swooping from eyries, hover screaming, gannets, cormorants, vultures, goshawks, climbing woodcocks, peregrines, merlins, black grouse, sea eagles, gulls, albatrosses, barnacle geese. The midnight sun is darkened. The earth trembles. The dead of Dublin from Prospect and Mount Jerome in white sheepskin overcoats and black goatfell cloaks arise and appear to many. A chasm opens with a noiseless yawn. Tom Rochford, winner, in athlete's singlet and breeches, arrives at the head of the national hurdle handicap and leaps into the void. He is followed by a race of runners and leapers. In wild attitudes they spring from the brink. Their bodies plunge. Factory lasses with fancy clothes toss red-hot Yorkshire barrage bombs. Society ladies lift their skirts above their heads to protect themselves. Laughing witches in red cutty sarks ride through the air on broomsticks. Quaker lister plasters blisters. It rains dragon's teeth. Armed heroes spring up from furrows. They exchange in amity the passive knights of the Red Cross and fight duels with cavalry sabers. Wolf Tone against Henry Grattan, Smith O'Brien against Daniel O'Connell, Michael Davitt against Isaac Butt, Justin McCarthy against Parnell, Arthur Griffith against John Redmond, John O'Leary against Lero Johnny, Lord Edward Fitzgerald against Lord Gerald Fitzedward, the O'Donoghue of the Glens against the Glens of the O'Donoghue. On an eminence, the center of the earth, rises the field altar of St. Barbara. Black candles rise from its gospel and epistle horns. From the high barbacans of the tower two shafts of light fall on the smoke-pulled altarstone. On the altarstone Mrs. Mina Purefoy, goddess of unreason, lies, naked, fettered, a chalice resting on her swollen belly. Father Malachi O'Flynn in a lace petticoat and reverse chasuble, 
his two left feet back to the front, celebrates camp mass. The Rev. Mr. Hugh C. Haynes Love M. A., in a plain cassock and mortarboard, his head and collar back to the front, holds over the celebrant's head an open umbrella, Father Malachi O'Flynn, introbo ad altare diaboli. The Rev. Mr. Haynes Love, to the devil which hath made glad my young days. Father Malachi O'Flynn, takes from the chalice and elevates a blood-dripping host, corpus meum. The Rev. Mr. Haynes Love, raises high behind the celebrant's petticoat, revealing his grey bare hairy buttocks between which a carrot is stuck, my body. The voice of all the damned, Tangier Tneto Pinemo Dog Droll Eth Rof, Eulela. From on high the voice of Adonai calls, Adonai, Do O O Og. The voice of all the blessed, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. From on high the voice of Adonai calls, Adonai, Go O O Ud. In strident discord peasants and townsmen of orange and green factions sing Kick the Pope and Daily, Daily sing to Mary, Private Car, with ferocious articulation, I'll do him in, so help me fucking Christ. I'll ring the bastard fucker's bleeding blasted fucking windpipe. The retriever, nosing on the fringe of the crowd, barks noisily, old gummy granny, thrusts a dagger towards Stephen's hand, remove him, Akushla. At 8.35 a.m. you will be in heaven and Ireland will be free. She prays, oh good God, take him. Bloom, runs to Lynch, can't you get him away? Lynch, he likes dialectic, the universal language. Kitty. To Bloom, get him away, you. He won't listen to me. He drags Kitty away, Stephen, points, exit Judas. At Lake we say suspended. Bloom, runs to Stephen, come along with me now before worse happens. Here's your stick. Stephen, stick, no. Reason. This feast of pure reason. Sissy Caffrey, pulling private car, come on, your boost. He insulted me but I forgive him. Shouting in his ear, I forgive him for insulting me. Bloom, over Stephen's shoulder, yes, go. You see he's incapable. Private car, breaks loose, I'll insult him. He rushes towards Stephen, fist outstretched, and strikes him in the face. Stephen totters, collapses, falls, stunned. He lies prone, his face to the sky, his hat rolling to the wall. Bloom follows and picks it up, Major Tweedy, loudly, carbine and bucket. Cease fire. Salute. The retriever, barking furiously, ute 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 ute. The crowd, let him up. Don't strike him when he's down. Air. Who? The soldier hit him. He's a professor. Is he hurted? Don't manhandle him. He's fainted. A hag, what call had the redcoat to strike the gentleman and he under the influence? Let them go and fight the boars. The bod, listen to who's talking. Hasn't the soldier a right to go with his girl? He gave him the coward's blow. They grab at each other's hair, claw at each other and spit, the retriever, barking, wow wow wow. Bloom, shoves them back, loudly, get back, stand back. Private Compton, tugging his comrade, here. Bugger off, Harry. Here's the cops. Two rain-caped watch, tall, stand in the group, first watch, what's wrong here? Private Compton, we were with this lady. And he insulted us. And assaulted my chum. The retriever barks, who owns the bleeding tyke. Sissy Caffrey, with expectation, is he bleeding? A man, rising from his knees, no. Gone off. He'll come to all right. Bloom, glances sharply at the man, leave him to me. I can easily. Second watch, who are you? Do you know him? Private car, lurches towards the watch, he insulted my lady friend. Bloom, angrily, you hit him without provocation. I'm a witness. Constable, take his regimental number. Second watch, I don't want your instructions in the discharge of my duty. Private Compton, pulling his comrade, here, bugger off Harry. Or Bennett'll shove you in the lockup. Private car, staggering as he is pulled away, God fuck old Bennett. He's a white erst bugger. I don't give a shit for him. First watch, takes out his notebook, what's his name? Bloom, peering over the crowd, I just see a car there. If you give me a hand a second, sergeant. First watch, name and address. Corny Kelleher, weepers round his hat, a death wreath in his hand, appears among the bystanders, Bloom, quickly, oh, the very man. He whispers, Simon Dedalus son. A bit sprung. Get those policemen to move those loafers back. Second watch, night, Mr. Kelleher. Corny Kelleher, to the watch, withdrawing eye, that's all right. I know him. Won a bit on the races. Gold cup. 
Throw away. He laughs, 20 to 1. Do you follow me? First watch, turns to the crowd, here, what are you all gaping at? Move on out of that. The crowd disperses slowly, muttering, down the lane, Corny Kelleher, leave it to me, sergeant. That'll be all right. He laughs, shaking his head, we were often as bad ourselves, a eh, or worse. What? A, eh, what? First watch, laughs, I suppose so. Corny Kelleher, nudges the second watch, come and wipe your name off the slate. He lilts, wagging his head, with my turalum 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 turalum. What, A, eh, do you follow me? Second watch, genially, ah, sure we were too. Corny Kelleher, winking, boys will be boys. I've a car round there. Second watch, all right, Mr. Kelleher. Good night. Corny Kelleher, I'll see to that. Bloom, shakes hands with both of the watch in turn, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. He mumbles confidentially, we don't want any scandal, you understand. Father is a well-known highly respected citizen. Just a little wild oats, you understand. First watch, oh, I understand, sir. Second watch, that's all right, sir. First watch, it was only in case of corporal injuries I'd have to report it at the station. Bloom, nods rapidly, naturally. Quite right. Only you're bound in duty. Second watch, it's our duty. Corny Kelleher, good night, men. The watch, saluting together, night, gentlemen. They move off with slow heavy tread, bloom, blows, providentially you came on the scene. You have a car? Corny Kelleher, laughs, pointing his thumb over his right shoulder to the car brought up against the scaffolding, two commercials that were standing fizz in jammets. Like princes, faith. One of them lost two quid on the race. Drowning his grief. And were on for a go with the jolly girls. So I landed them up on Bian's car and down to night town. Bloom, I was just going home by Gardner Street when I happened to. Corny Kelleher, laughs, sure they wanted me to join in with the mo. No, by God, says I not for old stagers like myself and yourself. He laughs again and leers with lackluster eye, thanks be to God we have it in the house, what, eh, do you follow me? Ha, ha, ha. Bloom, tries to laugh, he, he, he. Yes. Matter of fact I was just visiting an old friend of mine there, Virig, you don't know him, poor fellow, he's laid up for the past week, and we had a liquor together and I was just making my way home. The horse neighs, the horse, ho 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 ho. Ho 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 home. Corny Kelleher, sure it was B and R Jarvi there that told me after we left the two commercials in Mrs. Cohen's and I told him to pull up and got off to see. He laughs, sober hearse driver's a speciality. Will I give him a lift home? Where does he hang out? Somewhere in Cabra, what? Bloom, no, in Sandy Cove, I believe, from what he let drop. Stephen, prone, breathes to the stars. Corny Kelleher, Asquint, draws at the horse. Bloom, in gloom, looms down, Corny Kelleher, scratches his nape, Sandy Cove. He bends down and calls to Stephen, A. Eh? He calls again, A. Eh? He's covered with shavings anyhow. Take care they didn't lift anything off him. Bloom, no, no, no. I have his money and his hat here and stick. Corny Kelleher, ah, well, he'll get over it. No bones broken. Well, I'll shove along. He laughs, I've a rendezvous in the morning. Burying the dead. Safe home. The horse, nays, ho 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 home. Bloom, good night. I'll just wait and take him along in a few. Corny Kelleher returns to the outside car and mounts it. The horse harness jingles, Corny Kelleher, from the car, standing, night. Bloom, night. The Jarvie chucks the reins and raises his whip encouragingly. The car and horse back slowly, awkwardly, and turn. Corny Kelleher on the side seat sways his head to and fro in sign of mirth at Bloom's plight. The Jarvie joins in the mute pantomimic merriment nodding from the farther seat. Bloom shakes his head in mute mirthful reply. With thumb and palm Corny Kelleher reassures that the two bobbies will allow the sleep to continue for what else is to be done. With a slow nod Bloom conveys his gratitude as that is exactly what Stephen needs. The car jingles Turalum round the corner of the Turalum lane. Corny Kelleher again reassure looms with his hand. Bloom with his hand assure looms Corny Kelleher that he is reassure Lumte. The tinkling hoofs and jingling harness grow fainter with their Turululululu lay. Bloom, holding in his hand Stephen's hat, festooned with shavings, and ash plant, stands irresolute. Then he bends to him and shakes him by the shoulder, Bloom, eh? Ho! 
There is no answer, he bends again, Mr. Daedalus. There is no answer, the name if you call. Somnambulist. He bends again and, hesitating, brings his mouth near the face of the prostrate form, Stephen. There is no answer. He calls again, Stephen. Stephen, groans, who? Black Panther. Vampire. He sighs and stretches himself, then murmurs thickly with prolonged vowels, who? Drive. Fergus now and Pierce. Woods woven shade? He turns on his left side, sighing, doubling himself together, bloom, poetry. Well educated. Pity. He bends again and undoes the buttons of Stephen's waistcoat, to breathe. He brushes the wood shavings from Stephen's clothes with light hand and fingers, one pound seven. Not hurt anyhow. He listens, what? Stephen, murmurs, shadows. The woods. White breast. Dim sea. He stretches out his arms, sighs again and curls his body. Bloom, holding the hat and ash plant, stands erect. A dog barks in the distance. Bloom tightens and loosens his grip on the ash plant. He looks down on Stephen's face and form. Bloom, communes with the night, face reminds me of his poor mother. In the shady wood. The deep white breast. Ferguson, I think I caught. A girl. Some girl. Best thing could happen him. He murmurs, swear that I will always hail, ever conceal, never reveal, any part or parts, art or arts. He murmurs, in the rough sands of the sea. A cable tows length from the shore. Where the tide ebbs. And flows. Silent, thoughtful, alert he stands on guard, his fingers at his lips in the attitude of secret master. Against the dark wall a figure appears slowly, a fairy boy of eleven, a changeling, kidnapped, dressed in an eaten suit with glass shoes and a little bronze helmet, holding a book in his hand. He reads from right to left inaudibly, smiling, kissing the page, Bloom, wonderstruck, calls inaudibly, Rudy. Rudy, gazes, unseeing, into Bloom's eyes and goes on reading, kissing, smiling. He has a delicate mauve face. On his suit he has diamond and ruby buttons. In his free left hand he holds a slim ivory cane with a violet bonnet. A white lambkin peeps out of his waistcoat pocket. 